studies. Some have prescribed treatment solutions to the problem. Others are also building a local capacity for a long-term solution to the threat. And all these consensus efforts aim at building a resilient and sustainable aquaculture industry. So this morning we have in our midst some experts from some of these institutions and agencies who are here to share with us their works and experiences. So at the end of the day, we should be able to know where we are now and also the way forward as far as the threat of diseases to the aquaculture industry is concerned. The question I would want to ask even before inviting the experts onto the floor is, are we out of the woods yet? Or are we building resilience to be able to survive in the woods? Because the woods are still there with us. Thank you very much. I want us all to pay attention and we have these people from industry, from um, research, academia, development partners who will give us their, what they have been doing so far. We will interact with them and I believe that at the end of it all, we would know the status and also the future that we have for our industry. On this note, I want to, in fact, I don't know uh, the people that much. I know that it's a few occasions, either by email or so, I have interacted with Sandy, I have interacted with Adrian. In fact, Adrian just drew my attention that he came to me asking for um, histology, you know, um, equipment, and I remember very well. So his, his brain is very, you know, sharp, his memory is you know, because this is more than before the COVID, you know, <laughs> you know, so, and of course, now we're going to have some histology equipment by courtesy of uh, one of the resource persons who will be talking to us. And so without much ado, I would want um, us to, you know, just with a club offering, invite um, Adrian um, to give us, you know, his uh, talk about our disease problem and what they have done so far. All right, you want to project? So can we have? All right, so the technical people support them then. It's on. All right. Okay. Can we have a presentation? So ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Adrian as he does his presentation. Start with, uh, with the economics. If you can start with that one, please. Thank you very much, Professor. I just wanted to say that it is an absolute pleasure being here in Ghana presenting today. And um, I really wanted to, to do at least three presentations coming from our behalf, Verbeck. One of them a lot of people have asked me, is vaccination affordable? So I will be doing a presentation on the economics behind it. The next one will be done by my colleague Sandy, who has more than 15 years ex experience in uh, vaccination. He's here to, on our behalf to help train in Ghana anything to do with vaccines. And lastly, unfortunately, Dr. Selom Tete is not with us today is our, our local rep, our local veterinarian here in Ghana. But I will do the presentation on his behalf, which will be about now tilapia diseases. What should we think about the next potential risk 
that Ghana might have for diseases in, 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 the, in the industry. I'll show you the clinical signs and at least I, I hope that all these presentations will be very useful for you. So starting with the presentation, vaccination, is it worth it? Should we do it? Um, just to give you a quick background on vaccination, it's, it, the idea behind it is it's a safe product which will not harm the fish. The idea is to stimulate the fish immunity and allow it to react faster when the pathogen is in its environment. Here today, I would like to talk specifically about Streptococcus agalactiae. It's a bacteria. This particular bacteria is the number one killer for now tilapia in the world. You have the same Streptococcus agalactiae, but something particular about it is that you have various serotypes. And those serotypes are, let's say, the, let's say we can say the outer shell of the bacteria, the way that the fish needs to recognize it. So it's important to know this because you have various ones in the country and a vaccine cannot be used for one serotype like 1B against another serotype like 1A. In Ghana, you have 1A and 1B. So you, you cannot use one vaccine for both. That's just an important point. We can discuss it a little bit later. But the point of vaccine is for, to allow your fish to react faster when they are disease season. When we say disease season, it's the warmer season during the year. You see your fish having the Popeye and the swelling. By vaccinating them, you will be able to improve the survival because the fish will be able to respond faster against the bacteria. In that manner, you also have a better FCR. Why? Because the fish will spend less time fighting the bacteria, but rather use those resources to grow. You will have a better meat quality. I have a, a picture that I would like to show you later. Our friends from Latin America in Nal Tilapia have a similar problem in uh, Streptococcus agalactiae 1A. And unfortunately, that bacteria actually has some impact on the meat. You'll see some pictures later but also for the welfare of the fish. You're growing fish, you also want them to not be miserable in the cages. It's important for us to, at least as human beings, to grow your fish, but in good conditions. You shouldn't let them die of disease just because you didn't want to do anything about it. And of course, vaccine is more of a sustainable product, and the, the idea behind it is you would use less antibiotics within the water uh, during a, an outbreak. You would have less mortality, so you would not need to use antibiotics, which is not only better for your environment, the lake, the rivers, the ponds, but it is also a public concern where antibiotic microbial resistance will be limited because we are vaccinating our fish and we are not giving a last minute resource antibiotic treatment, which, are, which can be quite expensive as well. So I did a basic analysis, and I would like to put, your shoe, to put yourself in the shoes of a farmer. You have a cage of 10,000 fish. OK. You have on one side the vaccinated cages, OK? And then on the other side, the non-vaccinated cages. Around and about in Ghana, to inject one fish, it will cost you around 64 pesos. I'm talking about buying the vaccine, importing the vaccine, having a team to do the vaccination, putting it into the water. This is how much it would cost today for a farmer to vaccinate his fish with our product, around 64 pesos. So you would be spending around 6,400, around about that, Ghana cities for 10,000 fish. You vaccinate them around 20 grams, so it is after ISK and V problems. With vaccination, we are expecting your cage to at least have 90% survival. This is a good, healthy cage that has proven, shown that, uh, this is a case study from a farm, by the way. 90% survival is what we expect with vaccinated fish using, uh, against Streptococcus agalactiae. So 
On the, on the non-vaccinated, there will be no investment because you're not vaccinating them, okay? If you don't vaccinate them, there's a chance that during the warmer season, when the bacteria is most prominent, you have up to 25% mortality on the much larger fish. So once you harvest your 10,000 fish later on, you have a market here of half a kilo. You don't go for the full kilo of fish. So you would have a yield more of about 4,500 4, kilograms in comparison to unvaccinated around 3,750. At 35 Ghana CDs per kilo, you have around 158,000 Ghana CDs against 131,000 Ghana CDs. So minusing your investment with the vaccination around about, if you do vaccinate and you get 15% difference in survival, you'll earn around about at least uh, 20,000 Ghana CDs extra for that cage. Can you go to the next slide, please? So in this case study, the break-even point for a vaccination for 500 gram fish is around 3.1% better survival that you need to achieve to make vaccination worth it for your, for your cages. Some of the added benefits that I didn't add in my calculations earlier is that vaccinated fish will have a better FCR, so you would be saving more money there as well. Also, regarding the higher quality of fillets, if we're talking about fillets, but I know that in Ghana, some of the larger fish, you can cut them in, in, in chunks. Depending on the bacteria, if you give them antibiotic treatments, they might ne uh, develop necrosis within the fillets. And this is a study. This is from a paper from our, our friends in, in Latin America. They have investigated that at least up to 2% of the fish, you know, if with bacteria, some of these bacteria, the same serotype that we have here, you can have damages to your fillet. Hence why I think that vaccination should be implemented because it can help reduce these, uh, these, uh, these necrosis. Next slide, please. So in order to improve your, your vaccine if, uh, profitability, of course, if you have your price of fish is increasing in, in, in prices per kilo, as a farmer, if you don't vaccinate them, you will lose more probable, uh, possible money uh, because the fish are becoming more expensive at the end. So. By selling fish that are more expensive, you would increase. And then also, if your fish are vaccinated during the warmer season, that's, that's the very important thing, is that if you want to see the benefit of vaccination, you also need to vaccinate them for the right season. We know that Streptococcus really comes out when it is warmer, meaning that you need to plan ahead a couple of months before to make sure that they are fully immunized during that warmer season. And of course, vaccine becomes even more interesting if you are a farmer that is targeting a much larger fish, maybe around size four. But anything else to do with the vaccination processes and how we do vaccination, I will hand over to my colleague, Sandy Chatham, who would be, who would be uh, almost showing you all the, the tools and tips in Ghana that we've learned and that we've, we've shared for you to, to have uh, an idea of what is required to implement vaccination at your farm. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to take them. Thank you so much. Hello everybody, uh, thank you so much for having me here to speak today. Uh, as anyone that's met me in the field knows, I like to talk about vaccinations. So I come originally from the salmon industry where it is quite advanced. All the trial and error was done with the salmon and in 2018 the, I came to Ghana to start training people on how to administer the Tilovac vaccine correctly. or 
in a more efficient manner. Vaccine is an expensive product and you need to get the best value for money out of it. So, this is a basic introduction to vaccination. For every single farm, you would need to modify the system ever so slightly. We're going to talk about the, what you need to do before vaccination. We're going to talk about implementing it in your farm. We'll go over an example of some bad vaccination and what to avoid. Vaccination machines are a very interesting possibility for the future, so we'll touch on them, but we won't go into much detail. And then we'll talk about how to really optimize the process for your farm. So there's three different types of vaccination commonly used with tilapia. Oral vaccination, immersion vaccination, and intraperitoneal vaccination. So with oral, it is a very, very simple vaccine to administer. You mix it with the feed, the tilapia eat the feed. The two problems with it are the length of the cover is just not long. You're looking at redoing this many times over the fish's life. The other problem with it is the biggest fish are going to eat the most vaccine and the smallest fish are going to eat the least vaccine and get the least protection from it. With the immersion vaccine, it's a little bit harder and it has exactly the same problem. The length of protection just doesn't last throughout the full growth cycle of the fish. But again, it's simple to administer. You take the fish out of their cage or your pond, you place them in the vaccine and after a set time, you put them back in the water. What we recommend the most is the intraperitoneal vaccine. It is the most complex to administer to the fish but it provides lifelong protection. Uh, if you're growing your fish up to one kilo, the vaccine is still active. If you're harvesting at 500 grams, the vaccine is still active. It is a single treatment which will last the fish all the way through. So if you've decided to use vaccine on your farm, you really need to get your farm sampled to find out that the vaccine is going to work. If you have a problem the vaccine doesn't cover, then you don't need to be vaccinating for that problem. So then you don't need the streptococcus vaccine for uh, in Aeromonas infection. You don't need it because you've got columnaris killing your fish. You need it for streptococcus, and we need to be sure that it's streptococcus that's causing you the most problem. So what is the next step? So, you need to know that the vaccine is going to work. When we send the vaccine to the farmer, we keep it in a cold chain all the way to the door of the farm. We keep records of it. These records should be accessible. They should be able to check these records. We should be able to check these records. If something bad has happened to the vaccine, if it's been stored at the wrong temperature, it's not going to be effective. You need to check the expiry dates, you need to be checking the batch numbers, and you need a product data sheet. This is, all this is all a service that is provided for, all the way to the door of your farm. And very importantly, the product should be registered with the FDA. We need to know that it's been manufactured correctly, stored correctly. We need to be sure that this is not going to have a bad effect on a human, should you get it in your finger. It's a lengthy, expensive process to go through, but it's just got to be done. So, this is where we get into the, the most interesting bit, in my opinion. What's next? So you need to set up a storage facility in your farm and you need to, you need to make it power cut proof. Uh, you split the vaccine between multiple fridges if at all possible. Keep a large mass of ice. If you've only got 20 bottles in there, fill that fridge with ice packs, fill that fridge with water. If you get a power cut for three, four hours, it's gonna stay nice and cool. 
you need to stop people from being able to go touch the vaccine. We need to, we need to think about some biosecurity. If somebody's been cutting fish open and then they're touching the vaccine bottle, they could be spreading pathogens to the vaccine bottle, and then somebody's touching the vaccine and the fish that day trying to inject, we need to restrict it. Also, it's an expensive product. You just need to be very, very careful with it. We recommend getting temperature trackers to leave in the fridge every week, check the temperature trackers in your laptop, get a full PDF readout. You, you make sure this vaccine's in optimum condition. Check the batch numbers. This is very, very important to have your batch numbers checked. Us as a company, we, we need to know our, our vaccine is working. If there's any problems further down the line and we've got batch number records, we can trace everything back. Don't freeze your vaccine. If you freeze your vaccine, the, the vaccine is dead. The adjuvant is just destroyed. It's not going to work on your fish anymore. You're going to have some very expensive bottles of medical waste, which you now need to dispose of through whatever system your local municipality decides is appropriate for disposing of medical waste. Have a backup generator. That's, that's the ideal thing to have, but we don't live in a world where every farm has reliable electricity. So that's why I say pack that fridge. Pack that fridge with mass. Just keep it, keep it as cool as you can for as long as you can. So before vaccination, you need to pay a lot of attention to your fish. You're relying on your feeders a lot. Your feeders are your key. Maybe your manager is the key. Maybe you have a farm where your manager manages to inspect every cage of fish multiple times a day. But if that's not the case, you're relying upon your feeders. They need to be skilled. If they're noticing a change in the behavior, say three days before vaccination, the fish suddenly go off your feed, you're, you're not vaccinating those fish that week. You need to make sure they're feeding healthy. You need to make sure there's a strong feed reaction. If you start to have a small peak of mortality before you're about to vaccinate your fish, you don't vaccinate your fish. If your fish are already stressed before you vaccinate them, all you're going to do is you're going to stress your fish much more, your fish are going to die. The, the vaccination process itself is incredibly stressful on the fish. You need to minimize everything, especially with the tilapia. They don't like being handled twice in a week. So really pay attention to the health of your fish. For our vaccine, don't vaccinate under 10 grams. The, the fish, we were using a 0.1 dose. The fish is very fragile from all of our checking. We say 10 grams is pretty much the minimum you can go with, with the Tilovac SD vaccine. Grade your fish. Now this is controversial. Most farmers do not grade the fish. If you grade your fish, you can maximize the benefits. A graded fish is easier to put to sleep. A graded fish is easier to handle on the table. You're less likely to put a needle in your finger if you are working with a sleeping graded fish. Also, you get uh, the next benefit, which is if your fish are properly graded, you can get your fish going onto the correct size of feed. You don't have to put a more expensive smaller feed in with the larger feed just in case you've got small ones. This isn't a problem anymore. But from experience, most farmers don't grade the fish in Ghana and I understand the reasons for it. I understand the, the speed, the effort, sometimes the grading causes mortality. So for that reason, I personally recommend vaccination around the 25 to 30 gram mark. With that size of fish, you can generally use a four millimeter needle, and it seems to cover from 15, 20 grams up to 40. And by hitting it that size, at least you're not having multiple tables or multiple needle sizes all working at the same time. And you can speed up the process and make it slightly less stressful. And very importantly, starve your fish. When the gut is swollen, there's much more likelihood of a needle damaging something within the fish. So next up, we need to make sure the staff is well trained. This is, as I said, this is a stressful situation for the fish to go through. If you have staff which are very delicate with the fish, it's going to be better for the fish. They need to be accurate, they need to be well rested, 
and they, it needs to be a stress-free environment for the staff as much as for the fish. When you're working there, you've been sitting there for six hours, you've had your lunch, it's hot, it's tired, there's the noise of a generator maybe in the background. It brings fatigue to the vaccinator, and when the vaccinator is tired, it's the fish that suffer, and it's also much more likely that the vaccinator at that point will accidentally injure themselves. So, as much as you need to make it stress-free for the fish, you really need to keep it as stress-free for the staff as possible. You need to have, you need to start thinking on, on biosecurity also. You need to be restricting the staff's access to other areas of the farm. There's no point in these people being near fish cutting if they're going to be performing a medical procedure on a naive fish later on that day. And you need to make sure that all of your equipment that you use is also isolated from areas of the farm that have disease. In an ideal world, you have a dedicated area that is only used for vaccination, a dedicated platform. If you've got the finances, it's worth having a dedicated boat. Dedicate as much as you can to vaccination. Keep your equipment clean. Use good disinfectants. We're trying to get our Bronopol disinfectant into Ghana just now. We're in the process of registering it with the FDA. Vercon is also a, a disinfectant that has been used on fish farms all over the world. But you need to think about disinfecting. You need to be cleaning the equipment, cleaning the tubes, cleaning the guns thoroughly. I recommend boiling the guns for 30 minutes once per week as, as, as a minimum. Uh, just in, in an ideal world, you'd have access to better equipment. You could do it under pressure, but, but, but we live in the field and we work in the field. There's always a compromise to make, but at the minimum, boil your gun for 30 minutes. Try and kill everything on it. Very importantly, clean your gun first. If you boil your, your gun with vaccine inside it, it's just going to cook onto the cylinder of your gun like scrambled eggs, and then it's going to be a nightmare to clean. Clean, disinfect with alcohol, boil it, and then if, even leave the gun sitting with alcohol in the chamber overnight. It's, it's not a problem. So yes, good equipment maintenance, disinfect and calibrate. Our vaccine is to be used in a 0.1 dose, not 0.08, not 0.12. So every day we supply, or I supply, one millimeter needles, you put 10 shots in, you check the calibration of the gun for, we normally recommend the KC vaccinating gun because it has a counter attached to it and it has the option of putting fish guards on it, which makes the accuracy better. So it's a very simple screw on the side. You just check that you're shooting the right dose of vaccine. If you're putting too much in, it's not going to do any real benefit more, unless you're attempting to grow maybe a two kilo fish. But but we don't recommend it. And if you're using too little vaccine, then you're, you're wasting your money. So the, the next thing we're going to talk about is sort of general, general good, good practice rules. Again, it's fish farming, it's observation. You, you, need to, you need to observe, preferably you need to be there observing your fish farm, if at all possible. Keep an eye on the weather. Is it cloudy? Is there going to be a storm later that day? Uh, these can all have an effect on the fish stress. If it is cloudy, check your oxygen levels. If your oxygen levels are too low at the start of the day, and then you're crowding all of your fish into a small area, it's going to stress them even more. It doesn't mean you don't vaccinate that day, but you can do the, the bagging, the crowding in a much more gentle way. Adjust the anaesthetic baths. There's multiple anaesthetics you can use. You can use clove oil, it is the most common. We have MS-222, we have benzocaine. There, there's many different anaesthetics, but as a general rule, I always reckon them, recommend the farmer to put the fish to sleep in one minute. Use a timer. If your fish is taking five minutes to go to sleep instead of one minute, then it's spending four minutes of extra stress. It's in that water, it's using up oxygen, do you have an oxygen meter in the water with it? Keep it simple. One minute to fall asleep, change your water regularly. You can do a quick top up one time, but change your water regularly. Keep the tables moist. 
this country's hot, the fish are cooking when they're on the table. Don't have them out the water for too long. Don't have them frying on the table. It's, it's self-explanatory. For tables, in an ideal world, you get a nice stainless steel table fabricated. They're actually quite simple to do in Ghana. There's a lot of people that will fabricate a table for you. If you're just wanting to try the vaccine out, you could use a wooden table. You could attach some pond liner to it. It just needs to last a week, two weeks, as long as your trial period is going. Uh, I've even been on fish farms where we're building tables from wood and plastic pipes, and it's lasted a year and a half so far. It's going well. Ensure the correct needle size. Uh, this is, again, your graded fish. This is much easier to use the correct needle size with a graded fish. Most of the time, you'll be using 4 mil, 5 mil, or 6 mil needles. I recommend the 23 gauge, because there seems to be a less leakage in the fish. With the 22, more vaccine seems to be coming back out when the fish moves. It's very simple. You cut off the entire stomach section of a fish. You put the needle through. If the entire eye of the needle has come out, then the vaccine is going in. But if there's too much length of the needle, it might damage the organs. So you can do it by eye. And we're working on a, a chart to give everybody the correct needle size for that size of fish. And always shake the vaccine. It's not a half-hearted shake. It's, you, you need to make a cocktail for 20, 30 seconds. The vaccine must get shaken up. An experienced vaccinator will feel the difference in the pressure of the gun if the vaccine is not shaken up but a new person is not going to feel the difference and they will either just be pumping out a lot of adjuvant or a lot of antigen, but it won't be nicely mixed. Okay, so that's the basics of how to get to, to vaccinate the fish. So how do you make the most of your investment? Ensure the quality of vaccination. And how do you do that? So here we go. So, stress-free. You need to take the fish. Your handling needs to be gentle. You get it to the table. You need to pay great attention to where the vaccine goes in the fish. You don't want to hit this fish hard. Gentle. A lot of people, they pull the trigger too fast or they pull the gun out when the trigger is just pulled. It's a smooth process. The needle goes in, you pull the trigger, you release the trigger, the needle comes out. If you're trying to go too fast, that goes wrong. And you, you, you see it, again, observation, observation. The whoever is in charge of your vaccinating, they need to be watching the vaccinator. It, it, it's actually remarkably simple to see bad vaccination because there's vaccine on the table in front of them, there's vaccine on top of the fish, there's vaccine on the apron, there's vaccine on the fingers. That should all be in the fish. All that vaccine is, is doing nothing. It's just a waste of money that's going to go float about on the water. An absolute waste. Fish counters. Fish counters make such a difference. Uh, you get accurate data on your cages. You get accurate data on the vaccine use and the calibration. You, you know the vaccine is supposed to do 10,000 doses. When you're vaccinating in Norway and it's one person per bottle, you normally get that accuracy to within 50 to 100 shots. And again, it's, it's achievable. It's hard work. It's constant monitoring. It's constant ob observation. But it is achievable. This is a hard one to get your head around at first. But when you are doing this medical process, this gives you the opportunity to, to cull off all of your weak fish. If you can get your vaccinator to think like a consumer, you open the box of fish, you don't want to see a fish with one fin and a bad eye. So why are you going to feed that fish for the next five months? You remove the fish showing signs of disease, maybe it's a popped eye, maybe it's ulcers underneath the mouth, maybe the gill plate has been eaten away, if the fish looks weak, if the fish looks sick, kill it. If the fish is damaged, if the fish has got a chunk out of it, its fins are gone, kill it. This fish is not going to do your FCR any good. This fish is not going to look like a good product to sell at the end of the day. The best you're going to get is selling it as rejected fish. 
why, why go to the effort of feeding it for, for months? Just kill off all the weak fish as you vaccinate them. At the end of the day, you've got a better FCR, better data, and a better product. So right just now in Ghana, the best vaccinators that I work with are doing 12,000 fish per day each. It's taken practice. It's taken a long time, but uh, some, it's, it's mostly ladies I work with in Ghana, and just now we are achieving 96% accuracy of the vaccine point on average over millions of fish. 12,000 fish per day is what the faster, more experienced ladies do. The slower ladies are still doing 1,000 fish per hour. It's, it's a, a very high standard. And one thing I did not mention was it's very important to have somebody checking these fish. We will be providing grading sheets. There is a target. Take 100 fish, write down what the target is. Take 20 of those fish, cut them open, make sure there's vaccine inside it. Maybe somebody is inexperienced, they didn't realize their gun is misfiring, they're just putting holes in fish for an hour. Uh, that's a, a terrible thing to be happening. The fish is not protected, it's now got a hole in it, there's no benefit, no benefit whatsoever. So with the tilapia, it is a very forgiving fish for vaccination. It has some great properties post-vaccination. It doesn't seem, out of every tilapia I have checked for internal bruising, in four years, I've not found a bruised fish. We still check, but there, there, there's no bruising in the fish. The, the vaccine, because the, because the fish is harvested at such a small size or small age compared to salmon, you don't get uh, the adhesions and the lesions inside the fish either. So it's actually a very simple fish to gut post-vaccination as well. The only real problem you find is when somebody, when a vaccinator is either careless or more likely fatigued, sometimes the fish gets vaccinated in the side. This shot of vaccine is supposed to go into the stomach cavity. If the vaccine is going into the muscle, then when you're checking fish, you feel it with your hand very, very easily and it, uh, yeah, when you're checking fish, you feel it with your hand very, very easily, and it, it makes a bubble on the side of the fish. Again, this is a fish that just needs to go into a mortality bucket. Uh, when you sell this fish, it's going to have a pocket of vaccine inside it. The consumer doesn't want to eat that. So we'll, we'll touch briefly on vaccinating machines uh, and whether it's right for for tilapia. So originally, the, the vaccinating machines that I have used, and I've used many types of machine, the, the first generation machines, they're just not suitable for tilapia. Uh, the reason being because tilapia don't get graded, and the old machines, they needed a perfectly graded fish for the needle to go in. You spend most of your time lying on your back underneath the machine, watching needles go into fish and having vaccine drip on your face. It was an unpleasant experience with the first generation machines. But now we have second generation machines coming through the system and it is a far better product for tilapia. So the advantages, accuracy. All of these fish, all of these machines, they decide where the vaccine point is and they put it in the correct place. Traceability they collect data. At the end of the day, they can upload directly to you. They can either take out a spreadsheet with the biomass and the stocking numbers of that day. You can do it by person. You can do it by channel. It's some very interesting data that come off the machines. You, they can even upload them directly to Aquanetics or Aquamanager if you use a management program for your farm. Automatic grading. It doesn't matter what size the fish is. You put it in 10 grams, you put it in 70 grams, and you have your machine set so that the fish coming out are getting graded to the size of food that fish is about to eat. Again, you're not putting in some more expensive small feed just in case there's a small fish in there. Whatever size of pellet it goes to, maybe you want to set it off so that you get 45 grams and above. 
then you want to have 30 to 45 grams and everything under 30 grams. And they all go to different tanks automatically with the grading systems of the modern machines. And less labor force. Uh, vaccinating is it's time consuming and it takes, it takes training, dedication, observation. You need to be on the ball. With the machine, you still need to be on the ball. It's, you can't make a machine run and not check it. You still need somebody checking the fish. You still need somebody checking there's vaccine in the fish, but it's just less labor intensive. You can use less people to do the process. The disadvantages are they're expensive. Uh, maybe 120, 130,000 euros plus for a machine. So you need to be, you need, when it's that expensive, you need your machine to be running every single day of the week to get your money back off of it. Technical support. It's, it's always an issue to get technical support. That's one of the problems with the older machines, the people that made them, those companies don't exist anymore and you can't get spare parts, you can't get technical support. At least with these generation two machines, there's been so much investment into them that uh, the, the technical support is, is at a different level. A, a great example would be when, when Mascon came in line in Norway your machine would have a problem, you'd make a phone call, somebody would get the part from the storage, they'd go out, jump in a plane, hire a car, come to your farm and fix it. But we're in Ghana and this is not going to happen. So you need to have everything prepared. You need a machine that's strong. You need a machine that's robust. It's A, you don't want it to break down and if it does break down, it needs to be simple to fix. So these are all points to consider on the vaccination machine. Do they have a future? I think they have a future in tilapia. Uh, I don't know what size of farm it's going to be or if communities could use machines, but I believe that there will be machines being used in tilapia. In fact, I know for a fact that they have trialled them in some of the larger farms in Latin America. So, you have now vaccinated your fish, how to perform quality checks, and is it possible to optimize the process even more? So again, batch numbers, ensure the traceability of the vaccine. If you have a problem with your fish in the future, you've had higher than expected mortalities, we trace that back with the batch number, we compare that with the performance on your farm, we compare that with the performance on other farms, we compare that with the performance on other farms and other continents. We need to make sure that everything is working perfectly. Keep a score sheet, record the fish sizes, the needles used, environmental factors, the personnel, issues with the syringes. This is all, this is all basic record keeping and again, observation. Observation and record keeping. It allows, you to, it allows you to identify factors that you did not realize were factors that are affecting performance two, three months down the line. You can trace it back. Pharmacovigilance reports. This is very, very important for us. It's very important for the FDA. We need to know the vaccine is working. We need proof the vaccine is working. We need proof that the fish are healthy. We need proof that it's not hurting people. This is pharmacovigilance. We're, we don't sell you the vaccine and then go away. We sell you the vaccine, we help you with the vaccine. Over the next year, we improve your efficiency with the vaccine. We optimize the product, we help your farm perform better. We keep records of absolutely everything and everything must be done officially with the reg relevant government authorities, with our bosses. It's all got to be done by the book. Further optimization, have healthy fish at vaccination. We've already touched upon this. Don't vaccinate a sick fish. Promote herd immunity. Herd immunity is when your whole farm is covered by the vaccine. We, we've talked about perform, uh, administering vaccine for the hot weather. This is going full power. Every single fish has vaccine in it. It should mean that if an outbreak occurs in your neighbor's farm, upstream. Your fish, while they will still get affected, fish will still die. It prevents a farm killing event where 20, 30, 40% of your biomass is destroyed. 
you've done your best to protect the entire herd of fish. Maintain biosecurity across the, <laughs> across the farm. Uh, this is hard in Ghana, especially when you buy fingerlings from fingerling producers in other regions, other parts. It's, it's, it's tough. Biosecurity in Ghana is tough, but it shouldn't be given up on. People think it's a big lake. Biosecurity won't work. Look at Norway, it's a big sea. But biosecurity is everything. Biosecurity is not going to stop you getting disease. Biosecurity is going to stop you getting hit as bad by the disease when it comes. Because the diseases are coming, they're not going anywhere. With biosecurity, you can get an extra three, four weeks, maybe, of harvesting and selling fish when your neighbor is already out the game. The price has gone up. You're making some money that you can put back into the farm so you don't lose everything. It's constant, it's vigilant. Be clean. Keep records of every vehicle that comes into your farm. Use vaccine as part of your biosecurity to control disease. The, 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 the biosecurity really needs to be worked on here. And it's, it's small steps, small steps at a time, and you just you add a layer of protection to your farm. Use the appropriate stocking density. Uh, vaccines is, is not magic. It's a, it's a tool. It's not magic. It's, it's just a production tool. You can't say, my fish are vaccinated, I'm going to double the stocking density, and I'm going to try and grow these fish as fast as I possibly can. It's not going to work that way. You, you still need to be sensible. The vaccine's a tool that's going to increase your survival when you are farming properly. You can still make mistakes, or you can still make bad decisions that are going to affect your fish. The vaccine will help. And continue with regular disease screening. For us, we need to know what is killing the fish. We need to know what we can provide protection against. And disease screening is a way forward. Who knows when something else, if something else, is going to come. But we need to prepare for that event. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. It's been a real pleasure and I, I look forward to answering any vaccination questions. <laughs> thank you very much, um, Sandy and Adrian. I know, Adrian, you talked about um, a topic on tilapia diseases and uh, what we need to know. I would, I would want you to hold on a bit. I would want the, our um, development partners and then the ministry or the fisheries commission to also um, do their presentation. Then we get back to the Nile tilapia disease. But before that, if we have any questions on this aspect of the vaccination. Yes. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Um, um, I have just, I have a few questions, but I'll start with just one and then the others. I just wanted to find out, it seems you are doing a lot in the fisheries sector, but what is the extent of your collaboration with the Fisheries Commission? The last time we worked with the Fisheries Ministry was in the ISKNV outbreak. Uh, where we were the only company to provide free sampling for the fisheries ministry. I mean, for, for myself, I'm on the field most of the time. I try and pop by, say hello to Janet. But really, there's, there's much bigger opportunities for collaboration with the ministry. Much bigger opportunities. You have some time? And yes, um, I'm asking that because um, whatever happens on the lake, which I'm very much aware that all the, most of the things that you are doing hovers around the lake area. Whatever happens, the fish health unit of the Fisheries Commission will be called upon to come and then um, address the issues. But you don't report to us, not even, I saw that you have some, um, is it pharmacovigilance report? We don't even, we've not seen any of these reports that you, you've been talking about. You do a lot, but you don't have any report whatsoever on your activities on the lake. So that's why I asked the question that, what is the extent of your collaboration with the institu institution that is mandated? 
to address fish, I mean fisheries things. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, this is not the platform for this sort of uh, discussion, but um, we right the wrong, so make sure that yes. you do the right things. My colleagues have a lot of questions for you, okay. but um, maybe we would address it on a different uh, okay. platform. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Just wanted to mention something for the Fisheries Commission. We are very open to work with you, and we should have started working with you way earlier. I agree with you that maybe there was not enough communication, but I think this is why we are all here to discuss fish health, and I want to take this opportunity that from now on, we spend more time working with, you, with the Fisheries Commission, and if those reports that the FDA requested us to hand in to them, because it's part of the registration, we can share them with you, of course. I think that there's been a bit of a, uh, an issue between, uh, I would say, uh, private pharmace pharmaceutical company and maybe the public sector. We've been wanting to do a lot of diagnostics with the Fisheries Commission. Um, we wanted to really do push our clients to actually get the results that, they are co that we are collecting in Ghana to do it with them. But unfortunately, every time that I try to, to approach and to do the diagnostics, the tools were not ready or the stuff wasn't available or there was some issues with it. I'm hoping that maybe we could collaborate more so that you, whatever uh, screenings there is happening in Ghana, then you are aware of what's going on. Because I, I understand, I feel that it's completely unfair that we are keeping the information for ourselves. It should be shared. So I'm hoping that after this, this meeting, we can sit down and really work on a plan for us to work together more hand in hand uh, for the better of the Ghanaian aquaculture industry. Thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, I want to find out um, from Shandi and then the other presenter, um, what is the FCR um, and then the survival rate after vaccination? Um, that seems not to have been um, projected. And then if there is any um, after um, assessment of the actual immunity levels or buildup of immunity in the vaccinated fish, if we have some data or information on that, that would be very grateful to be shared. Thank you. I have, I have data for this particular vaccine uh, to share with you. Uh, actually, one of our brochures that we have been, we've been passing around, I don't know if you had the chance to come to our booth, but we have a brochure that shows the a beta FCR on a real case study from a, from a, a farmer. And uh, in terms of the immune response over time, we also have some information if you want to have access to it. But we were taking, for example, blood of fish that were much later in the production, and we could still see that they were responding to, to, the, to the antigens that we were vaccinating against, yeah. So we have that information if you're interested to see. I didn't present them today. Because you know farmers, they are also very particular about this, this, this FCR data and this information to share. I would love to share more, but it's very confidential to them. But we do have uh, studies if you want to come and, 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 and speak to us afterwards. You're from the WRI, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Stanley from the Fisheries Commission. Uh, my question it's more from the veterinary practice point of view. How then, uh, how much do you collaborate with the Vets Council? Because I know in other countries, vaccination can be done by farmers, but in Ghana it's not so. So who does the vaccinations and how are they recognized or regulated by the Vets Council? Thank you. Our local representative is Dr. Selon Tete, who is unfortunately not here today, but he is our local veterinarian for our company. Yes, but there's a difference with the local veterinarian and then the veterinary council. We are all regulated by the council. Okay. So as an individual, I can work with anybody in the field once I'm certified. And we are being regulated by the, the council, right? So those that do the vaccinations and all of that, that's different from as a personal private uh, vets, my relations and my working with you, the whole practice of veterinary medicine. I cannot go to any country, no matter the grade with which I finished school, I cannot go to any country and begin to practice or even or advise prescribe. people yeah. or prescribe. I yeah, cannot yeah, do that. I, I have to be registered there. So yeah. that's why I asked the question, who does the vaccination? How is your regulation, uh, your um, 
your your activities with the collaboration with the Vet Council? How is it like? Okay, as I said, it's a pity that doc, the, the representative here, Dr. Selom Tete, is not here. I wish he was, but his daughter is getting married, so there, there's some there's some priorities. But please, why don't we speak with Dr. Selom Tete about this and uh, and understand a little bit further about the, these regulations? Um, good morning. Um, I am not with any regulatory body, but um, I just wanted to be clear on some information you shared today. You made mention of the fact that the serotypes um, in Ghana are serotype 1B and 1A. So I wanted to find out why then are we um, advocating for a trivalent vaccine? Um, I want to just understand the logic behind that. That's a very good question. Sandy, do you want to... Well, so far, Ghana is the only country which has 1A that we've not identified strep 3 in. It affects, it's got a different mortality pattern, it affects at slightly different temperatures, and it's actually a harder one to isolate. And then there's the problem of who has the reagents to actually check for streptococcus 3 and who is checking for streptococcus 3. It takes a long time for a country to be organized to get in the correct equipment, sort of the correct reagents to start checking for all these new pathogens. And that's where we can actually be, be of real benefit by identifying these pathogens quickly, like we did with Streptococcus 1A, which we informed the ministry about in 2019. As soon as we found there was a new pathogen in the country, we go through the correct process, we informed the ministry about it. But, but we need to be vigilant and check for these other pathogens as well. Now, with a vaccine, it's incredibly expensive to make a vaccine, to do two years of testing, to make sure the vaccine is still stable, and then to start registering. With this particular vaccine, this is a registered product that was available in other countries, in Latin America, in Asia. So by using this vaccine, we're not developing a vaccine specifically for Ghana, which is going to cost the farmer so much more money because it's worldwide and registered worldwide, it's actually cheaper for the farmer to use this than a specifically made vaccine just for Ghana. It's going to cost more. And, and furthermore, um, I'm going to have a presentation about Nautilapia diseases. Serotype 3 is very well known in the industry to be a problematic. And by having at least this product, we are already steps ahead about what could be coming next in the country instead of always having the farmers having issues with mass mortalities. Shouldn't we be, for once, ahead of the curve? Yes, um, ahead of the curve, but you realize that you can't introduce a vaccine into a population where the disease is not endemic or is not there. Well, that's so ethically, I mean, you have made mention of the fact that the farmers stand to gain from a cheaper vaccine than making a vaccine specifically for what pertains here. That's what um, Sandy was saying. How, how do you know it's not here when you can't test for it? Pardon me? How, how, how do you know it's not here when it's not being tested for so, regularly as yes, part of the disease yes. screening? So that brings us back to the point with collaboration with the regulatory bodies because there's ongoing surveillance. Actually, with the lake, um, there's been a lot of surveillance. There was a study in 2020 and 2021 and with both studies, the serotype 3 hasn't been found or hasn't been detected. So how, um, it's, it's like introducing Ebola vaccine in the US. That's how it sounds to me. Because the bar, the, the, it's not endemic here. We've not seen it yet. So is, if you're saying we should just vaccinate because it may come, I, I think right. ethically we may be missing Right now in the world, in the Nautilapia industry, you don't have a vaccine for 1A, 1B, commercially speaking. It is not available. You can ask our colleague from MSD or Pharmac or other companies. It is not available. This vaccine has been registered, has been approved by the Ghanaian FDA. There is long track records of the vaccine being safe and being used in different countries. And it has shown to the Ghanaian industry that this vaccine has been more beneficial than not vaccinating. Yes, um, okay, so I think someone wants to talk, so yes. I'll just... I, I think that... 
Yeah, I, I think that uh, before I, I hand over to him, I, you know, this is a very healthy kind of interaction, and uh, the you know the uh, FC would also come up to you know, but I think that we we'll need a very good forum to trash out some of these things because we need this sort of collaborative effort, a holistic approach to the whole issue so that we'll all be on the same wavelength and you know, develop our aquaculture industry. So. I love the presentation, it's amazing. Unfortunately, I think what I'm seeing is a, a slight lack of communication between various monitoring agencies and it will be good for them to coordinate among them to identify those communication issues. Um, I, I am inter particularly interested in your traceability. Um, when you came to uh, record keeping, yes. I didn't see uh, any uh, barcode or digital tracking. I saw a 1980 calculator, <laughs> just, <laughs> just to make it a little fun. Um, one of my specialty is traceability and monitoring of sampling to the implementation of the system. That was my first question. How do you handle digital traceability? The second question is, how many students on the university work as interns in your, pro in your process? Do you uh, often hire either uh, data management students or do you work with uh, microbiology students to participate in uh, you know application of uh, some of your vaccine production system thank you okay uh, for, for traceability we use the the batch numbers that come from the manufacturing plant there, there is no barcodes on our bottle just now in all honesty, to, to, to relabel the bottle is going to go through FDA processes. Just, just to, sorry, okay. To, to, to relabel the bottle is going to go through FDA processes just to get authorization to do this. It is something that's worth looking into in the future, for sure, the barcoding. Uh, but yes, we, we deal with every, every batch number of vaccine is registered from the manufacturing plant through the company and then monitored on the lake. Now, interestingly enough, we have been attempting to find a couple of Ghanaian people to bring on as a, a fish health team members. At, at, in, interestingly enough, at, at Tropo Farms just now, which is our biggest customer, we're in the process of building a fish health team from Ghana. Fish yes, using using recent using recent graduates. Yeah, well, really, f f fish welfare. They need to monitor the whole process. It's not just about the diseases. So, so we're in the process of building the team with Tropo just now. But obviously, it's, it's we can assist the farm with this, but we we can't do that ourselves. Yes. I think the fish, well, the fish health team is for the farm itself. In big commercial farms around the world, they have dedicated pe persons from the farm that works for the farm, dedicated to make sure that the fish are okay or anything. And if they need to call a veterinarian, they get in touch with, with the veterinarians or they call the, the fisheries, I for example. Wanted, I, I work with uh, the fishery in Alaska. We produce uh, uh, millions of salmons. Um, we collect the eggs, we grow them, and then we dump them in the river for the state to provide license to people to go fish. So if you do that process, you save 95% of the fish. If the egg grows in the, in the, in the river, about 90% of them die. So your fish health team is really great. Have a 911 number for them. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very good presentation. I'm just going to talk generally about uh, what happens in most countries in Africa. Uh, we from the regulatory um, 
institutions, because I'm retired from the regulatory institutions, we sort of wait to see things happen rather than being proactive in looking out uh, in the country to perform our mandate because we have the mandate to monitor, to control, and to see that things are done correctly. But unfortunately, we stand in the position of regulators waiting to be asked to come to do things or to be shown that this is happening. There is a need for that orientation. I'm not talking about Ghana alone. I'm talking generally. There is a need for that orientation to change that we who are regulators, who are monitors of the industry, should go out to see what is happening in our different um, countries and ensure that things are done according to the laws and regulations of the different countries. That's number one. And the new world order now is towards fish welfare. Every aspect of fish, freedom from hunger, freedom from torture, uh, water management, everything, the freedom, the five freedoms for animal is now being applied to fish. And so each country in Africa should form a welfare team to see that the uh, producers, the stakeholders, the fish farmers, they know what is expected of them in ensuring that the fish is not stressed, the fish is not exposed to diseases, is not susceptible to diseases, and even go further to the level of how do you transport them, how do you slaughter them without causing them pain? Because the way we slaughter now, we cause a lot of pain to the fish. All these things are what we, the regulators, should ensure that we put in our local language or we teach to our farmers who are the operators, who are the people on the field, so that they know the expectation from them. We've been talking about opening on the market for our products. If all these things are not in place, we don't have a good welfare uh, process in place, which involves part of fish diseases, management of fish diseases, even the use of vaccines. Are, in, are important under we, uh, fish welfare. We won't be able to open up the markets because they are all encompassing issues that must go into the production system, the entire value chain, before we can think of having international access to uh, uh, having access to international markets and being able to expand our production eventually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are running behind time. So um, shall we give a round of applause? So, should we still get some time after the FC and our um, development partners have uh, spoken, then we could get you back to complete on the night lab your disease. So shall we now call on Dr. Um, Kuju to give us his uh, um, of art to follow when um, commercial artists uh, have taken the stage and talk very professionally about what they can do and what they do and what they offer. How many farmers are in the audience? How many students are in the audience? Yeah. Um, I have to make a decision quickly as to what I want to do today. Uh, because I represent the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. And our mandate, our core mandate here is to support the Fisheries Commission to deliver on their core mandate. That is our mandate. Um, so uh, one of the things we have done when we came in was to do a lab audit. 
you cannot have a fish tree or an aquaculture industry without a diagnostic service. That can never happen. And we've seen uh, the repercussions of that when the major diseases struck in 2018. Um, oh, sorry. You can turn that off because I'm not going to use it. Um, 2018, uh, in the month of May and June, we were here to do a limited survey of the Volta Lake and to take samples for uh, analysis. Um, at that time, there was this care of uh, TLV, so our focus then was on TLV, but then we did uh, took some biological samples. The report is available on the net that you can look at. Um, having then decided to do the lab audit, we identified labs in Ghana, which we at that time found that they were not in position to give any valid diagnostic results. Um, and it is not because of lack of competence. It is because resources have not been made available to them to do that function, and that was sad. Um, so we went back to the drawing board, uh, and then currently, uh, that mandate I talked about um, uh, translated into what we now call the Fish for Development Program financed by the Norwegian government, NORAD. Um, we realized that there have been, how do I put it? Um, there were no trained fish health officers, and then very few, at least, at least as I know, two fish health veterinarians. Now we can boast of four uh, fish health veterinarians that are actively being trained, uh, that I think are in command of what they know, what they can do, and what they can deliver. Uh, it's work in progress, and uh, with time, maybe you see uh, maybe what they are doing. To support them are also uh, various attempts to also educate people, build capacity in the area of fish health management. So we also have given scholarship to, I think I need my bottle of water too, so I don't dry up. Thank you. So, offered, we have offered a scholarship to six Ghanaian uh, workers. Four of them are from the Fisheries Commission, one from the University of Ghana, and then one from the Research Institute at ADEC, Akosombo. The idea is to have a blend so that they can actually communicate among themselves to understand their living environment understand the nature of their problem so that they can prefer solutions to it. Um, that is also work in progress. We have also actively um, trained uh, staff of the Fishery Commission in our sister institution in Abasa in Egypt into the detailed practicalities of aquaculture so they can understand what do you face when they go to the field? Um, that is also work in progress. And luckily, we have also included our Nigerian counterparts as well, uh, in, uh, University of Lagos, who are also benefiting from another scholarship program and then a PhD program to vamp the area of research um, education and then building capacity in the various and then also to build network. Now, to be able to prefer any real solutions to Ghana's problems, which I consider a very dynamic system, you have to be patient. You have to understand 
their various authors, their roles, what they play, what they do. So we designed uh, a baseline study to study what is the disease situation on the Volta Lake. That work has been done. Uh, the report is also available. Uh, it has given us a significant insight into the nature of the Ghana's fish disease problem. Um, luckily, uh, the people who have actually supported us to do that work, the lady is there, she's uh, uh, Angela, the lady in red. Um, it's good work. Uh, it was done during the COVID period, so unfortunately we were not present. I have the benefit of being with them now to go to the north of Ghana, where they were doing the sampling for the second phase, which is to study the situation in ponds. Once that data is analyzed, uh, we'll compare with the first one, then we'll have a holistic picture of the situation. Then we can start professing solutions. I have to say that even though uh, my colleagues talk very beautifully about vaccines, it is extremely dangerous to vaccinate in the middle of an epidemic. Uh, it is extremely dangerous to vaccinate in the middle because you need to vaccinate and then prime the this thing so that their memory will then kick in when the real situation comes. When, when you vaccinate in the middle of an epidemic, what then happens is that you just generate other variants. Okay. Um, it is also unfortunate that such exercise can also occur on the blind side of the commission. Now, again, I'm <laughs> drying up. Stakeholder collaboration in, in a, such a dynamic system is very, very, very important. I mean, the universities with active student minds can be engaged to tease out maybe some of these problems. But then they have to be systematically analyzed and put into a, a contest to serve maybe the industry. So you have farmers or feed producers and whatever, they are major stakeholders. They have to engage also with government officials who make policy, and then the regulators. It's, it's a win-win situation if the, that tripartite group can work actively together to find solutions. Uh, commercial artists, like maybe vaccine producers, play a very important role, but they are in for profit. Mm, they are in, uh, there's nothing wrong with that because they also render useful service to the industry and there must be place for them to play that role. Mm. But then it has to be done within a system which is properly uh, transparent and an oversight established. So, um, for me not to take maybe too much time, um, is there Rabna here? Good. So, uh, I would like to engage uh, the four veterinarians because they have now started gradually reaching out to the various districts they have as been assigned to. Uh, a veterinarian has been assigned to the Kosombo area where all the major activities are happening. A veterinarian has been assigned to Koforidua area uh, in Kumasi and then the north. Um, it was a delight for me to go on a road trip with Stanley, who is the veterinarian assigned to the uh, northern sector, and uh, I learned a lot. So I'm not going to stand here to think that I know it all. I'm an old man on the block. Uh, even so, I will let the new kids on the block take a center stage. So I would like uh, to start with Stanley to tell us what you are doing about fish health management in Ghana. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Doc. So I'm Stanley. 
Um, as mentioned, I am the veterinarian for the northern sector. Uh, the northern sector is from the Ashanti region through the Ahafo regions, Bono, Savannah, to the northern parts of the country. And our production is mainly uh, focused on catfish, because, mainly because um, it's, uh, they do better in um, poorer or relatively poorer water quality you know, issues. So where we don't have the lake and all of that, most of them prefer to do the uh, catfish. So we have a lot of uh, ponds, the earthen ponds, the concrete tanks, and the tarpaulin. So in the area of fish health, what we have been doing um, is to improve our reach to the farmers. Before I went there, most of the farmers seem to not even know that there, there is even something called a fish vet who can address their issues, okay? So we've tried to do a lot of sensitization with trainings and uh, some collaborations with the University of K um, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We've engaged with them to do some um, exposure, more or less, to let them see who we are and what we do. Secondly, the area of diagnostics, as mentioned, is a very key area. We have a fish lab and the operations were very minimal, if I should say, and not up to standard. So what we are currently doing is to try to bring up the standard to be able to diagnose uh, and, and have valid results for um, fish health cases. So as things are, we can only do postmortem, and we do a few, um, a few bacteriology, okay? So with, 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 again, with logistics, we'll be able to do a full, um, how do you call it, microbiology in, in respect to bacteriology. So as of now, we work uh, with the, the tertiary laboratory, the vet lab at the regional office. So when um, we have cases and they have some of the reagents, we borrow and then we're able to do that. It can be improved because it's very important for us to have a very good area to diagnose diseases within that, that um, sector. There are lots of uh, diseases that come mainly because of regulations. You know, we don't have the proper regulatory, issues, uh, regulatory measures actively. You know, they are there, but they are actively not being enforced. So then you have people, for example, movement control. So that's the third thing that we're trying to do. Movement control is an issue. People buy fish uh, and fish seed from Akosombo, where we know we have a, a, an, an issue, ongoing issue with ISKNV. They buy from there and they ship it all over the northern sector. So I'm speaking for just the northern sector. And this is a concern because we are not aware of where they are coming from, where they are going to, what diseases and parasites or pathogens they may be carrying. And so, um, as you try to sew one side of the sack, which is cut, all right, someone is also opening another side, and it makes the job very difficult for us. So, so far, these three areas are what we're trying to do, trying to uh, sensitize farmers um, by way of letting them know what we do, by security, um, um, diagnostic services available to them, and also, secondly, to improve our um, ability to give valid results when consulted, particularly with laboratory confirmation. And then the third thing is to try and enforce some of the regulatory um, rules. So we, I, I forgot to mention, we, we actually have a feed, uh, a feed pro producer, uh, Beacon Hill, I don't know if there are reps here. Yes, so we certified them, I think, last year to start operations, and we are working very well with them to also be monitoring the um, quality of the feed they give, not in the nut nutrient point of view, but also in the, with the disease pathogens, because feed can also spread uh, disease. So that's what we're trying to do now. So these are the main three things that we're doing. With a bit of support and resources, we can improve our work even uh, more. Thank you.
Uh, Kofi, I think you should get ready. Uh, all, all of you are going to have a say today. Um, so. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Kofi in tea, Ejako. I'm at Koforidia, in charge of the Eastern region, um, excluding Akosombo Enclave. Um, basically, what I do is with public health, we inspect the meat that has been brought from the various farms, or I would refer to it as meat, or the fish that has been brought from the various farms to be sold at the market. So God will, um, every Thursday, we go to Jackson Park to inspect whatever that is being sold to the consumers. And then also we extend it to the processes. We go to the various processing sites where they smoke and where they prepare and do whatever to the fish before it's brought to the market. Also at the market too, we go with the post harvest um, unit to inspect whatever that is being sold to the general public. We also render laboratory services. Hopefully by the end of the year, our lab should be very operational and very functional. Now we are limited to microscopy, um, post-mortem diagnosis, and then most of the time visual diagnosis, but hopefully we should be doing some microbiology and maybe extend to do some other laboratory services as required of us. And then also we render general advice and consultancy to farmers as well. So if you want to start a production, we come, we inspect your site, we look at your source of water, we look at every other input that is needed for you to put in to establish a particular farm. Looking at even your location, whether a concrete tank whether a tarpaulin tank or whether um, an earthen pond is going to help, we advise on that as well with the help of officers in the commission. And then we also look at whatever production index, or whatever production parameters that are supposed to take into consideration. Your feeding, your stocking, the sampling, sometimes even sorting the bigger ones from the smaller ones. Because we mostly do with a variety of um, having tilapia and then catfish. And some also do the polyculture, where they mix the catfish and the tilapia. So we also advise on the various diseases that you could identify with tilapia and with catfish and which ones that we could um, put in interventions to control. And after diagnosis, we also administer treatment which we supervise to make sure that whatever treatment protocol, treatment regime that we develop for you as a farmer, you stick to it and then it yields results for you. And then we also encourage all the stakeholders and all the farmers, please come on board we are ready to work, we are ready to make impact, we are ready to serve. But without your cooperation, it would be like islands trying to build up a particular nation. It's not going to work. But when we are connected and we are strong, we can make all the impacts that we seem to do. Finally, with the help of our units, we also conduct monitoring and disease surveillances around farms and around communities in the region. And then and we've benefited from baseline study and some other projects that is ongoing. So in a nutshell, this is what we do at the Eastern region, and then we are hoping to do more with your cooperation. Thank you. Um, the lady will go last because... Uh... Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Kweku Diodu. I'm the veterinarian in charge of the Akosombo Zone. Um, I guess if I say Akosombo zone, uh, for those who don't know, it involves so many districts. It's not just Akosombo. So it's from the Sejamayan district up to the Lower Mana district, up to the Somena district. And now we are making efforts to um, extend fish health services to the Vota region and then the OT region. So I can say I'm also catering for the Vota region and OT region. So if you're a farmer here from OT region and Vota region, please, you can reach out to me. Um, although I am assigned to Akosombo zone, I'm also assigned to the OT region and the Vota region. So um, uh, for me, I, I guess um, I can say my, my work is the most difficult because to be placed in an area known to, be, known to contribute to about 90% of aquaculture in Ghana uh, it's, it's a hectic job. Um, uh, I guess what I do is no much different from what my colleagues do. But um, what I can say is that when I, when I was posted to the Akosombo zone, I realized that uh, there was a lot that, 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 was, you know, that was supposed to be done. Um, especially beginning with letting people know that now there's somebody you can come to 
when you have a fish health problem. Before that, it seems farmers had no choice or rather decided to do their own thing. They decided to attend to fish health matters with what they know, with what they've heard. So before that, and even I can say now, farmers become their own fish doctors. They see something on their fish, they take some antibiotic, put it in the feed, give it to the fish on the lake. And I can say even now it's being done because during my monitoring, I have picked up these kind of you know, wrongdoings. Farmers just, and they do it just um, indiscriminately, you know, it's just, it's like they, they think there's nothing wrong in it. But um, I can't blame them, like I'm saying. That is what they were used to. That's what they are, that, that's, that was the easiest way out before I came. So now I came and now um, what is required is something that is still um, in progress, you know. So what do they need? They need diagnostics. Um, how, do we do that? how do we give them that diagnostics? We need equipment, laboratory, and I think uh, plans are underway to ensure that we, we have uh, a functioning laboratory in the Akosombo zone that can also cater for the OT region. Uh, luckily, uh, Volta region has a veterinary laboratory that I can say is active, that can provide services for fish health matters. Um, and so, um, since I was there, I've got the opportunity to work with some very, should I say, reasonable and disciplined farmers or farms who would rather seek the best way out than the easiest way out. So let me just applaud African Golden Tilapia Farms, if any representative is here, Peter Ajika. I want to applaud you here that you are doing so well. He's one of the few farmers who calls me all the time. And uh, I can say I have run a lot of diagnostics for him with collaboration with the University of Ghana by, by chemistry laboratory. He keeps coming to me and we keep running laboratory diagnostics, which is the best. And so I want to applaud him. Um, I, want him to, I want him to keep it up because that is the best way out. And also, let me applaud uh, the Akosombo Aquaculture Research Development Center, ADEC. Um, we have very good collaboration. Um, one, of the, one of the few ways I wanted to help um, you know, solve the problem was to try and tackle it from the main source, if I, if I can say so. Because ADEC is a, um, is a recognized and one of the main fingerling suppliers. They supply fingerlings to all parts of Ghana. So I felt that if I'm able to have a good collaboration with the source, at least we can minimize the impact. And ADEC has been doing so well. Um, um, they've been coming for movement permits, which involves me going there, inspecting the stock that is going to be distributed to other parts. I inspect them visually to ensure they don't show any observable you know, signs, abnormalities. And this is something that's ongoing. Um, I even did that for them a few months ago. And so also, I want to applaud them. They should keep it up. That is one of the ways we can help, you know, you know try and solve the problem. So um, kudos to ADEC. OK, so now with the diagnostics, um, that is something, like I said, it's ongoing. Um, for farmers who are in the Kosombo zone, you can come to me anytime, but just, just know that I would have to take your samples to Accra um, to get the diagnostics. Um, not having a laboratory in Akosombo doesn't mean we cannot run diagnostics. We run diagnostics, samples are being taken to Accra, and we get very good results, we get very good um, solutions, very good management um, solutions, so yeah. So um, just know that even without a physical laboratory in Akosombo, we still run diagnostics. So aside the diagnostics, one of the main things I have been doing was to expose myself to farmers. Let them know that, hey, I am here. I'm here for you. I'm here for your fish, for your fish to get well. So one of my main activities has been going to farms. I've gone to a lot of farms already. Um, um, luckily, very soon I'll be having a tour in the OT region as well, although I've been there um, already. But I'm going to have a tour in the OT region. Um, I think that is one of the first things to do because some, genuinely, some farmers may not know because I'm even just one man handling a wide area. So genuinely, some may not know, so I want to expose myself, which I'm doing actively. Go to, I go to farms, 
I get in touch with farmers, let them know I'm here. I'm here to help you with your fish health matters. Um, to the best that I can, I, I'll try and help you. So most of my activities has been going to farms, going to farmers, speaking to farmers, letting them know I'm here. Um, so that's the sensitization aspect. And then I guess um, I'm, I'm back to the trying to solve the problem. Uh, I keep on preaching biosecurity because that's one of the best and easiest way out. Once biosecurity is at least closer to perfect, I think things will get better. But just to say that to face reality, just to face reality, is difficult because of the nature of my area. It's difficult. How do you maintain that biosecurity level you want? Because this is an open source water. Everybody has access to the water. But we will not give up. The little things that we are doing, let's keep it up. Movement permits, um, uh, you know, making sure you diagnose diseases properly before treatment. Um, so I guess I'll end it here, but because that's basically what I've also done so far. Thank you. I'm bringing the mic to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thankfully, my colleagues have said it so. So I'll just add a bit. So um, we are aware that the, the strength of a chain is determined by its weakest links. And in aquaculture production, the two weakest links are feed and disease. If you're able to um, have control over these parameters, we would be able to uh, meet the protein requirements of the country because as we are aware there's so much that is sent outside for protein and then the businessmen can also make profits. Now at the disease point of it, this is why we are here. This is why the government of Ghana pays us every month and um, we are just encouraging you with the nature of fish diseases, time is of essence. Sometimes I know that we want to perform magic we think fishes are like human beings that have some, or you can pass by the pharmacy and do something quick and your diarrhea or something will resolve. But with fishes, especially the kind that we call chai in Ghana, we don't have that kind of luxury. So please, um, like we've said, we are available, myself, my colleagues, depending on your area of where you operate, please reach out to us as soon as you have a challenge. For instance, yesterday a farmer, no, let me give this example. Some months ago, there was a farmer who contacted me. He had started experiencing mortalities. The total population was about 1,000. He lost four, he lost six. On the second day when he lost six, he called me. We quickly um, did run some tests and were able to save his um, population. There was a friend that he got the, the fingerlings with from the same source on the same day, but he delayed a bit, and the outcome was very different. He lost everything. So let's just see what prompt action does, and let's be um, encouraged by that. Finally, I also like to add that for fishes, you can't really just look at them with your eyes and diagnose that this is the challenge. In medicine, there are certain signs that are known as pathognomonic. It means that it's characteristic of a particular disease. Unfortunately, with aquatic animal medicine, we don't have so many of those kinds. Many of the diseases look very similar, and that is why we are talking about diagnostics, diagnostics, diagnostics. And it also takes some time to be run in the lab. So please, the earlier you get to us, the earlier we run the diagnosis, the better for all of us, and we love to serve you. Thank you very much. Um, um, most of this work that the, the newly recruited veterinarians are doing uh, could not have happened with the active participation of the University of Ghana. So, so you see that we are establishing a linkage from a knowledge center to the regulator, and then to farmers. So uh, Angela has been very key in uh, doing some of the earlier diagnostics and still doing, precisely because 
there had been somebody who has to be holding the fort, where they come up. So, Angela, you can talk a little bit about what we've done in relation to the uh, baseline and then what we found. All right, thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Um, I'm from the West African Center for Cell Biology and Infectious Pathogens. Um, I initially came in to work on, I'm a microbiologist, I initially came in to work on um, ISKNV. But then, um, as um, um, the, you just heard, I'm just here supporting the veterinar veterinarians to build capacity, okay, for fish diagnostics. So, um, I, I don't know much about business, so I'm always thinking about the science aspect, but um, we are very grateful for all the collaborations that are coming in because Ghana here, we are under-resourced, and it will be very nice to have all these um, help, all this help coming in into um, the country. Having said that, um, we also have to be careful not to um, overstep certain boundaries um, as we are working. So with my role as a microbiologist, um, I just give advice based on what we find in the lab so that we don't just treat blindly and then introduce things that are not supposed to be in the system. Okay, so um, if you heard me speaking today, my submission was out of my fears of um, the strep type three coming into the system, which happens to be more virulent, coming into the system um, through the introduction of the trivalent vaccine. So that's just um, what I can say about that. So I'm also here, um, but before you come to me, you have to go through uh, veterinarians. They will do the preliminary diagnosis and then hand over to the lab and then we will screen and then um, give the information. So sometimes it takes a while, but we are here to support. Thank you. Um, I, know, I know time is fast spent, um, so to run up, um, the essence of maybe our role, again, uh, is threefold. One, to support the, the regulatory framework, and among them, to encourage and then guide so that they can enforce their own regulations and rules. And then secondly, to streamline licensing of aquaculture facilities, to introduce a one-stop shop system where this will be streamlined so that the farmer will have to go through one point and get everything done without having to go to different, different centers. That also makes a lot of financial demand on them. So that is the regulatory aspect. Uh, the second component is uh, the fish health aspect, uh, which we've just talked about extensively now. Uh, the third is data collection and monitoring. Uh, data collection is so essential that we have uh, started developing guidelines as to what type of data we need how they should be collected, how they should be stored and digitized for quick retrieval to support decision making. So that decisions taken by the commission is not arbitrary, it's actually based on science, on, on facts. Yesterday, those of you who listened to, to me, I talked about doing a, a GAB analysis in the area of research uh, education, and as well as biosecurity. And this was data that was generated from uh, academia, from policy makers, from farmers. So uh, it is data that is coming from you. We analyze that uh, to be able to give you what it is telling us and what we must do to mitigate any dangers. So uh, in a nutshell, if you give your support and help, because the farmers, you are with your animals every day. You know them, you know what is happening to them. So if you can relate with the veterinarians, they will be able to also guide you to prevent major losses. 
So like major outbreaks happens when you actually forget all everything that has to do with biosecurity. So if you put your biosecurity measures in place and the commission is able to visit farms and enforce those things, in the long run, it will be beneficial to the farmers. So with that, I think I will say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we have just about eight minutes. And so uh, I'm afraid we may not be able to you know, take, but we'll open the floor for questions. If you have any questions, any comments on the presentations by our vets and uh, Koficho, just uh, let me see your hand up and Good morning. I'm moving up here. Uh, I, I, thank you for your submission, and it's very clear and loud. I want to ask, you've been pronouncing or mid-mention of we reaching out as farmers if we get to know that uh, you are, uh, the fishes are not well or something. But you never mention any platform or maybe contact numbers that we can use to reach out if there's an emergency, because if I'm not feeling well and there's an emergency, I can call a 193 for an ambulance, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, never made mention of, or maybe any platform, maybe we can get your contacts in case of an emergency. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to thank you so much, especially Doc and the team. Your submissions really show that uh, you, you are very limited in terms of manpower and resources, but you are doing your best under the circumstances. I'm a peasant farmer. I have a small backyard catfish farm. And throughout my operation, I have not come across a veterinarian who reaches out to say, I am here for you. I think it's my first time, and so I'm happy to, to meet you. What, what I want to ask is that, your team uh, seem to be a long way from the ideal situation where we have the labs and all the facilities and the number of people to do the work across the country. So if you come to my farm and my fishes are sick, you will take some samples, send it to the lab. It will take maybe a number of days before you come back. Maybe by the time you are back, I would have lost so much more fish. So this is what I do on my farm because I don't have any other option than to do what I do. So learning from other people, I use herbs to treat my fish. And the result is really very fast. So if I go to the farm in the morning and I realize that I have lost two fishes, I get them out of the pond quickly, I change my water, and then I give them herbs and it stops the mortality. So if I'm going to reach out to you and I would, I would take a few more days, I can be sure I'll lose a few more fishes. So in your, in your line of work, are there any quick remedies so that because of the constraints, you would be able to get a hold on the mortalities whilst you do your deeper investigations? For instance, when I say remedies, the kind of remedies I use in terms of the natural herbs. And beyond that, how are you looking at taking these traditional sources of treatment to the next level and making it available to farmers instead of the, the very orthodox methodologies which some of us have been told uh, end up being harmful to consumers sometimes? Okay, thank you very much. I would like to take a bite at this. Um, yes, yeah, so actually there's the practice of um, the use of herbs for disease treatment, which is ethno-vets, ethno-veterinary practice, and we practice that. Um, that aside, um, when you 
Okay, so the role of the vet is not only to tell you exactly what it is and treat, okay? We also help you prevent the diseases. So biosecurity is one of the main things we do, right? Then sometimes the issue is not even bacteria, okay? So we help to let you know exactly what you are dealing with. Because if they are dying, like my colleague said, the signs are very similar. You don't see any difference. A parasitic infection or infestation would show very similar signs sometimes with the bacterial infection. So it is per our um, training, we're able to then tell you, oh, this is not even a disease. It's probably your water quality issue or it's probably your feed. Okay, so there was this, let me, let, me just, let me just put this in perspective. There was this case I had where a, a, a tilapia farm were recording so many mortalities and their concern was just growing because it kept on happening, okay? We went there, did the history and everything. Post-mortem reviewed that the, the stomach and the intestines were so inflamed. So I asked, let me see the feed. We went to see the feed and it was moldy and with maggots and all of that. And the farm hands were just feeding that. So assuming you just have treatment, you use a better option, perhaps some people use antibiotics, okay? So assuming you just do that without consulting, you would then eventually be causing more problem than trying to solve the problems. Then the last bit of it is that, um, so this is a coordinated effort. It's public health, okay? So whatever you're doing must have some sort of uh, uh, implications on the whole national framework. So if you do personal training or personal treatment, personal therapeutics, sometimes the issue is just dealt with on your farm, but then the effect on the population is something else. Thank you. Okay, great. So, so to reach us, um, if you contact any fisheries office, you can have access to us. We can give our phone numbers, cards, and all of it out as well. Maybe we can take turns mentioning when we are done with it so that we don't take time. Okay, we are very approachable. You see us, and then we can just exchange contacts. Uh, yes. I want to address maybe an aspect of your question. Um, one of the best um, uh, health management practices you can do is what you're already doing by. It's working, right? Uh, by picking up dead fish every day, every morning from your farm, and, and then, but where they are dying, you don't know. So that is where the laboratory comes in, to find the root cause why the fish are dying. You see, otherwise, you can treat, but you don't know why you are treating, even though it might give you some uh, short-term gain. Uh, if you do not remove the underlying cause, it will persist. And what you resist will always persist. So, so you do that. Uh, I think uh, the Fish Health Unit will actually provide uh, numbers. Um, they don't have an ambulatory number system where you can dial 911. But I think it will eventually come. So you can do, you can do that. And then, um, these are some of the herbs I uh, uh, understand the lectures in the other session are talking about. Actually, it's unfortunate that they had to separate us because we will have actually gotten a more uh, synergistic uh, interaction. So I think this plant, actually, I have it in my house. I don't know its use. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think this one also goes very well in goat lice soup. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you, if you, I, I will, uh, I will assign to find out, uh, and then we can maybe look into it more. Yeah. Please, please. Thank you very much. It's a pity I have to be running between rooms to know what is going on. And when I went to the other room, I was impressed because a young boy was given his presentation on these three different types of herbs 
that he has tested and found out that they are better than, uh, because he did some tests on Lake Volta and found out that people were using broad spectrum antibiotics, tetracycline, amoxicillin, and um, um, this was causing a lot of uh, problems because they have diseases, uh, streptococcus and S ISKNV diseases and so on. So they were trying to, but he now did this experiment using this different, I, could, I couldn't quickly copy the, the names. And the importance of this is that they help against bioaccumulation of residue of those um, antibiotics and then keep the environment cleaner for other living organisms that are there. And when I came in and the farmer was speaking of the same thing, I now sort of knew, uh, felt that we could have been a, 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 a group together because somebody from the Fisheries Commission over there says that there is a fish management plan that has been developed by the commission in, in collaboration with farmers. Is that, is that true? But that is still in the stage of being um, uh, public, publicized or approved. Uh, approval. Yes. So when these two groups are in different rooms, I'm lucky to be going between the two. <laughs> it, it's not good enough. If we were together in the same room, we would have achieved much more and we would have been able to gain more from each other. But one thing I would say for farmers is that from the traditional experience and from practicing and being researchers, though they are not the certified researchers and academicians, they know things to be done. Even for water quality in Nigeria, some people use a bitter leaf that we eat to cure their water they, and, and also to treat diseases. I think they are more um, enlightened about using antibiotics because when the uh, end product is tested, even in our laboratories, we can discover that you have used antibiotics because of the withdrawal period and then the harvesting period. You see have residue in the, in the flesh of the fish even after you have smoked it. So people are now being careful about using that. It's one of the things that affected our export into the European market. So, uh, and so they prefer to use the natural methods that are even safe for human beings and for human consumption. I'm just saying that the collaboration that we are talking about, it's now the time. It cannot be only the farmers alone left. It's, it starts, it's go, it should go, uh, through the entire value chain, from the feed suppliers, even from input suppliers to feed companies, to the feed suppliers, to the academicians, the scientists, the producers, the processors. Because if the fish is not, if, if the fish has issues, by the time the processor is doing it, you can be scattering, you can have it being scattered, and you don't have what you actually want. So it's, it's important. This is a very good forum to know that we need each other. Not one person can be an island and survive in this industry. It is a collaborative thing, and we must not wait for the other person to come to us. We should start looking for those who matter in our businesses, in our career, in our profession, and try to learn from them and you will find that, that you are more enlightened and you are more educated and you are better in the position to advise both the scientists, the, uh, the researchers, and the farmers. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Uh, that was very elaborative, but you forgot one thing. Um, I think Ghana and Nigeria, that collaboration we're talking about they could work even much more actively together and uh, integrate their systems. And that is what part of our project is about, networking, to learn and share knowledge with each other. Uh, I think there is somebody trying to ask a question. Um, hey. uh, yes, I think Doc, we are starting Doc, another please. session right at 12. Okay. It is five or six minutes past 12 now. Please, so, just one minute at top up. Um, 
But I acknowledge your concerns and your grievances. But I just want to add this. Let us not be too quick whenever we see mortalities. That panic response from us could even aggravate the situation. Sometimes, most of the time, it could be a management problem that we could come in and sort it out without you necessarily administering drug or anything. That is one. Two, also whatever that we read on the internet, we should also be very cautious or careful because anybody at all can just post anything there. So when you reach out to us and we come to the site, we will definitely give you the best advice that we can. And we have first, I will put it in quote, first aid measures that we let you put in place while we go to the lab or we arrive at a diagnosis. So it's a holistic uh, package and then we'll assist you in that regard. Thank you. All right, so we're just going to take Yeah, thank you, Doc. And thank you for the presentation, the introduction of our vets, uh, and um, the work being done. I think for an industry, these are some of the things that we are looking forward to, to really go to get to a sustainable way and make sure that we can pass on this entrepreneur activity to our children or generations to come. Because if we don't see the entrepreneurial aspect of it in it, then whatever we're doing today is not really useful. I think um, as uh, the rep from uh, Eastern region was talking, I think it's quite emphatic for me that uh, his source of operation would, or office would really link with the Fisheries Commission in, um, in Eastern region. For Akosombo, I want to know that is it still also re uh, connected to the, the fisheries section in Akosombo? As for uh, Dr. Iraba, I mean, at any given time, she is totally at the service, and I really appreciate that. For Mary, it's also just a day to day discussion among us. But I think talking about all this, is really reinforcing the collaboration. Because it is a fact that the industry would always be ahead mm. of the policy makers and what have you. Because we are actually doing a lot of researching and whatever it is. But at the end of the day, the policy maker is the one chasing or following up to gather things to get things going. So uh, the it is good to hear about all these donation of these offices and what I'm doing or I've noted is really to link it to my sales team as a feed producer to connect this to make sure that their contacts are actually linked to my sales people to make sure that these are things that we can do to collaborate more because in the past um, Adrian and then Sandy have really been of good help to some farms that was really facing issue. Mm. Some places they were ready to go, other places they couldn't go, but they were able to give just interface of a, sneak, uh, a snapshot, mm. they were able to actually help in this. Some farmers could not have the possibility to run a lab test, the cost. I know they took that up, ran those tests, and then share just the results. So it's good to know for sure that this particular uh, lab of facilities and things are happening along the way. So this information is very, very credible. Lastly, I am using this forum to challenge the Fisheries Commission. And I think uh, Mary will push this thing on my behalf. That we want to establish a very strong collaboration between the chamber and also the commission. Because the chamber is clearly the mouthpiece, or it's really promoting whatever is happening on the ground. But the chamber is actually not, uh, at this moment, not really being cited or much. Or like a point that if the uh, Fisheries Commission needs something, the first source of it is to check from the chamber's help, help desk that is this available or is this going on to this? This particular things we need to really uh, form it up after this particular conference. 
as a way forward that future will be a way forward to us. And the VET help decks, we are aware that there is really no uh, immediate uh, emergency number to press, but it will also be good that even a portal or um, an email session that anybody can log in, drop in information quickly, and then there can be a help desk giving a quick response. That will be a very good way, looking at the digitized way that business is going today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Can we? All right. I'm yeah, told that's, that's another session is starting. It's supposed to be here. We are delaying them. So you quickly. Yeah. Uh, no, I think the gentleman. Yeah, the two of them. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, listening to the presentation yesterday and today, it can show that the veterinary officers are, cannot match the numbers of the, the fish farmers. So I have decided that I'm going to employ uh, what you call veterinary officers for my fish farming. So um, I know if the private sector can do that by employing a veterinary officer for, yeah. and also how much does it cost to set up a laboratory service as far as the fish uh, have its concern? Thank you very much. We will take the second. Okay. Then I didn't catch the last part of the question though. Can you make it brief? Thank you. I'm a farmer. Uh, this is my first time of hearing the have vet officers. And uh, with the officer. New. They are new. Okay. Yeah. With the officer around Akusumbu, uh, I would like to help him out because from North Tong going to South Tong, I have a lot of friends who are into fish farming. We depend on each other with the aquatic methods of treating our fishes. You go to your friend, okay, use this. You go to someone, use this. And it's really killing us. The business is capital intensive. And mortality is occurring to you. It's a very big blow. So I think uh, if the officer can be available, I can put my colleagues together. If it's a two or three day training, he can get to us. From there, we can have his contacts. We can be calling on him time to time to save our business because uh, it's really killing us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, there's not much I can add to this. It's a, a well said uh, comment. Uh, I didn't catch your question very well, but then you wanted to employ a vet. Yes. If you get a vet uh, that understands fish health management, please go ahead. Um, yes, you can easily do that. And in the course of setting up uh, a lab. Up, uh, yeah, you can set up a lab, but then uh, lab certified, uh, set up privately has to be certified to ensure that they are actually able to follow management routines quality assurance systems, and then that they are Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Kujo. Thank you very much. I think that further discussions can go on. The vets are around. Um, the head of the health, fish health unit is also here. You could just contact them, and they'll give you further explanations to things that you need. On that note, we want to thank um, Adrian, Sandy, and all the vets, and Dr. Kujo for their presentations. Thank you very much. Now we are sitting here to continue with the WAS um, interaction with WAS. And so um, you don't need to go. OK, that is the World Aquaculture Society. All right, we are having a meeting here now, all right? And as stakeholders, we are all invited to be part of the World Aquaculture Society. World Aquaculture Society. Thank you very much.
there's somebody presented that I was asking for. No, not about the health. Fish health. So she now Regional director. Hello. Regional director, World Aquaculture Society. It's his region and is the one who is addressing us. Are you going for the other one? If you all must move together. Okay. So, so see you later. What tea? Does it mean that all you veterinarians do not want to join the World Aquaculture Society, which is against what we just said that we need each other and we need to belong to? Because you cannot, when, when it comes to it, we will make sure that you cannot function in fisheries if you don't belong to our association. Ah, no, we won't agree. <laughs> please, can people come in? Can people come in, please? The students too are still doing, uh, uh, they are still doing um, presentations. Yes, please, can you help us ask them to come in? It's open, it's not only for members. We want people who are not yet members to come in so that they can become members. Where are you going to, sir? Uh, to come, thank you, sir. Because I'm the monitor now, the janitor that opens the door and closes the door. Okay, let me give you the phone. Change it to radiator. No, what's the end of the Wi-Fi? We are our members. We are more than this. Do you have Wi-Fi? I think maybe probably we can just start and then waiting for the orders. Um, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let me start by welcoming you to this interaction section of um, World Aquaculture Society. I want the operator to display the. It's not functional? It's not functional. Okay. Um, this is a section of World Agricultural Society African chapter, then West African region. So we have three, I have three things to explain there. The first one is the World Agricultural Society. Then also the African chapter. Then we have West African region. Now, World Agricultural Society is a global apex 
um, NGO, which we have uh, our headquarters in uh, Sorrento, in the US, United States of America. It was established in 1960, 1969, 1969. But before that, um, permit me to introduce, that is a search, to introduce my president-elect of the African chapter of the World Agriculture in person of Dickiness Foluke Ariola. That is my president-elect of the African chapter. Um, she's going to have a brief with us also during the course of this interesting session. Now, the essence of our meeting this afternoon is to rub minds together and also to know what the World Agricultural Society stands for. That's the essence. And also to know ourselves, to build the networks together, and then share the common focus of the region that we belong to. Now, on that World Agricultural Society, we have different chapters. Latin American is there, Asian is there, and also we have African chapter. African chapter was established in 19, uh, 2019. It's just um, barely three years to this time. And the first African chapter president was Dr. Sharif Sadek. It was just a year tenor. A year. And then the way we structure the executive is you, we have the president, uh, the, the president, then we have the president elect. After the tenure of the president, then the president elect become, it becomes the president. So in the executive structure, we also have um, the treasurer, the, the secretary. Those are the ESCO. Now, there are five regions under the chapter, African chapter, five regions. We have the north, the south, the west, and the east. Under African chapter. So we all fall under African chapter of the World Agriculture Society. Now, this where we belong, uh, we find ourselves, is where West African, West African region. And under West African region, we have 15 countries. Okay, we have 15 countries. So, Ghana is among the West African region. So, by virtue of the, the position, I was privileged to be the the pioneer regional director, and I was elected to saddle the affairs of the region. On this note, I want to show my appreciations to you. my people, particularly in Ghana here. And let me also say this: that when we talk, when we are talking about the West African region, under African chapter, Ghana has done a lot to support West African region. And I think we, we, we Ghanaians, we deserve a round of applause on that. Our mandate is to promote the affairs of the aquaculture, value chains, knowledge transfer, information um, technology, dissemination information, and to support 
the policy development across the continent. And that is what we are doing. Now, under the region, West African region, we have done a lot. Together with the Ghana, our people here, and uh, I want to recognize the effort of the Chamber of Agriculture, I mean, Chamber of Agriculture in Ghana, uh, which is led by Mr. Jacob Adiza, and also some members here, Mr. John Domozoro, where are you? Can you just signify? Thank you so much for all your efforts. In this region, I want to say that uh, the people like Mr. John has really given us a lot of, a lot of support. We have uh, Danso, am I right? Also, and quite numbers, my professor is there also. Um, quite numbers of people are also there that they give us the support. My prof also there, we have run, prof, can you just signify to the members? A round of applause for them. Together we have run free webinars, particularly during the COVID-19. And one of, the, one of the advantages of that period is that we took the advantages of the period to you know, promote aquaculture, particularly in our region. And that's why we have done a lot. Now, I want to talk about the membership of World Aquaculture Society. Um, I think I'm going to do justice by just... Operator, is it functional? It's not. Okay. Please, can you give him, let him type this? Because by the time we bring it on the, on the screen, it will be more clearer so that we can all see and then I will just try to um, explain. We have different categories of membership of World Agriculture Society, different categories. There are individuals, there are corporate, life uh, patron is there. But the one that is more particular to you is individual registrations individual registration. I want him to display the, the, the web, I mean the website. You can just go to the Google and just click and you have different options there. If he could be able to display it then I will ask him to click it so that I can explain gradually. So, when you click the, uh, the website, you have all the details how to become the members of the World Aquaculture. So what you need to do is first of all to register with our headquarters that is based in United States. Then secondly, the interface will give you different options of affiliations. So, what you need to do is just to click the, um, make a choice on African chapter. Once you have done that and you fill in all your details and you send, then the chapter will capture, I mean, the headquarters will capture all your details and forward your details to the, the chapter. So, automatically, you become the members of World Aquaculture Society, then as a chapter, you become Africa chapter member. Am I making the point here? Am I making the point here? So, subscription fee, we have drastically reduced, it's $65 before, $65. How much, how much is that in, in Ghana? When we transfer to CDs, how much? $65. How much? $700. Okay. So, but now it is 
45, $45. Ready to be cheap. Am I right? Good. So, with your $45, you can be, you become the member of the World Aquaculture Society, and by virtue of your choice, once you make a choice as African chapter, then you become the African chapter member. So, okay, good, good. So, this is the site, WASP membership. Can you make it a little bit bold? Okay, okay, good. I think it's more clearer. Now, once you enter this interface, you can see the application type. For those of us that have become the member, that have registered before, so what you need to do, you can see the new application and renew her. So if you are the first, I mean, if you are the new member that you want to become um, uh, the uh, what the culture set member. So what you need to do is just to go here and do what? And click new application. You click new application and then you begin to fill. Can you scroll it up, please? No, now, before I move on to there, there are some of us that have registered, that we have registered as a member. Your registration, your subscriptions last for one year. For instance, we are in April. If you subscribe this month, automatically by next year, April, your subscription will what? Will expire. So it means that you renew annually, you renew your subscriptions member membership annually. Am I communicating? Good. So, if you have registered as a member of WAS, so automatically WAS database will give you a membership number. You are going to get a membership number. So, that membership number is the, the, uh, is the one that makes you automatically as a member because you can use it, uh, we can use it anywhere. Once you launch it into our website and you type in your number, it brings out all your data, data information. So that is the, then when you now come in, there are different types of membership. You can see individuals, students, Sustain, sustaining um, corporate lifestyle, lifetime, and was individual membership. Uh, I think this one is an hold one. It's an hold one. The individual now is not $90. This is the hold one. The individual is not $90. It is what I've said it. Forty-five dollars. It is now forty-five dollars. Now, eh? No. We've reviewed it. It has been reviewed. I've had. I've had help a lot of uh, people to to pay to register. It's forty-five dollars. It is sixty-five dollars before. That is individual electronics. You have individual electronics member and. Print members. No, so we have uh, yeah, prescribed them. So it is $45 here, where you have the in individuals. It has been revealed. What did you say there? What did you say? Okay, uh, but we have revealed it. 
Maybe I will open my system before we go, and then I'll show you. So once you get there, you click individual, which is $45. And then you move on to the chapter options. Before the African chapter was established, there are various interests. Somebody like me, I belong to American chapter. There was time I moved from American chapter because I've gotten, I want to have experience what is going on in the Asia. And then I moved into Asian Pacific chapter. So virtually all of us that are Africans, before the establishment of African chapter, so we were you know, scattered across the various uh, chapter. But since we have our own, our own, now our, now our own. You can become an Africa, you, you cannot be an Africa and then you go and become a, a choose a American. Can you do that? So I want to urge some of us that I want to, please, you have the option. Once you click it, African chapter, then you move on to, you click payment online. You can see $5 there. What does that mean? You are paying the society $45, isn't it? Your $40 goes to the home office. That is what's in, in the state. And your $5 goes to, the, goes to the chapter. So with that, we have all your database as the worst member then African chapter. Please, can you move on? Okay, good. So these are the um, member information. So you just fill in all your details. Fill in all your details here. Your title, your title, choose your title. Once you click the dot here, then it brings out all your title. If you're a professor, if you're a doctor, if you're a minister, if you achieve, everything is there. So good. So you make a choice there. Then your middle name and your email address. Now, let me say something about this thing. Write your email address clearly, because once there's an error there, <laughs> once there's an error, because automatically auto-reply, when you submit, they will send it to you. So once an error, there might be, um, uh, you may not be able to get the um, information. So address information also, you fill in your address, yes? Yes, the um, members, membership information continues, your address, your city, your institutions. Those of us that are in academic institutions, you can feel it. If you are not in academic institutions, if you are a farmer, you also can feel it. And I think, I'm going to talk about the student or uh, I will talk about the student. Maybe I will allow my president to let. I'll just say a few things then. I'll have my president to, to talk about it. Now, let's move on. Okay. I will in the next. Take us to the next uh, interface. It's not going. Okay, that means you, you have to feel, as you feel you are sending him, it's very simple. It is very simple. When you get to the payment option, let me talk about this. As you are opening it, you are filling your information, you are filling your information, then when you completely fill in it, then it takes you to the payment option. So how do you pay? Those of us that have the PayPal, is that okay? You can use the PayPal. In Nigeria, also, you can still have options of um, MasterCard, Vibe, and the likes. So, eh? 
You don't have visa. Okay, they don't accept it here. But I think there's an option there. So where, where you pay, let me ask you, where you pay, what's the method to do? Visa card. Okay, and I think we are going to make it very easy, and that is the essence of this meeting. For those of us that want to renew, we are going to get all your details and the new member. So we will see how we can facilitate and help you to um, renew or become a new member. Is that okay? Now, so um, under the options, if you have the payment option, you have the paper. You just click the paper and fill in your details there on your card. And the good thing about it is that their system is not going to charge you at parallel rate. It's going to charge you at the official, official rate. So once you click it, then it deducts it right from your bank account. And then the auto reply will give you, okay, successfully done. Successfully done. Now let's do something. Okay, uh, the currency transaction. How much is it in Nigeria now? Mm -hmm. Around two hundred thousand uh, per per week. Okay. We are talking about the uh, you know hard currency. So pay the for this card. So pay for payback. Uh, you can you can pay back for twenty dollars. Twenty dollars, except the paper. It's taking people's money. Yes. You mean the charges? Uh, well, I've never had the experience because I've used PayPal to subscribe, to renew my subscriptions before. So, but when I saw the options of the MasterCard, because I have a MasterCard, and uh, so I, I use, and also, okay, now, this is what we are going to do. I don't know why, okay, um, please, can you put in this email on the, on the screen, info at info at w. You can write it down. Info at w a s a c. Info at w a s a c w a r dot com. Okay. Did you get it? Info at info info at wasaka.com w a s w a s a c w a r dot com. Operator, you can. You are not together with us. Okay. Can you give me give me pen? Let me write it so that. Now, that website, no, that that email info at w a s a c w a r dot com. That is the regional um, email. That's the regional email. That's the regional email. Let me, let me repeat it again. Info at WASACWER.com. So what you, need, what you need to do, please, for those of us that want to renew their membership, just give a title, renewal of WAS 
membership. Your name, your membership number they gave you and your details. Send it in there. Then we will open um, a communication line to help you to get ready to renew your membership. Then for the new members, it is very, very important. Let me share one experience with you with other chapters. Most of the countries that fall under their chapter, they come together to build their chapter. But I want to say something to you, and I think it's a plus to African chapter. We are just three years. Yes, we are just three years. We have done tremendous. We have improved, and our pro, uh, we, are, we have done a lot of activities that were so so impressive. Together we can. I think we deserve um, a round of applause for that. My president elect can be a main witness because she attended the um, the worst annual conference where Sing Singapore. Singapore, and um, we were the African chapter were recognized because of our activities. So we don't need to rest on our hosts. We need to get ourselves together, build our forces together, leverage our forces, and begins to promote aquaculture development in um, Africa, not only in West Africa. And when we are talking about West African aquaculture, the two countries are in front front. That's Nigeria and uh, Nigeria and Ghana. Please, once again, um, get the, the regional uh, mail, info at wasacwar.com. Just tag it, renewal of membership, new members. Then please put in your um, your WhatsApp number there because we are going to communicate with you if you need any information and we can you can be rest assured that um, within some few days we will get you registered. Is that okay? Now I think the, the next thing on. I've talked about the membership. Now, the next thing on the agenda is uh, where are we coming from? What, what are the achievements so far? What are the achievements so far? I've said it once again that um, together we have built this region to an enviable height, but we don't need to rest in our holes. I don't know what happened with the, um, I want to give you the website of the region. You see all our activities, what we are, the past free webinars we have done from 2029. And I think at this junction, I must recognize the effort of people that have really come together to make it worthwhile. And one of them is the president-elect, Dickiness Fuluke Arola. Please, let me appreciate her. Give her a round of applause. When we started, she stood by us with a lot of advice. We ran the programs together. And there are quite numbers of us here, which I don't know them by names. But Prof is among them. John is among them, and a lot of us are among, you know, that we really come together and then, you know, stage a lot of webinars. And one of our greatest achievements in the region, and I want to say not only in the region, the first of its kind in the continent, is the, the first hybrid conference what we did in 2021, and it was done here in Ghana. Please, can we appreciate ourselves? So if you are talking about aquaculture in West Africa, there's no way we will not mention the position 
of Canaan. And it was the success of the first one that now led us to the second regional, regional conference. We have um, social media platform. Social media platform that we gather ourselves to share information, rub minds together, and uh, the latest information on aquaculture, not only in West Africa, Africa, and, uh, and beyond. But for now, we have you know, occupy the full capacity of the, the website. So we now move on to the telegram. So the telegram is unlimited. Um, I will appreciate if we can, can you get me a sheet of paper? Just, hello? Get me a sheet of paper, just your name and your mobile, functional mobile number. Before I leave there, I'm going to um, take it as a leave. I will add all of us to the Telegram because by now our website is already, I mean our WhatsApp is already full. So this is the um, platform where we, we meet and get latest information, latest information about the aquacultures across, across the globe. So please, let us take note of that. Just write your name and then your functional um, WhatsApp number. So I'm going to do that before I leave. Now, um, let me talk briefly about the, um, the conference, the regional, the regional conference. The second regional conference scheduled for Abekuta is coming up May 14th to 17th in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, you can see my president elect is here. I'm here also. If by virtue of um, the scheme of things we're supposed to be in Nigeria and be working out the modalities and the logistics, where well, we left the shoes of the country to come and support, because we know that um, Ghana has done a lot when it comes to agriculture development in the, in the region. So on this note, I want to encourage us, all of us. I want to encourage all of us to take time to attend. First of all, you can just register. Go to our website. The website is www.wasacwira.com. So once you get there, you can register. You can register as a member and um, as an um, exhibitor. So please let us put it in our calendar. Let us block the date to also attend the conference. It's coming up 14 to 17, just a few days to this time. And I pray that uh, the good Lord will grant us the days in the name of Jesus. You didn't say amen, Lord. Now I've, talking, I've talked about the membership drive. It is very, very important. We need to increase our membership strength, particularly here in Ghana. It is very important. Uh, please let us feel free to share it among our social media platform, how to become the, uh, the members. Once you just go there, you'll see um, the information, the details information you. Now, before I move on to the suggestions and then I'll open the floor for any um, questions or observation. Annually, we used to organize 
African aquaculture. We call it Afrak, Afrak, African aquaculture. The first of its kinds in the continent was done last year in Egypt. And uh, quite numbers of us here were there, John were there, Danso was there, um, Mr. Francis was also, was also there. So this last year, we, okay, this year we are going to Lusaka. Am I right, man? Lusaka in, in Zambia. And that is uh, November this year. So um, let's try as much as possible to block the date. Next year, I have a good news for you. And what is that good news? We are bringing Afri African aquaculture, not to Nigeria, but to where? Here yeah, in Ghana. I'll bring it in here in Ghana. This is an opportunity to show the world. Because cut across the globe, Africa, we have participants across, across the, the globe. Europe, Europe, American, Asians, they were always there. So um, we still have enough time to prepare, but we are at the, uh, you know, we are trying to finalize the process. But it's a privilege information to note that God's willing, by 2024, we are bringing AFRAC to Ghana. So we take it, AFRAC 2024, Ghana. Now, in West Africa, we have database, which is very essential that a lot of us that have done tremendously well in our, in our choosing area, in the research, in academic, as a farmers. I'm so marvelled to see some farmers. Although I've been seeing them on the, uh, on the social media, but when I, when I came here and I oh, oh, I was so impressed. So, under the database, this is where we gather information about aquaculturist in West African region. You are a farmer, you are a student, you are a researcher, you are this and that, you are a processor, so we have it. I'm going to share it with us after gathering the, um, uh, our details and so that we could go there and just go into the site and just fill it and then we have all your, all your data. Now, before the suggestion from the audience and the, uh, the way forward, because that is the last one on the agenda, um, permit me to introduce the, uh, to welcome the president-elect to give you some little brief about it, uh, the, the chapter, and uh, she may have one or two things to also or chip in. President Electra. Thank you very much, the regional director. I think you have uh, gone through the history of. Um, the World Aquaculture Society, how, how we are in different continents, and the one, the African continent, and the different regional bodies that we have. But the most important thing here is, why must I pay my money to an association? What do I stand to gain? Why must I be a member of an association if there's nothing that I can gain from it? Because the money you are going to pay is a lot of money. I value money very much, so uh, no matter the amount, it is big to me. And so I want to know what I will gain when I put my money into an association. First of all, I'm a retiree. Uh, I retired in 2016. 
but I'm still relevant because I belong to World Aquaculture Society. Most of you here are researchers, academicians, farmers, aquaculturists, students, teachers, lecturers, and you still have much more to gain from belonging to such an association than even us that are retired. Uh, and, but we still have people who are consultants and you can network. Networking goes beyond knowing this person and knowing the other person. There are times you will need something from a far away country and it is one person to another who, will, who would connect you. This morning as we were coming in the car, I was telling him that there's a project I'm doing in Liberia and I got an email from Kefas who says, oh, he's introducing me to another woman, Olivia, I've never met them. So I was telling him that it was Zizi that I saw in Cote d'Ivoire about three weeks ago. Then he now said, ah, but Zizi was in Egypt. I didn't remember that he was in Egypt. We just met in Cote d'Ivoire at the lounge, and he was saying, oh, he's going to eat somewhere. And I said, oh, I want to eat in the restaurant. He said, no, it's too expensive. Let me take you somewhere. And I got, we got talking, and I now said, oh, I have this project in the Gulf of Guinea and uh, I need contacts in Liberia. Will you handle this and that for me? And he went on. So he now reminded me that why he related with me that way was because he had seen me in Egypt. I did not remember that encounter in Egypt, but Zizi must have remembered. So from him, he has introduced me to an organization there and it is the head of that organization that is Kefas, who now is also bringing in another Olivia, who is in co-management. So you can see that without my leaving one place, but because I'm a member of the World Aquaculture Society, I have 90% achieved that project in Liberia. And that is one of the things you stand to gain. We are like a family. So when you see each other, you help each other. Then the other thing he mentioned was during COVID, when we were all home and some people could not do anything, I think that was the busiest time of my own life because that was when we were having back-to-back -back webinars. And so uh, he, he just told me, will I do this webinar? I said, yes. And that was how it started. And we ended up doing about eight webinars within that short period of time. And through just one person talking about contemporary issues on COVID, how it affected aquaculture and uh, small scale fisheries, we went into what is happening in Ghana, what is happening in Nigeria, what is happening in uh, Gam what's Gambia, Sierra, Sierra Leone. And, and then we went on to exporting uh, to the uh, U.S. silly reforms, what are the rules about silly reforms, what, what, what are the things we need to do to access that ma market. Then we went further to having our youth on the program and we also have our farmers. And there's this woman leader farmer from uh, Ghana who came in, Jennifer, who came in a number of times. And so, you could see that we increased our wealth of knowledge. Where some people were having mental issues because of loneliness, nobody to talk to, and the constriction, we were so busy that it was like if we were walking, going to, to, to the office. And also, um, we go into partnership with um, uh, companies, um, we are into partnership with Ghana Aquaculture Chamber. Uh, we are into partnership with a number of different companies. And I have his word for the conference coming on in uh, 2024 because it's a competition. You know, we have different regions and some regions are waiting that if Ghana is not going to take it up because we have already mentioned Ghana, we cannot now say, oh, Ghana cannot do it. We are coming to it. We go to another region. And to avoid that is one of the things I'm here, that I will stay after today 
and try and see people in the ministry, people here and there. And we are already having some of your very big uh, companies committing to the fact that we should come to Ghana. He is one of them. Can you stand up? That has given us the confidence that they will support us. And we are also grateful for your support for this conference because I was told that is a backbone for this conference. And we are in partnership with Ghana Aquaculture, uh, uh, Chamber of Aquaculture. WAS is in partnership, I mean World Aquaculture Society is in partnership with um, uh, Ghana Chamber of uh, Aquaculture. So we try to do all those things. And now there's a good thing that we are bringing because we noticed in Africa and all over the world that students are even struggling to pay school fees. This thing is a meeting, heat, into my nose, and it's not safe. No, not the light, the heat. Now, all over the world, even in the US, though they pay their school fees easily, it's a loan that they will pay back when they start to work. I wish that we work here so that it's easier for our students. Now, we decided at the last uh, board meeting for the entire uh, World Aquaculture Society that membership for students will now be free so that we can allow students <laughs> to come in quite early enough learn the road from the older people before they now start paying when they become workers. And I hope they will be honest about it and not remain students forever. I am a student, as I stand here, I'm a student in Lagos State University. I'm doing a PhD studies there. I did my master's last in 1980, and, but I'm back in school now. But the thing is, when I fill my form, I don't put student because I don't want it free. I can pay. I don't put student, but I fall into two categories, retiree or student. So I go for the retiree category. Do you understand? So when you start to work, let us know that you are now working. The only thing is that you don't have voting rights. Because if we give you voting rights and it's free, when I want to become anything, I will get all the students all over West Africa to become members in two days, and they will vote me in against the other region. And so, so you don't have voting rights. You, you, only, you are only members. And there's only one voting right that we are trying to work out per student or per region body so that you have like somebody representing you who will have a voting right. So from now on, so it's good to tell everybody, and we want to develop the students further, train them, capacity building in different aspects of aquaculture, so that by the time you are out of school, you don't even have to start looking for a collar job. If you go into aquaculture, I tell people, that fish in the pond is much more than money in the bank. Because the interest rate that government will give you on any amount of money or any bank will give you on in six months, you will get more than triple or four times of it if you use that money to grow fish. By the time you are harvesting your fish, you have much more. What is the interest rate now? I don't think any banks gives more than how many percent? Five percent, two percent. And by the time they work that five, two percent, there are so many commas that will have also reduced the money for you, turnover and charges and so on. Those in business know better. And it's the same money that they are giving to you that they will loan to them and be asking for 30 uh, percent interest. So it doesn't pay. So, um, once you are taught how to grow fish, how to do it well, then you can start small. The mistake most people make is that you want to start big. So when the mistake comes, you fall big. But when you start small and there is a mistake, 
then you can come up again. There's an adage in my local language that you cannot be in fish business and go down and never come up again. One day, Jaka Tosh. Once there's a problem and you are in a fish business, you will come up again, except you decide that you are not doing it again. But if you continued in, that, in the fish business, anything related to fish business, you will come up uh, again. The other things are training, capacity buildings, webinar, general uh, networking, joint research programs, partnership with associations and companies. I'm being told that time is up, so I have to run. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, my president-elect. She had um, said it all. Uh, because of our time frame, uh, we want to round up. I want to say thank you very much for your quality time. And um, just let me uh, uh, welcome just two questions, observations, just two. If there's any observation, if there's any questions or anything, just two. OK. Just two. Please be quick. They were waiting for it. Please, um, I want to know with regards to getting students um, aware of the society, what plans are underway? Because if a lot of students are aware that there's a society that is willing to help them build their capacity before they even graduate, I doubt any of them will shake their heads in joining. Okay. So I want to know what you have in place. Thank you. The last one, so that we can wrap uh, thank you. I want to know what happens if your subscription expires and you are not able to renew it. And um, the second one is um, whether there will be efforts made so that uh, widows in Ghana also can at least use a visa card to make payments. Okay. Thank you. Um, what we did in the region is that we set up the student platform for West African fishery students. Since you are putting your name, I will, I will add you, I'll put you as a, um, one of the group uh, admin so that you could use the uh, opportunity to invite, you know, or to, to link the other students. So we have a platform for the students where we share information and uh, other uh, viable uh, uh, materials there. Now, about the subscription, it is annual. What's have the what's had the system? If your subscriptions it last by today's what? Twenty third. Twenty uh, seventh eh? of May. By tomorrow, you will not get any information, any correspondence from was. Automatically the system will excommunicate you. So by the time you renew your, or, or, your, your subscriptions, then they will, the, that, that the system will bring you back and then you'll be getting all, all their details. And then the second question is what? Okay, effort. Um, that is why we, we have tried a lot of possible means to make sure that we get people, people to uh, register, if I have used my own uh, dorm account to register with the members, we just go into the agreement. Because if I'm using my dorm to register for you, remember that you pay $45. Am I right? By the time I use my card, the bank will go back to my account and give me charges on my account. So it will be as the charges. That means if I'm doing 10 in a day, that means 0.2 dollars or things like that will be added onto my account. So it's just based on agreement. We are going to sort that, that one out. Please feel free to send the information to us on, a, on the regional um, email and then we'll get back to you. So and within some few, few days, we'll get you registered. On this note, I want to say thank you very much for your quality time. Let us encourage ourselves to register and together, I want to assure you, we are going to build a, African aquaculture. Thank you and God bless you. Please write your names on that, those paper, uh, the yeah, paper that you
before you go, so that we know that you are here. Where is the paper, please? Yeah. You are uh, reading your name. Or quickly get another Hello, there's going to be an SME clinic just here. Um, it's, it's supposed to take place now, so you can join us as we explore some opportunities in the aquaculture space for youth and young people. All right, all right. We are creating another piece of Hello? Hello, good afternoon once again and welcome to our SME clinic for the youth and those that have potential interest in exploring some opportunities in the aquaculture space whether from direct production, from services. We will be looking at it in just a moment of time while we wait for our panelists for the discussion. So we have um, Mr. John Domozoro. Please, can you join us? And we have um, Gabriel Latte. Gabriel Latte, can you join us, please? And Mr. John Domozoro. I think one of the critical components of our steady skills training is for us to find a decent work when we are out of school. That is most uh, of us are concerned as young people that enters into any form of training institution or even the universities. And it is of a great concern, especially in this era where unemployment is very on the high. And aquaculture being, please, Mr. Do John Domozoro, you can join us. Please, can we give him a round of applause as he joins us? So it's, it's very important for us to look at some key opportunities and also some people that have been in the space for some time now, young people to share their experiences and also what we can also do as young people to tap into the emerging opportunities in the aquaculture space. So I'll start by introduction. My name is Frank Ousu, CEO and co-founder of Aquamed Technologies. So we are providing some technologies for fish farmers to optimize their fish production. So we have a smart probe that the fish farmers can use, monitor their water quality anywhere that they are. And we also have an aqua store platform where we provide um, the fish farmers with an e-commerce to sell their fishes to a larger audience or to have um, uh, the market opportunity 
or contact key aggregators and also of tickets on the platform. So that is me. So um, we will start by introduction. I have with me. Please. My name is John Domozoro. I'm first of all a fish farmer. I work for Pillbrook Aquatics, PBA. And I work for ACA, which also as an aquaculture advisor. Thank you, Mr. John. Please, can we give him a round of applause? All right, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Latte. Um, I run Latman Farms. Uh, Latman Farms, we are basically just uh, into uh, backyard setups and then also trying to transition from running a small farm into a big farm. So what the things you need to learn, understand, and know right from the start so that you transition that into a big farm. And um, as part of what the, most of the things that we do, we do farm setups, we, do, um, we get fingerlings for farmers, we get training, consultancy, and anything in relation to you being able to run your farm. Thank you so much. I think this should be so practical as possible for us to get and grasp most of the things that we'll be talking about because it's of great concern to all of us. So, um, Gabriel, I, I think I'll start with you. What motivated your um, interest into venturing into the aquaculture space? Do you have a background in aquaculture? And right after school, when you were in your final year, you did your service, or when you were even doing your service, did you have any you know, um, interest or potential of thinking about aquaculture or venturing into it as a business? OK, so um, I think for me, I never considered aquaculture in any way. I, I didn't even consider agriculture. Um, reason being is um, I, I, I like a lot of marketing, so I focus on marketing related stuff. But then in university, I actually studied uh, theater arts department and study of religions. So wow. by this time, maybe I should have a church and <laughs> I should have a go paying offering. But no, in this particular situation, um, in, I started my farm in 2020, I should say. And you know, 2020, there was the COVID, there were a lot of act, uh, things happening around that particular time. And then also, um, I lost my father. So when I lost my father, uh, I was in my house. Uh, normally when you lose a loved one, people come and visit you and they try to console you and all of that. So we had built a certain pond in our house, in our backyard. And it was just, I did it together with uh, one of my dad's workers who happened to be amazing. So no experience, nothing whatsoever. We just got up and then we dug some ground and did some cement and then we splashed some towels. We spent quite an amount of money on that. But then we placed some fish in them and it didn't work. And so that had been in the house for a longer period of time, even before I lost my dad. Then in 2020, after I buried my dad, I was going through a series of depression. It was so chronic to the extent that I needed to see clinical psychologist and then at a point in time, I was contemplating a bit of suicide. So after a while, I realized that um, everything in the house, like my mom is worried about me because you've gone to the university, someone has offered you a job to pay you. Around that time in 2020, 2,000 Ghana cities to 2,500 made a lot of sense to my pocket. And I said, no, I wasn't interested in anything of that sort. So. The, my friends who came to visit me saw the, um, the old tank, and then they were like, oh, you have a tank here. There is something called catfish farming. I think you should, you should start it. Or, uh, and I told them, please, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not interested in any of these things. But then through a, a, a couple of my research, I realized that agriculture can help you to kind of like deal with certain things in your life. So I decided to rather start maybe small garden in my house. And so by doing that, I decided to now go to YouTube because now YouTube has become the, the, where we normally go and look for a lot of information. I think you'll come to that. You'll come to the, um, your, your YouTube journey and also. So it's very, very important to know, you know what actually motivated you into entering into the aquaculture space. Someone with you know, uh, no background in aquaculture or so ever, even in agriculture space, but I think it was born out of a necessity. You, had, you were going through some series of challenges, and then that also your friend motivated you into using the available resource, that is the tank, to 
convert it into something that can generate money for you. I think that's quite um, plausible. So we will get to Mr. Um, Domozo, and then he will also tell us a little bit about his journey, what motivated him into the aquaculture space initially, um, maybe when he was coming out of training or coming out of university, was he having a background in aquaculture, or what motivated him into venturing into aquaculture or fish farming? So I first started out, my first job was in IT, working for a bank, and I had to go to university to fulfill my father's wish. And I didn't get IT, I landed in natural resource management. I didn't know what to do, except that my father has always mentioned this, some tilapia some time ago. I got into the department, and one of the, the first time I went to a fish farm, uh, my professor liked how I worked on it. And we kind of bonded, and uh, in my final year, he really wanted to have the school farm going. And um, yeah, uh, we, we, we dug in into, in into more farms. So I could say in uh, third year, final year, I was 75% a farm guy and 25% a classroom guy. And uh, yeah, the laugh has always been there. Right after school, I landed in industry. Uh, first of all, to do a three-month um, job consulting out in industry. And, uh, but then when I was in school, we went out for an industry visit in Akosombo, and it was my first time in Akosombo. I saw Akosombo, and I was like, yes, these are the this is the place I love to be. So right from school, I came back looking for a job in Akosombo. Uh, got a job into the farm I work uh, from 2015, and yeah, maybe sometime in 2020, I I became I became a owner of the farm. Wow, that's great. So, um, if if I may if I may uh, follow up question on um, uh, your your journey so far, what has been some of the challenges? As a young um, entrepreneur, you faced over the years, um, and what has been some of your, uh, your 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 solutions to them, or what are some of the recommendations that you you can give to them? So I think it's the industry exposure. So coming out from school, I had very little exposure to industry. I knew how to grow tilapia in ponds, um, which not even many of my colleagues had that knowledge or experience. Coming out in industry, a lot of that did not uh, fit in very well. So you realize that even when you try to navigate that um, knowledge gap in production, as a manager, there are other aspects of the business that eludes you. So there is the management aspect, there is the human management aspect. And I tell people that it's a lot easier managing fish than managing human beings. And you've got to do that as a, as a manager or something. And of course, there is the, the marketing aspect of it. And uh, well, I guess it's, it's, it's how it is. There's no training that prepares you for all of these things, except you are out there in industry working with the people that really matter. All right, all right. I think that, that is quite um, important. Um, I want to take us a little bit, you know, in general, what are some of the opportunities that we can say, I think most of us are into direct production. You are in direct production. Um, uh, Mr. John is also in direct production. Is there any other um, uh, opportunities in the aquaculture space aside from me, uh, me, uh, doing fish or farming fish or producing feed? What are some of the other opportunities that we can, you know, basically explore as as, as a business um, uh, opportunities? All right. So um, John rightfully said. You are now consulting for some farms. And uh, these um, consultancy jobs actually came up as a result of working on different, different farms. Now, um, most, of, most of the time, people like myself, youth, we have to be willing to go through the process of learning. And the process of learning could actually be a year, it could be three years. But then the effect of understanding what you are entering into would help you. So coming to opportunities, now with Slatman Farms, we've been able to set up all across Ghana, we've been able to set up more than 200 farms. I'm talking about backyard setups and then also the tarpaulin tanks. And 
in being able to come this far, we realized the opportunity where he said, there is a point in the industry where people are just focusing on the big farms. People, don't, people didn't really think a lot about going into setting up, um, if you can do a farm in your backyard. So we decided that whatever thing I did in my farm that was working, let me replicate it. And I had to start doing some of these things for people for free in order to learn, in order to understand the industry. And so there is the bit of that. And then also there's the, so that's the consultancy. There's also the bit of um, taking advantage of a gap in terms of young people willing to uh, become managers of certain farms, I should say. Um, there are farms that we've been able to set up and then you realize that the farm owner finds it difficult to just, because most of the time they are getting their relative, their cousin, they are somebody from somewhere who doesn't really know anything about the fish farm related stuff, right? But then for a student who has probably studied aquaculture, you can go in there because some of the farm managers have actually asked me, is, can you get us somebody who has studied this to come and then be a farm manager for us? So there is that particular opportunity where you can actually go to some farms and then help them. Now, in helping them, you are looking at the daily farm management activities. There are some farms, they can't calculate the feed, they can't calculate, uh, they can't do their sorting. Some, there are some farms, they can't even do their financials. So when it comes to aquaculture, I, I feel like every single person can delve into aquaculture based on the, your background. If you have background in accounting, you can come in there and then assist some of the farms in terms of putting together their books. A lot of the small farms that are being set up, most of the time, they are, lot of, they, they are just focused on production, production, production. So another thing that you can come up with, which we try to even double down on the more, is marketing and markets. Now, most of the farmers are not willing to go into the markets, right? So what we do is we try to come in as the linkage between the farmer and then the market. So in last month, we try to educate the farmer, but then also help the farmer to be able to sell the produce at a quality price. Thank you so much. I think uh, marketing of uh, f uh, produce in aquaculture is quite of interest to every fish farmer here. You know, if you want to start fish farming, the, uh, the basic question that someone will ask you, do you have your market or how do you even assess new markets and all that. When they are done producing, you know, the challenges of selling it. I mean, the big farms may have contracts with buyers and all that, but what about smallholder farmers? So I think it's a key challenge, and then we can uh, use it as an opportunity. Where there is a challenge or a problem, that is an opportunity to explore. So marketing is quite a huge problem in fish farming in Ghana as at now. So that is a gap. And if you are able to propose like key solutions to them, I think it will be great. So thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Gabriel. And um, Mr. Demozo, can you also highlight some of the opportunities aside marketing and consultancy as um, Gabriel also noted? So um, it's an entire value chain, although it's, it's not fully developed. And that is where the opportunity is. If you look at the Nigerian poultry industry, it's like 10 times the aquaculture industry. And Nigeria's aquaculture is about 400,000 um, tons. Okay. And we are doing just about, what, 80,000. So it just tells you that the, how much growth potential there is. So as you mentioned, in, in, in marketing, in, in distribution, in in, in, in cold storage, in transport, that um, those opportunities exist. Look, even to the farmer, there are gaps that he doesn't know exist. Ten years ago, um, somebody said, look, if you produce fish in Ghana, tilapia in Ghana, the, before you are even done, um, your, uh, your cycle is, is due, the market women are at your gate wanting to come inside and just take all your fish. Today you have fish, and these people are playing games with you. Today, tomorrow, tomorrow next, this, that, your price is too high, your fish is too small. There is somebody who can look into that fish. And one thing I, I always say is, um, so coming from up north, we ate a lot of fish powder. Uh, the only thing we didn't have it was in cocoa. And <laughs> 
I ask myself, can we not make fish powder out of tilapia? If we have that sizes that they call reject, and then they, they, they buy it at cutthroat prices, can we not um, process that into fish powder and that becomes a brand that sells across? I've seen somebody do such a thing in East Africa. And in this era of after, look, it's a huge competition from the East Africans. Okay, and if we do not diversify, and that is, we, we, we have to stay fluid like water. Fill all those gaps, every opportunity. As he mentioned, the financial sector, you could learn how to assess risks of, of an agriculture business. And you could work for a bank, either full-time employment or consultancy. They tell you, look, we have a proposal for XYZ farms. We want you to help, you take, help us take a look at it. And that could be your gig. Okay, you could, you could do, do that, those connections. Even events. This is our very first aquaculture conference. And would you think that if the people who led this conference were not aquaculture players, they would have um, planned it so beautifully uh, to suit our interests as uh, farmers? They would have done a very generic conference for us that probably doesn't meet our need. So all aspects we can, we, can, we can fit in. And as the industry matures, the farmer would not want to leave his farm to go sell his fish somewhere or even have a nursery to himself. He's going to want somebody to just stand up and sell him, what, 20 gram fingerling, and that's all he needs. So you can go take your fry from somewhere, raise it to 20 gram, and then call Mr. A and B and tell you, hey, I've, I've got 2,000, I've got 5,000, 10 grams for you. And uh, if you take or, or 20 grams for you, and if you take fish at that point in time, uh, you are granted at least a 70% survivor. He will take it. He's in, he's in there for business, not to stress himself. Yes. So those opportunities exist. Yes, exactly. And thank you so much. And I think um, one key problem too that we can also look at for is um, uh, exploring other feed uh, sources or feed ingredients. Because I think now, basically one of the key challenges of inputs has been feed. Almost every farmer is complaining about feed. So you go to a farm now and all that they want to do is they, don't, they want to do their local feed. They don't want to buy a nampapa. They don't want to buy a ranan because the fuel is too expensive. The last time I went to the fisheries commissioner and I was telling them, the cost that it to take you to produce your own feed in the farm is quite higher than buying, possibly maybe buying ranan or uh, a nampapa. Because what I feel is that if you do it and you don't do it so well, you are going to run at a loss. Your fish will not be able to reach the maturity as the, 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 the off to at the period of, you know, that you are looking at. But if you go in for the commercial feed or some other feed ingredient that are, you know, proven on the market, I mean, you are going to get efficiency and then also you are going to get your money back. But then there is still a gap where we as young people still need to explore alternative sources of feed, which some of us are also doing it in it. I know of agri Makeup who is exploring um, uh, black soldier fly, you, uh, using it as a protein source, incorporating it into the feed. And all this is supposed to actually, you know, help us optimize production, give us the right, you know, feed for the, f for the farmers, although it still presents a key challenge. What are some of the things that we can do, or as young people we can do in terms of the feed, for us to get, you know, uh, to be also entrepreneurial in that, uh, in that aspect? Okay, so I would mention a few, um feed male players and tell you their background. So if you look at the uh, owner of Ranan, uh, Berzak, he was first of all a fish farmer. If you look at his commercial director, who is uh, Jack Magnin, um, he started as a fish farmer for ending up in a fish mill. If you come to um, Cycle Farms, um, and then the gentleman who brought cycle farms into Ghana. First of all, started as a feed dealer in Ghana. And people didn't know. So these are people that have found um, 
aquaculture gaps right from the producer level, interacted from the basic level, and have grown into being those companies that we all desire to be. Coming to the point you made about farm level production of feed, it's been a very interesting topic. You see, so, and this would be very controversial coming from a guy who represents a, a, a soy marketing a business. Poultry is a lot different from fish. And poultry, you can, you can um, make a mash, you can make your formula into a mash and feed it to your birds and they'll take it. Even with that, um, um, research have found out that if you, you should now pellet it to improve the, um, the nutrient uptake of the poultry. In tilapia, you try it that way, you get into trouble. And the business, because you, you basically have to cook your feed, we call it extrusion. Now that technical process of extrusion is a huge science. And as a farmer, if you don't take time, your, your day's job becomes 85% trying to source raw material and trying to get the right extrusion uh, process and 25 or 15 percent being a farmer. So by the time you are done with your feed processing uh, production, you are exhausted. In Ghana, for instance, where uh, raw material are not, uh, quality of raw material is not ascertained. Uh, you get one batch of, 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 of maize and it's good, the other batch of maize has aflatoxins. And when you feed that to your fish and all of it dies, who do you go chasing? So it, it's, a huge, it's a huge mix. But then the opportunity in the feed industry for, um, uh, for young entrepreneurs is that you could take an ingredient for feed manufacture and develop it and develop it. I've seen somebody doing single cell protein. And you also mentioned black soldier fly. And uh, who knows, someday you'll be able to say that, look, uh, go to cycle farms or go to Ranan or go to somebody and say, hey, I can sell you a ton of, of BSF meal for, for this. And it takes that weight of them having to produce it of, uh, themselves from them. And then you fit into a value chain somewhere. You could take another um, ingredient that people didn't think about and, 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 and develop something out of it. You could look at binder. And binders are very important in, uh, in, 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 in fish feeds. So you could look at some other ingredient that provides a better binding um, um, effect for the feed or provides binding and nutritional effect for the feed. So those are opportunities. Sure, thank you so much. So exploring other um, uh, ingredients to be incorporated into feed and all that, I think that is also you know, something that we can take it up and then look into it um, uh, basically. So um, Latman, hey, sorry, <laughs> basically that's his name, Latman Gabriel. So Gabriel, I want to ask you, um, what are some of the challenges in starting a business? All right, so, um, General business, being an entrepreneur, what are some of the challenges in starting a business? So for me, uh, being in um, aquaculture space, um, frankly speaking, fish farming can be capital intensive. But looking at what we, what we have done now, we, we do realize that if you have a plan, you can easily get somewhere. We normally tell, tell new farmers, as a new farmer, you can't have a hatchery, you can't have a feed meal, you can't have a produce, you can't do all of the processes. You understand? You have to start from somewhere and then that's somewhere where you start from. You have to look at your strength and your weaknesses. Mm. You understand? Some people, when I say strength and weaknesses, it, it comes in resources. What are the resources currently available to you? Before I started doing anything, I realized I had information gap. So the first place I went to was, I contacted the University of Ghana. I drove to the Marine and Fisheries Department. I entered, I entered the office and I asked them, this is what I'm trying to do as a young person. How can you guys help me? And they have actually been the backbone of my business. Initially, I wanted to set up a lot of uh, ponds in my house and do it because I had gotten some cash. And then, per the advice that I received, 
it was, you know what? Rather invest into the processing. So when you come to my backyard, in as much as I can produce just about two ton or three ton of fish, I have a processing facility that can do a ton of fish in a week. So even whilst I am trying to process my own fish, even if my fish is not available, I can go somewhere else and then go and get that. But then there is the financial bit of it. Okay. Now, aside the financial bits of it, the other challenge that I came across, which I was saying had to do with the information also has, is that we, we don't have the willingness to, to invest in certain businesses that we want to run for ourselves. When you say we, is it? I'm talking about young people. Okay. You want to start a business and People make a noise about business plan, business plan, business plan. Many a times, we start businesses, we don't, we don't have a business plan. You, ha you have people who are telling you, you know what, I'm, try I'm running a business, and they've not even registered their businesses. Currently, one of another reason why my business is where it is today, because I was supposed to have FBA certification for my products, right? And I was supposed to pay for that service. But then there's a government institution known as the Ghana Enterprise Agency. I reached out to them. This is what I'm trying to do. Apparently, they were running a program where you can um, register your products for free without paying anything. So yes, there is a challenge that maybe we are thinking that the, in the industry, maybe things are not working, things are not where they are yet. But then also, as I'm saying, there are a few opportunities. I reached out to them. They helped me to now put my product out there. And then now we are going to where we are now doing the, some of the things that we are doing. And the other bit too has to do with farmers are not willing to share information. When I started my fish farm, I reached out to someone to train me, and the person told me I should pay 2,000 cities before he would train me. And I'm coming from uh, the state of depression. I don't have, I, if I have that money, this is what I was going to do. I'll pick a car, go somewhere, and go and show myself. I feel that one is a better way of uh, coming over my, my depression. But then you go to the farm, they are not willing to, give, they are not willing to tell you anything. You understand? Wow. And so what we are also trying to do is, that's why we set up the YouTube. So any information we come across from the investing, from the commission, because I've been to the commission, I set up my, my processing facility to the commission. And those information that we come across, we try to make it available to everybody. The mistakes that we did in the first place, we don't think that a younger person who is coming to the business should also make the same mistake as well. Thank you so much. I think one of the key things I just take, I took from your submission was that, it's not always about funding, 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 or the financials. You as an entrepreneur also have to have that burning des desire to succeed. You have to work out the ones that you have to work on, like a business plan. Some of us operate for so long, and we don't even know the direction of our business in the next six months. And, and funny enough, funny enough, um, there are programs that are being run in the country, okay? And these programs, for example, there's a program under Ghana Enterprise Agency, um, uh, there is a, there's the SME uh, grant project currently running. That is to support smallholder businesses. What I've realized is before anybody can invest in your business, they need to see your financials. How many farmers have the financials? There is that bit of it. Some, sometimes they tell you, it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that maybe you should be making profits, but at least you should be willing to record whatever thing you are doing in your farm. Based on this, the government can say, okay, we can find a way to support you. But if you don't do anything, nobody can help you in any way. All right, thank you so much. So I think um, initially you have to identify a problem or a challenge to solve as an entrepreneur. And then you have to also have access to basic resources like people. For your, for your case, I think people were so much of you know, importance in your journey. You have to contact key people to help you, you know, train you, and also give you key information about what you should do and what not to do. I think those are some of the things that we have to, as young people who, who are you know, endeavoring into, the, into an entrepreneurship or who want to take up uh, an opportunity in the aquaculture space, you have to make use of all the resources that are available to you. And the moment you have all the structures you know, available, like you said, if you have your business registered, keep records, you know, your bookkeeping and everything is in place. There are, there are countless opportunities out there. Sometimes the opportunities are there, but we are not ready to take it up. We are not ready because although you have the business, but you don't, know, you don't have what it takes for you to get access. So it's very, very important for you to start your business with, you know, knowledge. Do all the documentation that you need to do. 
if you need any certification, contact the right people. Sometimes you don't even have to pay for anything. But because normally you feel, oh, these places are quite high for you to enter, GSA, you know, FDA and all that, you just sit in your room and you don't want to even contact anyone at all. You know, you can contact someone just by just talking to someone. You get a lot of these things for free. And business registration doesn't take so much. You can register your business, you know, so easily. So it's very, very important for you to keep up doing um, exactly what you ought to do working on your business but make sure you work more on the structures the documentation and all that that gets you funding and then you get scale up or else you might remain at a very uh, the same place for a very long time and um, so mr john um the same quest question to you do you also have some challenge what are some of the challenges that you also face in your entrepreneurial journey aspect of, of it and I, I won't touch on that but that is a challenge I face as well coming up. The other thing I would say to um, entrepreneurs is discipline. Okay, So discipline is doing what you know you should do even if you don't feel like it and you have to develop a lot of discipline especially if you are in agribusiness like sometimes you wake up and it's just a bad day for you it's not just an agriculture, like stuff happen. Exactly. And they happen quick. And uh, so Latman was depressed uh, in 2020. I was depressed in 2019. And <laughs> yes, and that was when my farm went down. Wow. Okay, so from a 300 ton production, um, I, we basically stopped doing anything, paying anything. Hmm. I went on half salary to move every finances we have into expanding to doubling our production. And um, just at the tail end of it, and I still remember it was on my dad's birthday, 7th December, the guys called me in the morning and told me all the cages were looking white. And you know what it was? <laughs> we found out in three months time that it was ISKMV. In one week, we lost 70% of our fish. Wow. And for the next six months, I was depressed. But one lesson I learned out of that event is that it wasn't the fish dying that grounded the business. It was me not having the discipline to, or me falling into depression. Because your guys show up because you show up. And I stopped showing up. And that farm struggled. I, I, I still take the blame for it. And Today is back up. It's a lesson I'll tell everybody. Keep being consistent. When you are going through those tough times, and they will definitely come until you speak to these big people who have giant businesses, you never know that they also went through that hill. Uh, and keep being consistent. Show up. Do what you know you ought to do and get it done. Call the people that you think they can help you navigate some of those things. There are certain lessons that um, you don't have to go through it to learn it. Somebody else has already paid that price for you. Just get in touch with such a person. And keep moving. Just keep moving. Um, uh, just don't mistake movement for achievement. So there is somebody, uh, the fact that you are still able to produce something, you think, hey, you have, you have picked. You haven't picked. There are people that are doing, achieving what you are achieving with much more, less effort. Reach out to those people and try to um, improve your improvement. And um, one pitfall for entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, is that um, we go by so much by the adage, uh, fake it until you make it. Okay, so it affects our lifestyle. Then you, you immediately start, you, you are a farmer of two years or three years. You want to be the farmer that Latman is, or you want to be the farmer that uh, Flusel is, or you want to be the farmer that uh, uh, Makamechi is. And, and what you don't know that at your stage, they were riding a motorbike, uh, or they were taking trotro, or they were sleeping at the feed, the feed manufacturer's place with their books and making sure that everything is on. So you have to be willing to work the, um, the lifestyle. 
truth be told, if you are in anything in production, oh, 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 maybe sales might be better, but anything in production, it's going to be tough making a good profit in your first, very first year. It's, it's like a learning year for you. Second, you might be lucky if you've learned a lot of pitfalls and avoided them. If not that, it will take you as much as five years to make a decent profit. So just know that. But it doesn't mean it's a bad business. If you traverse that, that stage, it's growth. And then um, to add up to what Latman said about um, financials, you have to take the pain to understand it. You know, nobody will give you money if you don't use your own money. But nobody will also give you money. Um, so let's say all of us here, we all can speak English. Why, are, why did we learn to speak English? Because the one who, who controls the money or the one who has the jobs, that's the language he speaks, the white man. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> so we learn the language of, of, of the paymaster. Now the investor or the banker or the accountant is your payment. He gives the finances, isn't it? Imagine that he wants to know what you can do, what your numbers are, what your cost of sale is, what your um, cash flow looks like. And you go and you are talking of, oh, the fecundity of your brew stock is at 80% and therefore you can produce two million fingerlings and it, it makes no sense to him. Speak his language to tell him that this is how much it costs you to produce a kilo or a ton of fish. And this is how much it, um, you, you get back in selling it. And these are what your overheads are. And these are the, even if you are going to get somebody to do the accounting for you, understand the numbers. So when you sit in a business, you sit in, sit in a meeting, it's easy to raise some of this funding. Uh, this, uh, to help you. And also to ensure that when you get that fund, you know exactly what that money is going to do. Funding is just leverage. You are able to produce 10 fishes for yourself. If you get funding, you can produce 15 or 20, 20 fishes for yourself. So you don't get that knowledge, but you get the fund. You say, hey, I've still achieved the same thing. You haven't achieved as long as you haven't utilized that leverage very well. OK, thank you so much. I think um, very, very important as young people, entrepreneurs, we have to develop the right attitude. The right attitude is very, very fundamental to the growth of every business. You might start it, but if you don't have the right attitude, if the storms come, you might retreat and you will never come back again. Entrepreneurship or starting a business is very, very hard or difficult. But with the right attitude, as uh, Mr. John said, um, determination, being consistent, I, I think we can all break through. Please, uh, I think it's time for question. If you have any questions for us, for the panel, you can us and then we will, they will provide us with some. Please, we have, can, can we pass a, ma a mic around? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, sir. I think it's a very interesting uh, submission by the two young big men. <laughs> <laughs> and also the moderator. It's really a big challenge. Um, if I say challenge, I'm not really seeing myself as a deeply that old uh, compared to everybody here. But it's really a great moment that we are addressing this topic, especially linking it to the youth. We know for sure that every country the future of every country actually is linked with the youth. And we know for sure, I have been on a field of meeting customers, farmers, and I asked them that how many of those farmers want their children to become farmers? And trust me, very often the room is always silent because those farmers are actually working hard to feed their children to become doctors, lawyers, whoever. But mind you, that you can really be in those decent professions. When you go and you come back, the routine in the, ha in the house, you cannot change it. You would first take off your uniform, you would 
wear your home clothes, the next place you are going is the kitchen. Who should be there to do that? So, the best profession, I always say, is a farmer. We should be proud and bold tell ourselves and call ourselves farmers. In a country like Vietnam, the best students, the best students, they find their way to our Greek school. That is a country that almost 98% of their food is produced within the country. Import is almost zero. So, as youths, it's very important that we start now. We need to look at the value chain, tap into it. Where can I fit? You cannot be a master of all. Your specialty is exactly what has to be identified. Doing it and doing it right. That is it. Remember, time actually wait for no one. So you need to do it right. Doing it, getting mistakes shouldn't stop you. It's those very mistakes that would become your story tomorrow. I'm amazed hearing everybody here, their background. I am not to tell my story, but it is really from a different angle that all of us have come from. But today, what we have really lost has strengthened us to face today and to make sure that the, those following us do not become victims of it. There's a huge opportunity in this country. How many of us are reading every day in the sector we want to develop ourselves? Do you see yourself as a fish consumer the whole year you are consuming 25%? Because this is the data. Ghanaian, we consume 25 kilos of what? Fish minimum in a year. So multiply yourself by the population in the country and ask yourself that, is this a space for me or not? Okay. That is the most important thing. So I want to add um, one thing. Um, what I'm seeing now is a paradigm shift in how we have always raised fish in, in, in Ghana. So a few years back, or say a decade back, we we're much interested in how many tons we are producing and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. These days, we are, we are struggling to do the same with mortality. Now, here's the opportunity I find in it. Must we necessarily have to produce two tons in a cage or one ton in a cage? Can we not do 200 kilos? Okay. And that 200 kilos is much easier for us to sell. You just call Akosia and tell her that I have 200 kilos of fish coming in next week. And she can sell that with a couple of ice chests. It doesn't have to be much. Just little batches. And I know, um, say Mr. Danso will not be too happy with me, but... Don't, don't buy 20,000 fingerlings. Don't buy 10,000 fingerlings. Just buy like 1,000 fingerlings and work with small numbers and grow with that. Very little production. So Egypt produces 1 million tons, a little over 1 million tons. We are producing what? Less than 100,000. And guess what systems Egypt um, produce a lot of that from? Ponds. Ponds. So it just tells you that um, although cage farming has the scale, and I'm a cage farmer, but the sustainability of industry or the growth of it really lies in pond aquaculture. And just start with very small production numbers, 100 kilos, 50 kilos, and nothing lost. Thank you. Okay, someone is that. Thank you, moderator. Labi, Labi is my name. But I don't think, uh, if I heard you right, you said you want to add uh, value to your fish that coming out with a, a fish powder, if, what I, if I heard you clear. And I want to find out from you, apart from coming out of the fish powder, have you thought of any other way of 
adding value to the fish that you produce. If not, I will suggest that you see. Fortunately for me, there are two beautiful ladies sitting by me. We are, we are part of the Ghana Chefs Association. They will help you to come out with variety of, 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 of uh, fish uh, delicacy. Down there, they are serving uh, tilapia soup. I've tasted it, and it, it tastes so nice. So if you see them, they'll help you serve, uh, come out with a, uh, people call it a uh, drink. So you can also come out with a, a fish drink, whereby you can serve different delicacies as far as the fish that you are producing is concerned. And then to my brother, you mentioned Ghana Enterprise uh, Agency. First, they were close to the Children's Park. Now they, are, they, are, they have moved there. One day they are not there. So if you can assist me to know where they are. Thank you very much. So um, with the uh, GEA, go to your municipality, the district. OK? Uh, they have what they call BACs. The BACs are business advisory centers. When you go there and you tell them this is what you want, they would help you to, re they can assist you to register your business. They can help you to put together your books and every other thing that you did. Okay. Uh, I live at Mampubi. So, and municipality, you go to the municipality and you'll be able to. I think it's uh, Accra Metro. Accra Metro. Oh, okay. Because they are sharing the same space with them. For, so when you go there, you can. Okay, thank you. Okay, there is a hand here. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. My name is Oliver. Um, when you were talking, uh, you made mention of um, uh, but not, it's not necessary that you should start a business in a large quantity. You can uh, approach it in a, so a small size. But um, you know now how the economy is becoming. Uh, it's always uh, shaking here and there, and the inflation is not a uh, 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 distant uh, standard. So um, uh, th those things always uh, collapse businesses. You know, uh, you have your daily expenses. So if you are starting things like this and you don't uh, start it in a, a bit uh, larger, um, before you, you even harvest your finish, uh, your, your, uh, your, this thing, your production, you have already exhausted the, man, the amount of money you put inside in the daily expenses. And uh, you, you end up not getting any profit, making any profit over it. That one too is a problem that is a cause. And for, uh, imagine you're starting and you don't have any, any additive uh, business that is supporting you uh, elsewhere, that is, uh, you are ending money towards that. Uh, it's going to be a problem. So uh, in a situation like this, how will you find yourself in, in terms of management? And two, um, when I was in a university, my first, uh, uh, this thing, uh, my fir first term, uh, level 100, we were asked to uh, write a um, uh, long essay. Uh, we were all of us to choose um, a, a title, we, uh, a topic that we, we, we suit our essay to write. I sat down and I realized, and I said, ah, so this one, the, um, me, I will take, because if I look around in this country, um, agriculture is lesser in, in all the institutions. So I titled my this thing, all universities are running the same courses which has led on a, 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 a large number of a ratio of unemployment in the country. So, and I started writing, I tackle farming, and I tackle uh, technical aspect, carpentry, and things, and all of them, that they have left it out. Any university is establishing, they will stand on marketing, they will stand on banking, they will stand on yeah. accounting, and all administration and things. And all these things, they have cut it out. And they used a wasting time. Yeah. Time, yes, time and time is not, not wasting a wait for any, anybody. So we, the youth need to be educated. And my problem is the Ministry of Agriculture 
Yes, uh, <laughs> my wish they can uh, yeah. uh, rise up and then come door to door, maybe municipality yes. to municipality to uh, 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 grab the youths and then it sensitize them to enter into agriculture because uh. all of them will pull back into a city like I'm here <laughs> and we'll be struggling, 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 yeah. struggling and waste our time all. Oh, by the time we realize that, no, we should have done this, then it, everything is late. Yeah. I have a very big problem with that. So um, I, I wish the Ministry of Agriculture could change their plan of doing things and then uh, uh, get, uh, take care of the youth very well. Thank you. I, I, I also wish same, but I don't know if it will happen anytime soon or even in our lifetime. But Oliver, to go to your substantive point, um, agriculture has, um, has evolved and we are still in the phase where we only make money from agriculture through uh, monopoly. So if you see anyone producing okra or tomatoes, they want to produce at the time it is uh, lean season or they want to produce at the time it is raining the most. And uh, we are all producing, we all produce and crash the price or, and then there's a couple of months that there's no tomato. We need to evolve away from that. If you bring it into um, aquaculture, like you said, small productions. Yeah, we all started with the numbers game. You want to produce light tons, light tons, because you are making what? One CD on the kilo, or you are making 50 pesos on the kilo, and the more the kilos, then the more your margin. What I'm telling you now is that you don't have to go that, because these days it's difficult to get the numbers. The losses are, are more, okay? Produce less, okay? Your, less, your losses are a lot less. Even you as a person, it's a lot less stress on you. And you get to sell in premium, okay? And you are not in a hurry to, like, you are not under pressure to sell. It's 200 kilos. You can dispose of that in, what, two days, three days. You do not necessarily have to beg somebody to come and take it. The price is 35 CDs per kilo. He ends up buying it at 25. And you are still giving, you are still giving it to him, okay? And then the other thing is that... Um, if you are starting a business, especially in this country, it's hard. You need to have something else that you survive on. Okay, so either you have a day job or if you are producing just 200 kilos, you have to have what we call the B2B leakages. You should be able to talk to some other farmer, off take his product and sell it under maybe your brand name, something like that. Okay, to make extra revenue from, from that aspect. You, you just have to look around. You could also, I know a farmer who doubles as a feed distributor for a company, a, a feed company. So stuff like that. And um, moving to the point about the, the, the chefs, I would be really happy that we are able to develop um, a lot of recipes. So I've eaten fish fingers uh, somewhere at a coffee, coffee break you have tea and then there is fish fingers at the stuff and I couldn't believe that was fish. And just imagine that if we have that value chain, uh, for now we are largely tilapia and banku and these days point and kill. So imagine that away from the evening tilapia and banku or point and kill, there is another market segment that is the coffee break fish fingers or the, the, the corporate entity, their lunch, there are lunch snacks or anything that's, uh, let's say, fish fingers or there's some nice recipe or thing. We, we would expand the value chain. So it's really remarkable that the chefs have been able to do something for us. All right, so I want to be a bit practical about this, okay? Um, I'm using myself. I started my farm with 100 fingerlings. I say it every time. It looks like a joke. I have videos to show you. The 100 fingerlings that I started the farm with, I decided not in any way to sell them fresh to anybody. So I had people in my church, and I had colleagues from Legon. We had completed school. Now, they normally do organize, let's go and sit here and uh, have fun and the rest. So I am not a kitchen guy, but because of this, even if you go on my channel, you see that I've grilled fish over there. Because of this, I grilled catfish a couple of days and then tried and realized, okay, it was okay. Then I told the guys, you know what? 
instead of us going out about 20 guys to go and spend X amount of money, this is what we'll do. Everybody, around 20, 2021, everybody bring 50 50 CDs. So the 50 50 CDs was money brought by my friends. Come and sit in my house. I have a big space. There are tables. Everybody come and sit down. So my fish that I produce for my house, the small fish that I produce, were basically that I was grilling them and I was selling. And I actually made my money. It was around 2021, 50 cities for Banku, and it was a lot of money. So we sometimes have to look at it from the other way. Second bits of it, before my fish grew to the size where I could grill them, I used to pick from other farmers because I needed to understand what uh, the market is interested in. So to be able to do that, I went to farmers, and then I buy from the farmer, and then I brought them to my house. I tried smoking the fish. Legon City Mall, they had a farmer's market. I go, I drive, and I go and sit there. And sometimes I can go and sit there the whole day, nobody buys any fish from me. But then this was what was happening. People were now getting to understand they know me. And it was difficult for people to get freshly smoked catfish because when they go to the market, most of the fish that they get, some of them the, for the catfish, they've been there for a long time. And so now, um, I had a couple of my lecturers who came around, and then they bought, I sold three pieces of fish, fresh fish, for uh, 50 cities each. And the lecturer bought it. And so now, I, I got to a point in time, instead of me driving to the farmer's market to go and sell, I just called the people, hey, I have this quantity, and they buy them. So you have to start from somewhere, and you have to be willing to say that, okay, if you know that 35 cities for fresh fish is not going to help you, double down. Nobody's going to do this for you. And if, and if right now you don't know how to do it and someone comes and gives you 30,000 Ghana cities, you still mess up that money. So you double down and then it got to a point in time, now I realized I'm even tired of the grilling. The grilling money is even small, so I want to go to somewhere else. And that's how you grow in the, in the, in the business. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I want to chip in something again. Sorry I'm talking too much. Um, it's... it's quite some history that we should really know about the sector. Uh, it's not really mentioning company names that would be like you are actually tagging some names, but those companies are no more in existence today. I don't know if anybody have heard about um, um, Fish Farmers Brigade. If anybody have heard about uh, yeah, a US tilapia, yeah. I am really raising these things up simply because if you are refusing to take initiative, people will take initiative on your behalf. Okay? That is what I can say. The history of those uh, industries are not, uh, if you can Google today, you can get some things to read on that. Uh, talking about my brother's point, it's really something critical I just want to share. When I entered this industry, the idea was that I wanted to do it big. I know that the ponds have, have excavated some years back. They are still there today. Not a single fish, not a feed had gone into it, simply because there was a bad planning. Planning is very important. If you don't plan, you will fail. And that is something that we can never, never, never do away with. You can't anticipate profits when your foundations are very bad. At Circle Farms, and what normally we do with the technical team, we ask you, if you approach us, at a youth you want to do something, you want to go into fish farming, we ask you, what is your capacity? You tell us your capacity. This is your financial that you have. Now, you can afford this. We look at that figure, put it into our system, and the system can generate to you that, okay, this money you said you have can develop or you can grow fish to this quantity. It would really, you will need feed this quantity. We are available with our technical support, free of charge, visiting you to make sure that the money you are putting in is protected. So our visit is constantly being with you. And beyond that, the document is just one page. It tells you exactly the market price of the fish. And then if you sell it, this is exactly what you get. We have developed this just to make it what? Available for everybody, a simple document just to walk away with, with a feeding chart and everything. So uh, we just want the youth to 
be more relaxed and approach everywhere that if you are in a project, do not be in a project to yourself. Uh, the likes of uh, Evans and we have, it hasn't been easy and it is still not easy, but I think we have a duty to make sure that this career grows and grow to the top that it is. At the moment, we are not even at 15 or 20 percent of the capacity that aquaculture can actually grow in the country. So the youth, it's really, really important that we all mash up and then get going and share our resources that we have to make it work. Thank you. All right, so I think I'll put a, um, a little comment on what he said. All right, sure. Drawing from lessons, um, drawing from lessons, wisdom shared yesterday. So wisdom said something yesterday that see the government is not going to help you, and the earlier you realize it, the better for you. Because if you are going to depend on government, 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 you probably get angry and depressed. You enter into a, a much more worse depressed state. So um, it's better you take the initiative of yourself. It's better you learn and do things of yourself. But my question has to do with what incentives? Um, we, we know that the regulatory framework or the um, environmental framework um, has been very tough on the big guys. Has it been on you as a little guy? Has the environmental framework with regards to the business environment done? Um, Latman shared something with regards to GE. Outside GE, outside has the entire environmental framework supported your business or fought against your business? And what advice do you give to upcoming business to learn the rudiments on the ground in order to be able to um, do better? Thank you. Uh, Luther, to, to answer something on what you said, um, with, the, with structure, organization, regulatory bodies and authorities, um, they can meet you halfway, but you can't get all the deals. For example, me as a business owner, there are monies I have lost because a regulatory body is not forthcoming. You can't get all the money. You understand me? The, I put myself out there as this is what I am doing. Do you know that as I speak, I'm sitting here, I've had people who have requested, can you send us a container of fish? That is because I just put myself out there. But also, with these regulatory bodies, for example, GSA, they have a fish unit that is in charge of imports. Before you, you can export any fish, they, 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 they are the ones who check everything, right? The moment I realized that I was getting these kind of um, requests from people, I just walked to their office. I told them, the same day I walked to their office, uh, this is what I want to do and all of that. That same day, they, they joined me, they sat in my car, I took them to my place. And then from there, we've, we've been able to work out a good relationship. So in terms of the regulatory bodies, they are, they, yes, definitely they will try, um, they will help you at some point, you understand. But the basic one that I want you to understand is with regulatory bodies, information is what um, you can easily get from them. Information about what should be done. And most of these uh, bodies are also now a day, so I'll say that they are becoming open to people coming to them rather than them coming. So for example, FDA, they are now open to you coming to them. Uh, GSA, they are open to you coming to them. So as small business owners who are trying to run any business or anything whatsoever, it is important that you go to them. Two, when you identify a problem, a challenge in your business, let's say um, because you've been going to them and you've established a relationship with them, sometimes they may overlook certain things for your behalf. You understand me? Because they know you. But all of a sudden, one day you are here and you're having a big problem. They don't know you, and for that reason, you will not necessarily benefit a lot from them. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so this is actually my first time actually engaging in a conversation around um, fish farming. And today is my first day here. I'm here with my colleague, um, Praise, who was here yesterday. But one thing I realized was that a lot of women are not involved in this process, especially in the production aspect. You find them on the market, in the market selling. But I realized that even here, you, you can count a few, and women involvement in the industry is very low in terms of production. So I want to find out from you guys, since you are, it looks like you've, you've done some great work in the industry, 
um, what, have you, what are you doing or what plans do you have for, for females um, in the production side of, of, of the business? And, and also, I want to understand, I, I work in the cold chain um, service, so we provide cold, cold chain services for, for, for farmers. So I want to understand from your perspective, what um, can cold chain do for, for you and what, in terms of what impact, right? And, and how can we help uh, with, 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 your, with your business? Um, yeah, and also with market access, specifically exports. Exports is a green field, I realize, for, for farmers here in Ghana. We, we do a lot of imports. That's what I've also realized. What can we do to take opportunities within the export market, have access to them, and get revenue? Because the revenue is what is going to help you increase your production. So three things, women, co-chain, and export. Thank you. OK, so um, before I take hairs, I, I'll just touch briefly on, on the, um, the regulatory agencies. The truth is that we are just about coming from an era where a lot of the reg regulatory guys did not understand our business. So they don't even know how to help us appropriately. But as he mentioned, as we begin to talk and then we begin to open up our businesses to them, then they see how they can fit in and develop solutions for us. It may take time, but just hang in there, it will work out. Um, <clears throat> coming to the women involvement, the gender aspect, um, it would interest you to know that one of the very first people to have started a fish farm, a commercial fish farm in Ghana was a woman around 1997, um, the owner of Crystal Lake. Okay, so it was just about two farms by then. Our current Ghana Aquaculture Association president is a woman, she produces uh, fish. Uh, it's generally a, a, a tough or tight terrain for women because of their other obligations, but I think the support systems um, exist. I've seen women that own cages along the Volta Lake. Um, uh, mostly these are people that are playing in the um, marketing aspect, as you say, they are, they are selling fish, but then they see that we can, we can go into a bit of production. I've seen a bit of that as well. Uh, although it could be better, the woman participation could be better. So um, yeah, with a lot of hand-holding, we can, we can improve that. On the coal chain, um, coal storage aspect, I think um, if we talk to a farmer, he might not understand directly what he needs you for, but the truth is that he needs you. You'd have to explain how you can fit into his situation. So a lot of farmers are rural, and um, we, are just, uh, we conduct our business by the buyers coming over there and buying bulk. What if the farmer can move his fish to your storage that is a bit urban and he's much closer to the market or with your market access um, um, solutions, he can leverage on that. That is, that, is, that, is, that is a huge potential for him. The biggest fish selling centers for aquaculture is Accra, Takra, the, a bit of Cape Coast, uh, a bit of Kumasi and uh, Tamale. Tamale is just one player that goes there once a week. Okay, how about in Coco? How about in Quanta? How about uh, Bolgatanga? How about Wa? How about Boko? How about Takwa? You get it. So yeah, Koforidia. You get it. So those 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 market exist. The if you look at and then when you come to the export thing you mentioned, if you look at the American Soybean Association, and I work for them because I want to learn how they have been successful for the last 100 years. The, the farmer has ceded the export of their commodity to um, a professional organization called USEC, the, the uh, Soybean Export Council. So these guys go out, they look for the market, they deal with the, the, um, the export wahala and everything for them. The farmer just has, and as I'm speaking to you, the soybean for next year has already been uh, auctioned. So the farmer has already, he already knows how much the people are going to take from him, whether he's increasing his production or whether he's, he's, he's to reduce his production. 
So that, that's, that potential exists for us to grow to the extent where with your market access, you can tell um, Akwesi Farmer, uh, maybe in three months time, we are going to need uh, 400 tons from you. Akwesi, um, Ajua Farmer, we are going to need this, that, 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 and that export market we capture. Again, as I said, after it's here, you don't take advantage of it, somebody else will take advantage of you. Uh, I think we will leave it here. If you have any other additional questions, um, the panelists are here. You can see them after the program, and then you can ask your questions, and they will provide solutions, or you, they can give you answers to them. Thank you so much for joining us for this session, and we will be breaking for now. Thank you. There is a session on aquaculture finance and, and insurance. Um, just, it, it, it's just happening now, so you can also join us for that. Here, just here. Yes, here. Aquaculture, insurance, and, uh, and finance. How to finance your aquaculture business and how to also ensure or insure your aquaculture business will take place in just a moment of time. So please kindly join us for this session too. Thank you.
With a growing world population, aquaculture will be an increasingly important source of proteins for humans in the coming years. Today, throughout the world, more than 300 species are farmed in cold or warm waters. Growing in very different environments, they are also exposed to a wide variety of diseases. Providing animal health solutions that address this diversity and ensure a more harmonious and sustainable growth of the species is our priority. All over the world, our team brings aquaculture farmers solutions adapted to their specific needs and that allow them to adapt to the requirements of growth, sustainability, and traceability while preserving animal welfare and the environment. Our goal is to contribute to a significant reduction of mortality while reducing the use of antibiotics. This is achieved primarily through the development of prevention solutions, vaccination in particular. Our global approach also implies services to implement it effectively. While conducting on-site analysis of germs present in the farms, for example, we help define the best protocol to adopt. Prevention also means keeping a watchful eye on water quality and adopting bioremediation solutions that improve the living environment of animals, as well as fighting nutritional imbalances, thanks to nutraceuticals to strengthen their natural defenses. We invest relentlessly to bring innovative solutions for the prevention of major aquaculture diseases and help all farmers everywhere in the world to meet the world's growing demand in a responsible and sustainable way. few minutes to have some lunch. So we will start in the next 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Do you see potential for economic progress that also improves human and animal nutrition in countries with some of the fastest growing populations in the world? Do you want to partner to find solutions for the protein gaps found in Africa, Asia, and Central America. If you can join us in capturing business opportunities in nutritious foods and feeds, then stay tuned. Visionary U.S. soybean growers founded the World Initiative for Soy in Human Health, or WISH, as a program of the American Soybean Association. We are committed to strengthening agricultural market systems in developing and emerging economies in order to improve food security and build long-term demand for U.S. soy. Our work supports businesses, governments, and non-governmental organizations from Guatemala to Uganda to Cambodia to introduce nutritious foods and feeds that grow their businesses and economies. At WISH, we focus on regions where U.S. soy markets don't exist yet, blazing new trails in new sectors around the world. 
For example, Wish has made significant impacts in Central America by partnering with companies that use U.S. soy to manufacture more nutritious foods and beverages. In Asia, Wish partners have expanded their businesses by putting U.S. soy in fish feed for the first time. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, local entrepreneurs have partnered with Wish to grow businesses that sell delicious and nutritious soy-based local foods, as well as feeds for poultry, fish, and more. So what can a partnership with WISH do for you? Working on behalf of U.S. soybean farmers, our goal is to create global partnerships and provide new opportunities for businesses and entrepreneurs in market sectors with real potential for growth, work with key stakeholders, and provide effective trade solutions. While serving as an incubator, we connect driven leaders with supply chain partners. We help you network for strategic partnerships and create opportunities to launch a new product or service. And our go-to market strategists offer a localized approach, the right resources, the right expertise, and the right systems for better nutrition and improved food security in your market. At WISH, our greatest strength is our ability to facilitate strategic partnerships throughout the world to promote the benefits of soy. WISH and the American Soybean Association have the vision and the voice to continue to build awareness, create partnerships, and drive change for a healthier world. Uh, advanced by financial institutions. And I'm glad to have EcoBank here. They are one of our partner financial institutions. So our aim is to catalyze and increase funding into the sector by the financial institutions. Uh, we, we know there is perception and real risk in the sector. So that is what we are trying to work on so that the banks will increase their appetite and incentivize them more to give loan to the agricultural sector by guaranteeing the loan will be advancing to agribusinesses, including aquaculture. So we operate across all the value chains in all the uh, subsectors in the agriculture sector. We do aquaculture, but we don't do fishing. Uh, but the fishing aspect, the harvesting aspect is what we don't do. But when it's come to the processing, the downstream, we support. But for aquaculture, we do from input to processing and marketing. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Evelyn Rose Deborah. I'm with the Ghana Agriculture Insurance Pool, uh, the only agriculture insurance company in the country. And I'm mentioning pool because. Ghana is just now getting into the concept of agriculture insurance. It's just barely a decade old, over 10 years now. A pool was formed because agriculture, as usual, is perceived very risky. None of the insurance companies wanted to venture. SIC attempted 20 years ago. It remained a DEX research. No product was developed, no product was sold. So they figured that if they wanted to go into the agriculture sector, the safest way to go is to go in as a group instead of as individuals. So the intention was GAIP, or the Ghana Agriculture Insurance Pool, was formed for the past 10 years to design array of products for the agriculture sector, more or less do the experimentation for them, 
do the market study, and build capacity for the industry. Eventually, each of the insurance companies are going to underwrite these risks on their own. But at the moment, they have the Ghana Aquaculture Insurance Company who is underwriting the risks for them. We are made up of 16 of the non-life insurance company, Holad, SIC, Enterprise, Prime, Coronation, they are all Puma Mess at the moment, and we are building the capacity for them. We've designed array of products from crops to forestry, poultry, and just last year, we also attempted aquaculture. Basically, when it comes to the life in aquaculture, it's mortality. It's the life of the animal. So what causes the death of the animal? If what causes it is within your management, it's not insurable. If you fail to give it a vaccine, you fail to give it a vitamin, you fail to provide a requisite feed, and it dies, it's purely under management. But if, let's say, an uncontrollable pest or disease attack, there's no known chemical for it to control, or there's no adequate chemical in the country for it to control, then insurance will come in to take it on. And fortunately, the good news is that both parties sitting down here are partners. So Giselle has more or less hand over there. As, as they offer guarantee to the banks, they have also are protecting the agricultural production through us at the production site. So in the way, they are in there. While because of our presence, the likes of Ecobank and Stambeck are now interested for the first time to learn to agriculture. So basically, it's like we have the full scheme sitting down here. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Michael Ousu Grabwache. I work at Ecobank and I am the agribusiness sector lady. Um, Ecobank, as you are aware, is a Pan African bank. Um, we are in 33 African countries. The bank has taken decision to give focus to agribusiness and we have created a special desk at the, bank, at the bank to coordinate and grow that portfolio. So we have built capacity and we look at all the value chains in the agribusiness um, on a case case-by-case basis. Of course, I just meant, want to mention that because agribusiness is wide. So we have selected areas that we really work with and areas that have structures around the operations we are able to support. So I'm happy to be here and I know we have a full, full deliberation. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, this session will be very interactive. So there will be a lot of questions and answers. For now, I would like my resource people to talk more about the specific products that they have. Then afterwards, if you have some questions, you can also ask them. Okay, thank you. So I'll start with the gentleman from Gelsa. Yeah. Well, uh, our main client is the bank. So whatever he brings, we assess case by case, but I'll, he would have started, but let me, let me put it this way. So uh, as I said, we, 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 we are established to the rates, the agriculture finance in the country. We, we have various pillars. The main pillar, one of the pillars is the a guarantee scheme, where we provide 40 to 70 percent guarantee to the principal, the bank, Ecobank, for instance, is advancing to the, to the agribusiness. Our main client is the bank, not the customer. So what we did is to incentivize the banks to give more loans to the sector. In so doing, uh, financing to the sector will be increased. We usually do that without the knowledge of the agribusiness. So the agribusiness sends loans to Ecobank. Ecobank look at it, they satisfy that they are going to advance the loan, but they need some backing. Then Ecobank will submit it to us. Together, we do the risk assessment, look at the viability of the project. If we are satisfied, based on the risk level, we so say, okay, we'll give you 50% backing or 40% guarantee so that in, in unlikely events of default, we will 
pay uh, EcoBank. Then the rest, EcoBank, will see how to deal with the agribusiness. And we have also realized that uh, banking system in the country, the staff have limited knowledge in agriculture. Because if you have limited knowledge in a sector, you may decide to avoid it. Even if you don't want to avoid it, you want to go into it, you go into it wrongly. And also, agriculture is timely. So if you have knowledge about it, you will assess it and approve it on time. So because of that, one aspect of our activity is technical assistance. So far, we have trained over 300 bank staff in agriculture so that they will understand agriculture and assess agriculture with the lens of agriculture, but not the way they will assess service or industry sector. Because agriculture has its peculiar cycle, peculiar activity. We do this training together with National Banking College. In addition to that, we have also developed a resource information tool. It's a web-based tool we call the Knowledge Portal, Agribusiness and Agricultural Knowledge Portal. So far, we have 33 commodities there. Aquaculture is one of the commodities we have there. We take you through the good aquaculture practices, what is needed, and, and the required benchmarks, like the stocking density, what feed should to give the uh, aquaculture at what stage, the vaccination to do at a particular stage. So therefore, if, for instance, uh, there's a loan, aquaculture loan to EcoBank, they go in there, look at it, which are the benchmark? Is the company, uh, what is it, meeting those benchmarks? Is the biosecurity level okay? The expected revenue, can it pay back the loan? Because if you have a, a, a certain stocking density, you know the feed to give, the vaccine to give, and you know the yield to get. Like in aquaculture, for instance, we, we know the male-female ratio. If there are systems, you do sex reversal. So if the bank staff know that this thing should be done in order to increase the weight, if that farmer is doing that, you know, okay, he's on the right track and he's going to get the required weight. So those things are there. This part of the aquaculture aspect was developed by a specialist. I don't know whether you know Matthew Oi. Yeah, he developed that uh, aspect of the fact sheet. The other component we have also is the mentoring and coaching. We are mentoring and coaching the banks. So if they have an, a, a business that has requested for loan, they come to us, we look at it, we work with them. And we're also supporting the banks. EcoBank has agribusiness desk. Some banks don't have. They treat agriculture and uh, SMEs. So we are helping them establish agribusiness decks so that they have special, specialized people there to manage and assess agriculture loans. So far, that is what we have done. And we have been able to uh, leverage our guarantee for over two billion worth of loans. Thank you very much. Add one thing. We are in talk with Gaib. We are looking at bundling the the guarantee because the bank pay about one percent of the fee, but premium for uh, insurance is also there. So we are looking at how we can bundle the two so that if you come for guarantee, you get insurance at the same time. We are still working on that. And that one will also come on board. Okay. So for EcoBank, 
um, we are a commercial bank and we serve a wide range of customers. For agribusiness, they fall under commercial banking. Now, what are the products that we provide for people in agribusiness? The start is a business account. Before we can do anything with you, we have to have a relationship. And we have developed accounts that will meet your need. So for instance, to promote your business, Ecobank business account does not charge COT. You don't charge cost of turnover. So irrespective of how much you do, you have a fixed amount that you pay, 48 cities for the whole month for small businesses. So that's one. Then we have payment solutions that will enable you to make your payments without actually coming to the bank. We have a very robust internet platform that you can sit at your office and make payments, even international payments. And you can also do foreign exchange conversions that can be done at your office. We also have collection platforms that enables you to collect your payment across um, nationwide. So now that we are in the era of um, e-commerce, that comes in very handy for business um, owners, especially those in agribusiness. There's also market access. We help you with that. So we are collaborating with Google, with Google My Business. So if you open a Google Business account, we help you place your business online for visibility and marketing. That also comes in handy. Um, we have card services, um, business card for your staff and for the business. We have both credit card and debit cards. So those are the basics. Now, when business people meet banks, they're only looking at loans. But I want to say that um, it's not only loan alone. Um, we do a lot of things. Having said that, we have financing support, a wide range, depending on your need. So I will put them together in bundles in order not to waste too much time. So we have working capital support. Um, I say working capital support because it's basically to serve your working capital need within a year. So any need for the business that you can turn around and pay back within a year will come under working capital support for um, in different forms. So for instance, you can have an overdraft that will take care of maybe salary and other small, small um, expenses whilst you wait for your receivables. We can also have receivable financing under working capital where you have contracts and you have supplied by your payment terms demand that it takes some time before they pay you back. So if you are dealing with the big hotels and you have payment arrangements, whilst you wait for them to pay you, we can look on that delivery that you have made and advance money to you so that you can you know, continue to do your business. Then also when you have contracts to supply, based on that contract, we can look at it and advance money for you to enable you execute the contract. So those come under working capital support. Then we have term loans. Term loans are basically used for facilities that will be paid uh, after a year. So you may need money to buy van, trucks, etc., or expand your, your, your warehouse. That comes under term loan. Then you have um, what I would say trade finance. So we do LCs for those who are importing, so that our, if you would do LC, the bank will support to give you um, the guidance as to the things you may have to require to ensure that the items you are bringing in qualify for what you are looking for. We also provide guarantees. And I think that's where businesses are not looking at to take advantage. In the era of high interest rates, businesses have to work together to see how you can promote each other's business i.e., if you give credit to your customer, um, you are hesitant because he may default. But then the bank can step in and provide you a guarantee or an LC to enable you give the product to the customer on credit. And then on the unlikely event that the customer fails to pay you, then the bank steps in and pay. So um, it's another way of funding by indirect. So um, basically, this is uh, on a broader scale, the products that we have for um, the business. I must say that agribusiness is a value chain. And we look at each value chain and their needs. And we need to be able to find structure around what you are doing. So for instance, if I say structure, if you approach the bank for support, we may want to find out how you're getting your raw material, 
How are you selling? How are you storing? So we want to see at the end of the day how are you selling and getting your money back. That is why I mentioned that we have collection platforms that enable us to help you to collect. And also, the very important, we have visibility on what you are doing, especially when it comes to the funding aspect. If we don't see what you are doing, we will not be able to help you. What I mean by seeing what you are doing is, for a small business, you may not have audited financials. So in order for us to validate any claim that you make, we may have to look into your account. So if you are into agriculture and you sell your fish and you just spend the money cash around and doesn't go through the bank, you come to the bank and so you have this capacity. We may not be able to validate that claim and will not be able to support you. You will tell us you receive such amount periodically, this period, but because it does not, they don't come to your account, we are unable to, again, validate. and makes it difficult for us to support. So you made the claim that I have been with the bank for so long, but when I go to them for support, the bank said they cannot help. This is one of the reasons why we are unable to, when that comes. So having mentioned the product that we have to support um, businesses, I just want to mention that it's very so important that we see what you do, and then we can move together. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm with the insurance. As I explained earlier on, uh, in Ghana, nobody's allowed to run a composite insurance company. It means that you are either doing life or you are doing non-life. So you are no insurance. So if you observe, we have SIC, we have SIC life, we have Metropolitan Life, we have Holad. Ghana Aquaculture Insurance came about roughly getting to its 13th year. And I said, we were formed basically to provide insurance products for the agriculture sector, including aquaculture. But uh, agriculture is so dynamic in a way that we couldn't zoom into all the value chain. Now, because we are formed by existing insurance companies, like non-life, we are not allowed to go into the areas they already are. So Holad is already selling insurance for property, for motor, for structure, fire. We are mandated to only do the production phase of agriculture. It means that we cannot insure the tractor, we cannot insure the warehouse, we cannot insure any equipment. But we are supposed to insure the crop from the day it emerges to the day you harvest. The aquaculture, we are supposed to ensure its life from hatchery to when you sell it off. So normally, we kind of journey with the farmer in a season or two to understand the production cycle. We don't pretend to be experts. So normally, when we come to you, it is you who have to help us to understand your production cycles where your rigs are, then when we understand your rigs, we can able to tell you that this is an insurable rigs or this is not. Two, agriculture rigs tend to be catastrophic in nature. Even general insurance do not offer 100% cover. Worst case scenario is in agriculture. Most of our rigs are what the insurance companies call the art of God and what they call exclusions. So normally, when you pick any typical insurance contract, they exclude flood, they exclude drought, they exclude windstorm, they exclude earthquake. Rather unfortunately, the majority of these risks is what is pertinent in agriculture. So we have to be very creative about how we define our products. So as I explained, normally a production or a product design takes a whole year or more. And even after we do that, we go on to the next phase where we actually journey with an actual business owner. So for agriculture, we did that with Flocell, one of the biggest agriculture farms in the country at that moment. And then we have to understand the various risks that are exposed. Interesting though, what we observe is that the risks that is of significant importance to agriculture production rather happens to be something that happens every cycle. That is the death of the fingerlings. Evans, you help me out, right? Yeah. Now, in insurance, there is something called frequency and impact. How frequent is that risk? And when did that happen, what is the impact? 
if the race happens almost every season and the impact is very large as it happens with fingerlings, then it's like I'm supposed to insure you at 100% to be able to pay compensation. So that's one of the key things we learn when we journey with Flocell, that the major risks to them, what I mean, let me, let me kind of simplify it. They have structure, they have environmental risks, they have input risks. As I said, we are only mandated to come in in a production risks. They were in open waters, theft is one of their main risks, we cannot take it. Of the production risks, their major problem was the death of the fingerlings. And they had up to 70% of production, losing 70%, which means that for every cycle, they are bound to lose 70% of their fingerlings. So every cycle, I'm supposed to pay compensation up to 70% of their investment in the fingerling phase meaning that I'm supposed to charge them 70 divided by 100. Now, if you take a loan of 5,000 Ghana cities and I'm charging you at that rate, the premium will be unbearable for any business line. So agriculture, where, wherever agriculture insurance is done, with the exception of Ghana and Australia, there is some form of state subsidy. Ghana, at the moment, do not have it. With the help of the likes of GCL and other partners, we have now developed what is called the Agriculture Insurance Fund with the regulator, but it's also in its preparatory phase. We have product for almost most of the agriculture sector, but we are now entering into the aquaculture phase. As I said, we've designed one product, we've seen the outcome, we realize that the loss exposure there is too high for you to experience that kind of loss in every cycle. So now what we have decided is that we are going back to the table. This product was designed in conjunction with a chamber of aquaculture and with a, a business owner like Flocell. We are now taking that product back to the table because it wouldn't make sense if you offer that kind of product that is supposed to pay 70% every cycle. For the financial people who don't know that, it doesn't make sense to anybody. So we have the product, but between the reinsurer and with the insurers, we figured that we have to go back to the table because exactly when we had them on cover, where they had the issue is exactly the area that we excluded because I cannot experience 70% loss every cycle. It doesn't make sense. So we have agreed that we are going to put that product on table and take a look at it. And we are currently working on it with the Chamber of Agriculture and the whole team so that we can come back again with a product that actually meets your needs. So we've done that for tilapia, catfish on the other hand, we are here to migrate into that area. However, we have products for the other agriculture value chain. And that's the little I have to put on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next thing I would like to ask is, how can stakeholders in the aquaculture sector position their businesses so that they can benefit from some of the products and services that you offer? Okay, so maybe you can start with Ecoban here. So at Ecobank, or let me say most financial institution banks, um, for you to benefit from the product that we, we have for our customers, the first thing is to have the relationship. We have to have an account. And I mentioned that you have to give us visibility as to what you are doing. Let us know what you are doing. All transactions, as much as possible, should be channeled through the account. Now. We want to have structure. So for instance, you should be able to demonstrate. Let me start from the top. First of all, the business needs to be legally registered. That's critical. Most people are doing agribusiness in their personal names or no bank, at, no bank at all. In that case, the bank cannot help you. So for you to be included in the financial system, you need to open an account, and you need to open the right account, business account. So you have to register your business and use the name to open an account. In Ecobank, we realize that that can be a challenge for small business. So we have a light KYC account, which we call merchant account, that allows you to bring any statutory payment in the form of tax, in local tax, whatever they have paid. And we can open an account in your name and target as business to transit you 
as a like in the that in the meantime you can operate with that once we help you to register your business and open a proper business account for you your account history will continue from where you started so that's very helpful now having an open account i mentioned about the collection the, pay, the payment solution and the rest i think most people are looking at the, the financing how do we do it how do you enjoy it you have to demonstrate capacities your skill do you have the knowledge in the business that you are doing that is why we will normally recommend that the business should have been in existence for 33 years so that you have gone up and down and you know the cycles in the business why do we say that the monies available at the bank are for depositors and we have to make sure that any money we advance to customers we are able to get back so we want to make sure that the success rate of returning the money is high and we think that by being in the business for three years you would have known the ups and downs and then when we come in we can support you secondly the bank's money to you is not what you use to start a business we are coming to give you leverage to help you move faster okay so on your own assuming you are doing 100 and you know you have the capacity to do 200 we come in and give you the extra 100 at the end of the day Whatever return that you have made on that hundred extra we are giving you, you pay us our interest and you take the rest. So you are earning more than you, you, you would have earned with your own resources. That's how the banks come in. So you have demonstrated, you have, you have a business um, registered, you have demonstrated capacity by staying in business for about three years. You also have to demonstrate that you have clear off takers who are buying from you. At the end of the day, that's very critical because if you are not able to demonstrate that after I have you know, gone through the cycle, this is the off tickets, then it becomes difficult. Now here, we would have preferred contractual agreement, but where that does not exist, because for instance, we finance those who sell rice in the market, but they don't have contracts. But we are willing to sell to them because they do daily sales, they bring the money to the bank, we are able to have visibility. So where there is no contract and you are selling across, you have to make sure that you are using the collection platforms to collect your money into your account so that whatever that you say, we can validate it. So a clear demonstration of market should be there. And also, purpose of the loan or the facility. Sometimes an agribusiness customer will come and you will ask him how much do you need, he will mention an amount. Then you take him through why do you need an amount, break it down. By the time you, it is broken down, you realize that it is not correct. Okay? So you should be able to demonstrate to us what you need that fund for and what it's going to do for the business. And I was having a discussion with one of the players in the, in the industry that it's also very important that looking at the risk involved in the business, you, the business owner, you use your equity to handle the most risky parts whilst the banks and other institutions come in to help you with others. So for instance, if the fingerling railing is where the challenge is, use your equity. Don't use your equity to go and buy the truck. The truck is less riskier. The bank can support you in that. We can buy you the truck. We can help you build your warehouse. Okay, we can help you with your coastal room construction. So when you make profit, you retain some, and then you use it as a buffer for the bad times. So when I know that in your business you have this kind of capital in it, it can absorb shocks and will be willing to help you when you come for facility. As I said, our facilities are to help you grow faster. They are leverage. Okay, they are leverage. So I've mentioned that you have to register your business. You have to have the skills, management skills. You have to be in existence for a while. You have to show clear market, purpose of the funds, that you are, how you're going to use it. And then, at the end of the day, we, depending on, on the, um, the value chains where you are and the linkage that you have built, we'll be able to support you. I think that is uh, what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, your question was how? I mean, how they can, stakeholders in the aquaculture sector can position themselves to take advantage of some of the services and products that you have here. Thank you. One is the know-how. I think you have done very well in what you've organized. And between what Gisel is doing and what the Chamber of Aquaculture is doing, that's the beginning. Anything you have to do, 
you really need to know how to do it. Or better yet, I was listening to the earlier discussions, and one thing I was coming to say is that those who are interested in doing it, find somebody who has already done it and learn from them. Because as, as a risk taker, I am not coming to teach you how to do your job. It's already known to you. Whatever my antennas are susceptible to is where the risks are. I'm sensitive to, so if you ask Evans, the first day I, he took me onto his farm, I quickly pointed out that nah, there's no food bath here, and which means whatever I carry from my home and I'm bringing, I'm bringing it to your farm. So my senses are alert to where the risks are, whether they are within manageable means or beyond. What I can take on as a risk taker and what I cannot take on. Then I also want to, I need to understand the frequency of the risks. So any farm you get onto and you do not have any record at all as to what they are doing, I'll, I'll just smile with you and say, let's do it again this year. So one is a know-how. Two is record keeping. We insurance company are mandated by law to also reinsure ourselves with a local reinsurer and international reinsurer. Our international reinsurance companies, if you saw what they call the proposal form they brought to us and the requirements for an aquaculture farm. Honestly, I could say that the top three of these countries still couldn't even meet the requirement. So we now have to talk to them and help them to understand, with the help of the Chamber of Aquaculture, that this is how our terrain is. Notwithstanding, journey with us will grow and get there. They have very strict requirements of how you maintain a farm. So the known how by security measures, it's okay. You are dealing with life just like human beings. You are susceptible to diseases or pests. The mode of transmission is contact airborne. So if you have a farm, then it's like anybody walks in and walks out. It's like a thorough, like anybody can just pass through the farm. I know from the onset, you are a risk waiting to happen. So you are basically asking, what do I look out for? Is your business sense. Are you doing it as a backyard garden or this is an actual business? Is it registered, as my colleague said? Because we, the financial people, anytime we are putting our money in somewhere, we're quickly looking for the route where it's coming back to us. Is that okay? So if you're an open-ended business where you don't even know how much you are earning in a day, how much stock you harvest from your farm, how much, if you see my proposal form, it's about five-page document. If you think the bank own is difficult, see my own. It's a five. <laughs> so I need to know your business sense. I need to know you are business minded. What is your risk control measures? Do you have a production cycle? What is your staff strength? Permanent, temporary. What expertise, even if you don't have on farm, who do you access to? Who do you have that checks on? Your disease and pest control system, your mitigation measures. As much as I'm taking on your risks, I'm not asking you to open yourself up so that anything happens to you, then you come to me to pay claims. So those are the things that we look at for. But of key to the financial system is what we call the moral hazard. The difficulty with us investing in agriculture is that aside the natural risks involved in agriculture production, moral hazard is equally very high. Now, we deal in numbers. If I'm insuring 10,000 farmers, and all 10,000 farmers at the end of the cycle are come to tell me they have had a loss. And it's a genuine loss, I pay. But then where there's no loss, but somebody intentionally go and cut the net and all the fish run away, or harvest their fish, and I may tell you that he have had a loss, you should come and pay. It will not be a viable business for us to want to stay in it. That's what I want to say. So before we move into any production, any area, to invest is the business sense. Is it a business worth investing in? Is it registered? Does it have a bank account? Are you really, because if you're a business and you really want somebody to take you serious and not have a bank account, on what basis are you doing the business? Are you risk conscious? Who is, who are you exposed to? Who carries you through? The difficult times, I've observed flow cell and they have really gone through difficult times. But they were standing because of the known how. They were exposed to international experts who were carrying them through to understand the new even diseases and pests that emerged in the market. 
this person you could travel with because you know, these are hard time, you pay compensation, good time, they'll pick up. So basically that's what we look out for. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's something you want to add. Yes, uh, because if you meet the bank's requirements, you have done about 80% of the work. Because if the bank submits the request to us, we also do our assessment. And I would like to add that the market is also key. But beyond that, what is the market size you are going into? How big it is? And what is the market entry requirement? Because uh, fish is a perishable food. So what is the requirement to enter the, the market? And I want to add to what uh, Gaib is saying. We've received about four aquaculture applications from banks. Most of the rejections were based on biosecurity issues. But the other one has to do with the bank itself not following our principle. Because before you become a partner, you have to sign a master agreement with us. And one of the key thing is you shouldn't advance the loan before coming to us. So that one was rejected because the bank didn't follow the procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. So I have a few questions I would like to ask, but I want to open the floor to the people seated here. If you want to ask any questions directly to them, please just raise your hand, and I'll come to you with a microphone. OK. So. Hello, sir. Good to. Uh, my name is Gabriel. Um, in whilst you're talking about, you say you're from EcoBank. So let's say um, someone has a business. They've been running the business for let's say almost four years now. Mm -hmm. They have a bank account and and probably it's EcoBank account, so you can easily monitor all of that. And the person comes and says, "I have a purchase agreement, right?" But the 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 volume of the uh, the agreement. Is, is in millions of dollars. And that's the first time the person is bringing something like that to you. But when you check the person's account, they, we, are, we, are kind, we are probably looking at figures around like, let's say, fifty to $70,000 thereabout from what they have with you. Um, do you think it's something that um, you guys, since you said that you guys um, do take a look at some of these things, is this something that you guys are willing to assist? Because there are, uh, uh, we've had instances where an international organization wants to make a payment to mm -hmm. an account. But then it says, you know what, we want your bank to, I, I don't even know if the word is to guarantee that you, you are with them and, and stuff like that. And we've had businesses losing money as a result of some of these things because the bank was not willing to um, guarantee for the person. And for that reason, the person decided, the, the person lost the, the money. Uh, second bit of it, you are saying in, in relation to insurance, um, you said uh, there are uh, procedures and uh, biosecurity measures that we need to look out for for farms. Is there a possibility that we can easily access uh, that information so that um, as farms that are trying, we strive every time to meet all of these requirements to be able to gain insurance? And then also in terms of exportation of um, um, fish in tonnages in, in, in whichever form, uh, do you have that form of uh, insurance that covers uh, that kind of uh, exportation as well? Thank you. Okay, so since my colleague's own is more detailed, I will wrap my quickly in it. So yes, we have information. We have a website we could share with you that kind of give you, shows you what are the requirements for uh, a farm that we take on, which was actually we designed it in, a, in conjunction with the Chamber of Agriculture. Because as I said, we are no experts. So normally, before we go into the, an area, we consult all the experts in there, and they give us a guideline. So even the diseases and pests that we insure against were listed or were helped both the Chamber of Agriculture and some of the farms that are in here. Then on your second question, is the issue is, the answer is actually no. As I said, we, we are made up of 16 of existing insurance companies. 
we are only mandated to handle the production phase of a grape. That is from the day old cheeks to harvest or from the fingerlings to when you take it off the farm. As soon as it's, it's separated from a living thing to an edible thing, my mandate ends there. I'm not supposed to go into warehouse, storage, transit, because my pool members, that is my insurance companies, are already in those areas. So when you have it as a need, I quickly pass it on to any of them. Actually, we are now moving to that phase because we realize that most of the businesses that we are coming doesn't come in that singular phase. It's not just production. It has a warehouse, it has a tractor, or it has a structure, it has fish, it has some equipment. So what it actually wants is a holistic cover, and not that, not that segregated cover. So currently, Guide is in the face of being actually restructured so that the insurance company can actually do this and be able to give any farmer who works in a holistic cover instead of that segmented cover. But currently, when you come, what we do is that we give you the production one, and any of our full members who is interested takes on maybe your goods in transit or your storage or your vehicle. That's what we are doing. But we are moving to that next phase where we can give that kind of holistic cover to a business. Thank you. Thank you very much. So your first question, just to be right, you've gotten a contract bigger than usual, right? And you want to find out, yes, yeah, so you want to find out whether the bank will do it. So the first of all, I would say it depends on the complexity of the contract. So assuming you are input supplier, you are importing um, for good example, let's say fertilizer, you are doing certain tonnage, right? But then you have a contract to supply a bigger tonnage. You know the formula is there, you are not producing yourself, so you are like a better man. Okay, and you have an off taker. In that case, we will be able to look at it because we know you, you are into that product, just that you have a bigger break. So we can just look at it and see how genuine that contract is, and we can come in. Supply, we pay the supplier, you receive your money, and then um, everything is fine. So don't be scared of, like, big contract. The only reason that we may not want to do it is to your capacity. We may not be too comfortable with your capacity, especially where the transactions are a bit complex. So if you are supposed to produce something, you are going to add a lot of things, ingredients, to come up with the product, and you have not done that big size before. Just like in your house, if you cook for 10 people, you think you are a very cook, good cook. But if they give you 1,000 people to cook for, you realize that it's not the same. So although you may be able to cook for 10 people, 1,000 people, if you are cooking for them, is a different matter. So we then want to try and find out your capacity to do the 1,000. So that, I hope that answers the first question. Now, the second one is about KYC, me knowing you. I think what you're asking for is um, confirmation of your account for, for you to receive inflows. Is that what you meant? So the question I will ask is, why are they making the payment to your account? Why are they making the payment? Are they buying something from you? Yeah, so it's basically, it's basically just fish you are sending to them. Okay, and they are paying you in advance? Yeah, so, they, so they'll be paying you when the final product is ready before you ship them. Yes, and they want me to guarantee yes. that you will do it. So it's a form of a guarantee I'm providing. In that case, I will take you through the process because I need to be sure that on the set date, you'll be able to meet that obligation. That is why they are asking me, the bank, to guarantee the money they have sent to you. So they're giving you advance payment to perform a contract and supply them. If you're not able to perform the contract, then they'll fall on the guarantee and take their money. So I have to make sure that I am comfortable with you, that amount that they are demanding from you, you have the capacity and know-how to produce and will be able to deliver. If I am okay with that, I'll go ahead and give the guarantee. So any bank that will be hesitant in giving you the guarantee is not too sure of your ability to meet that contract obligation. And you have to prove to the bank that you'll be able to meet that con contract obligation. Right. Yeah. Because um, in some of these things, when, you have, when you're a business owner and you have, um, let's say, a request of this nature, I'm sure most of the time we contact every single bit of regulatory body 
that must help us to be able to do that. So for example, I'm exporting, I need GSE. I need um, um, uh, the people who help me to be able to export. And they all, like that, they all bear witness to everything you are saying. The only thing remaining was a bank to just say that, okay, I know him, this is where he lives, this is where their product is and everything. And then a lot of the banks will be willing. To no, so let me just correct this. It is not only saying that. It is a guarantee, a commitment on our part, contingent liability, that if you fail to perform the contract, we will pay. So I have to do my due diligence to make sure that you'll be able to deliver. So you have to understand the bank and then try and let the bank know that you have the competence to supply. If you're able to do that, we will go with you. Okay. Yeah. Right. I think that's the answer. Okay, so I've got about three questions. Um, the first one I wanted to ask is um, if you are thinking of an education strategy for, for farmers, because what we are talking here, it appears that the education only counts when the farmer comes to you and needs the money. And I need the money in the next three months, and that's the time you are telling me that I need to go and produce, provide this, I need to go and provide Hey, I mean, three months. You should have been telling me like a year or two ago. So uh, would you, going forward, have a strategy to have like sessions like this? This is just so short, like more sessions to have uh, farmer education. Okay, fantastic. as far as finance is concerned, is at both supply and the demand side. Okay. We're doing the supply side with National Banking College where we are training the bankers. But for the agribusinesses, we are collaborating with existing institution uh, development partners to do that. So we, last year, we, we had a program where we brought the banks and the agribusinesses. We were able to identify what the bankers, sorry, what the bankers look for and what the agribusiness should, should put in place and prepare before going to the bank, which we have cataloged. It's available and we have shared with all the, I believe you haven't received it yet uh, because our relationship started recently. So we'll share it with you. We have cataloged those points there so that it will help in developing training uh, materials for agribusinesses. So my second question is about rates. So um, you cataloged a lot of um, bundles, like lending um, packages. Uh, is, it so, is, it, is, is it favorable, or is the same 30% that you give to the Tonaton businesses? <laughs> uh, I mean, it should, be, it should be a lot favorable to us. And then the third one, it's a bit controversial, but I want to pick your mind on it. So the Chinese businesses come into Ghana in aquaculture, I'm speaking for aquaculture, and these guys have some kind of finance that they are able to outwork us. Uh, I don't know if you have, you know about the, the nature of their, their financing strategy. Are you guys going to be able to help us match that? Because if the guy is coming with, um, um, and I'm sure it's not just uh, cheaper lending rates, but probably a much more favorable monitorium. It's a much more, like they, they, they kind of have a strategy backing them establishing in the African markets. Uh, are you looking at that for the, at the long term or um, we are left on our own to compete with them? So to, Add to the educational bit for Ecobank, one of our products is non financial. So we have Ecobank Academy, Ecobank SME Club that provide um, non financial support to our customers. So you'll be told what you are supposed to do um, to enjoy the service that we have, especially when it comes to lending. So that is there. And also, um, we have, as mentioned earlier, we have a great desk set up now. So in our 
over 60 plus branches. If you go to any branch and you, your business is agribusiness and you need support, they are, the branch is able to connect you to the agribusiness desk. And by setting up the agribusiness, we are getting a lot of information and building capacity. So we are able to speak to, a, to the customer um, to meet the need and educate him as to what to do by picking experiences across. So I might have done something for a customer in, in Kumasi, a crack customer calls the same industry, that information is known, I'm able to pass on to the person for him to do it right. So dedication is ongoing, but I think we can do more as one of these um, this, um, forum we're having. Then secondly, about the rates. We appreciate the fact that the rates are high. Agribusiness is not normal business because your repayment cycles are not normal cycles. So we need to understand what you are doing. I was asking somebody, if you are to bring up tilapia from hatchery to tabletop, how long will it take? Like six months? All right, or more? Okay. Now months or six months, yes. So, exactly. So I cannot structure your loan like somebody who is doing Totonaton. I need to understand. And you also have to understand that if I give you 100,000 and I have to wait for a year or six months to, for you to pay, the cost will be a bit higher. The effective cost will be a bit higher than somebody who is doing Tonaton. Because the person who is selling rice is selling every day and bringing money to the account every day. However, we are working together with partners. So for instance, um, Gessel, um, DBG, um, Development Bank of Ghana, um, and, and, and the financial institution, which Ego Bank is actively participating, they are looking at how do we support some industry. So currently, um, four impact um, products have been identified, rice, soya, maize, poultry. For now, I think with time, others will be included. Now, if you are able to qualify for, uh, if I say qualify, if you meet the requirements, okay, DBG working through us, so you cannot go to DBG. Just I guess so. You have to come through your commercial bank, and then we will present you to DBG. They are able to give you, or they are able to give, help us to give you a loan currently at 20% fixed rate for a longer tenor. Okay, so you can have. 20% fixed rate. Fixed rate is important because most of our interest rates are floating rates. So they change as the Ghana reference rate changes. So now we are having a downward trajectory, so it's fine. But if it's not going up, your rate will also go up. So fixed rate 20 DBG will help you. Again, pricing of a loan has a lot of determinants. So when Gesser comes in and helps with the guarantee and others, we are able to bring the interest a bit lower. So that is what I would say on the score of the interest rate. There's very little we can also do. We have to appreciate the fact that our cost of funding is a bit high in Ghana. So we have to you know, bring everything um, into consideration when we are determining the rate. Even our Ghana reference rate is determined by BOG, and now it's 25 plus. So if you add a margin, then you are going that level. So it is not the banks that are keeping the rate high, but the system is what is requiring that. Now. For our competitor from China and the rest, what I'm thinking of is that he is coming in with, let's say, foreign currency. Our CD uh, depreciation is depreciated against the dollar. So if you bring one dollar, he gets a lot of CD. And he's paying in local, the labor is in local currency, fingerlings in local currency. Okay, so you realize that with that small dollar that he came, he came in with, he's able to do a lot. And I am, Looking at, probably, they may, most countries have um, SMs that support businesses. So I don't know how much they get their, their loan from where they're coming from, but I think if they get the loan at a relatively um, reduced rate, and then coupled with depreciation of the city, they bring small dollar in here, they get more cities, then they can do more. So I think that is where um, they may be getting their advantages from. But we have to work in-house and see how we can um, um, be competitive. Thank you. I think I was in a, a similar uh, meeting early this morning, and the same concern came up. That one was involving uh, uh, poultry farmers. The same concern was also coming in because somehow the one that is imported, 
that either sat on the sea for months, came and sat in the coastal for months, that finally got to the tabletop. It's far cheaper than the one that was produced just in your backyard. And it had a lot to do with policy and the state. Because the foreign sources, agriculture is highly subsidized, not just thrown in the air like the way we are doing it, but there's a structure system made in such a way that the subsidy actually got into the soil to bring a return for the people. So that is where we, the private sector, cannot handle this as individual. We were saying the same thing. Listen, if you want put one fish farmer is in the corner somewhere and you're complaining about this, it falls on deaf ears. But if you come as a, a unified body, your production is significant enough that the government begins to hear all that you are doing. You begin to get their attention because all of this has to do with a lot with the taxes, also, because your feed, your vaccines are also coming from offshore. You will incur more cost for production. As I guess, who is buying it with his own currency, as he just said. So it had a lot to do with policy, but policy cannot be influenced by one or two small farmers. You may have to come together with the help of the bodies like Isel and the Chamber of Agriculture and a lot to also push your cost so that you can also produce at an equally cheaper rates and compete in the market. This is competition, and it's about supply and demand. On the education front, we also have similar exercises that we do when a product is ready. But what we normally don't like to do is to web the appetites of the, the markets. Then we don't have the array of products to meet the market. As like I said, we are in the face of developing several products for the agriculture uh, sector, and we don't have a lot. So we are a bit on the silent because we don't have enough to meet the market. So when we do, we normally go on an air fanfare to make sure that everybody knows the product is there and it meets this need. Thank you. All right, thank you. I also want to add that with DBG, we, I guess I is the agri wing of DBG. So in developing this program, the D program, where we have soya and others, we advise that soya should be added because we know it's going to have a multiple a double effect for poultry and aquaculture. So soya is added. And currently we are running under the Tampa program. We are running interest rate subsidy. We are managing it on behalf of uh, Minister of Food and Agriculture. So if an actor works within, we are looking at rice, soya, tomato. If a, an actor works within this value chain, and Ecobank, for instance, is able is advance a loan to you based on DBG's fund, 20%, then we take half of that loan. So you end up paying just 10% of the interest. So there are a lot of interventions, but we need to do more. As she mentioned, you need to push so that, because these are policy things, it's government that will decide what to be done to the industry. So you are doing a lot of work. So push so that we can also advise that the government will take it up. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I just want to bring the discussion a bit back. Uh, most of us after school had the idea that when you have a very good proposal plan, a business plan or business proposal, it's so easy to work to the bank for support. But listening to the discussion today, I realize that that will not be possible. So I want to find out from the bank if there is a way they can design a product for those who are start, those who want to start up. Thank you very much. Um, the first presenter, please, you made mention of 33 commodities, if I may use the word certified, and you mentioned aquaculture. May I please know the remaining 32, can we get them from your website? And then my final question is, um, I have, a, sorry, I have a copy of your, your essay brochure. And all your partners 
are there from APSA, uh, talking about the commercial banks, from APSA to National Investment Bank, and then the non-banking two are there, and then rural and community banks. But I didn't find the insurance companies apart from where Madam is coming from. Thank you very much. All right. Let me take away since I have the mic. Yes, so with the 33 commodities we mentioned, it's basically for, for the bankers. So that every from maize, rice, soya bean, tomato, three crops, everything. Poultry is involved. So that after training them at National Banking College, they will be continuous learning. And also if they are assessing a loan, because they may not have, they may have limited knowledge as to, because as to what pertains in agriculture. As you mentioned, agriculture is very wide. So we try to pull the necessary resources together at one place. So that is a one-stop shop information resource. So, but because it's targeted to the banks, you need to register to the portal before you can have access to it. But if you are a, a known institution, we can give you access when you register so that you can benefit from all the commodity, 33 commodities. We are still adding, we are looking at adding avocado this year so that it will be 34. And uh, your question again on, okay, okay, with, yes, they, they are not bankers. They don't give loans. We only deal with deposit taking institutions. They give loans. Uh, they are insurance, but we partner with them. We do similar thing. When GESA was established, there is insurance aspect, but since they are already in operation, we ceded that to them, but we are still working together. They, we provide guarantee, they provide insurance so that the risks will be mitigated. Thank you. And then though there is only our name that you see there, but in reality, we are not one, we are 16. As I said, we are made up of 16 of the non-life insurance company. Holad is a member, SIC is a member, Enterprise Ghana Union, they are all members of us. You don't see the list of all their names there because Currently, we are building capacity for them to underwrite. Eventually, when they are all capable of underwriting the risks, you can work with any of those insurance companies and you get cover for your farm in whichever form. But at the moment, we are in the face of building capacity for the industry. So they've given the underwriting to us to handle on their behalf. Some of them, I think we build the capacity to the standard, some of them are actually now getting to the point to underwrite on their own. Uh -huh. uh, so please, Madam, may I please know for me, when will these uh, insurance companies be able to, set, um, I can walk to the financial, uh, sorry. This, Any insurance company. Yes, please, when? I think I have the feeling that it might happen latest by end of this year going to next year. Because we spent the last 10 years doing that for them. Developing products, educating them, building capacity on how to go about it. The interesting thing about agriculture is that, uh, unlike Moto, when there's an accident, Either the door is broken, the glass is broken, the bonnet is broken. Is it a partial damage or total damage? Is that okay? Since either we are replacing it or we are compensating you to some extent, it's easy. Now, when it comes to aquaculture and I come and the fish is dead, it's a whole story altogether. What caused it? Was it the temperature? Was it the kind of feed? Was it a pest? Was it a disease? What happened? Now, when we even agree on what caused the death, we now have to go back and do another mass. What, how old is the fish? Now the age of the fish is now going to tell me how much you invested from the hatchery to that place. So the how you determine compensation when it comes to agriculture is not straightforward as it's in general business. So that's why they were a bit averse into going to it because you need to know how. It's not a point where you suffered loss that your 100,000 fishes are dead that now, oh, I'll pay you 10 CDs for a fish. Oh no, I'll not take 10 CDs. I'll take no. At that point, you are in enough pain that all you want from me as an insurer is that 100 is dead. At this age, the 100 finger list each is 15 cities because it's not that old. So you haven't reached 35 cities per weight yet. 
So it's 15 cities. So these 15 cities times the 100,000. And on which scale did I, am I offering you 100% cover or 80%? Then I calculate and pay you. So how compensations are paid when it comes to agriculture sector is not that straightforward as it is with property and motor. Hence, the reason why the insurance industry is taking its pace. This is an agrarian country. You can't get in there and do anything anyhow. You really have to know what you are doing before you get in there. And I think we've spent the past 10 years, going 13 years, in middle that capacity. So I have the feeling in the next year or two, you can walk into any insurance company and you can buy. But they are now building the capacity. When they get there, you can. At the moment, if you want cover for your farm in one form or the other, you have to come to guide. Because we have built the requisite local and international relations to be able to do that on their behalf. But they are about moving to that next phase. Okay, thank you. Let me answer that question, why the banks will not fund a proposal brought. So um, basically, the monies in the bank are for depositors. Now we all know that there's a difference between projections and actuals. So you do your business plan thinking that I'll get so much. You have not tried it. Okay. So we all know that the risk is higher. Risk here is how would the actual deviate from what you have planned? Now you agree with me that you don't want to go to sleep with two burdens. You have wasted or the investment that you have made in terms of effort is gone. That the bank is also chasing you for the money. We are saying that try first with what you have, something small, okay? And then when you have gotten the experience, we will come in to support you to grow, to scale up. At that time, you are confident of the numbers. I projected this, I got this. Therefore, we can help you to work on the numbers and ensure that when we give you the money, you'll be able to pay and then you can also sleep soundly. So that is more reason why we don't want to do the startup. We have not done it at all. You know, I'm, I was amazed when I realized that I got to understand that you can have up to 80%, 90% mortality in fingerlings. So you put 100,000 um, tilapia fingerlings in the pool and 90,000 will die. Yeah. And uh, he started with only one pond. Can I, after that one pond experiment, come back to you for, with a proposal for funding? So I mentioned that, give me visibility. You have registered your business. Your pond is at your backyard. You have this size. You invest so much. You get so much from it. That comes through the account. So any amount or any figure that you mention, I am able to validate it through the activities on your account. You get it. And when that happens, I should be able to help you. But let me also mention that the value chain is wide. Okay, you may need uh, feed, you may need to track, you may need something else. Our advice that for the start, try and use your equity to handle the more risky parts of the business and let the banks come in to support you in other aspects. You can move faster that way. And I think um, that should be something you should consider. That anytime that we get money, you look at the business and see which part will be attractive for the bank to come in. Then let me push that one to the banks. Which one will not be attractive for the banks because of the risk? Let me handle that as an entrepreneur. Then at the end of the day, put it together, your business will be doing well. Thank you. If I, if I may add a little bit to the startup, I realize that sometimes uh, when we are starting up, uh, you have a very vague idea about the numbers. I recall there was a client who came and said he was going to do 500 hectares of soya bean in the Vota region somewhere. He brought in these new varieties. It's not a local variety, it's, it's a foreign variety. And he was going to do five metric tons per hectare. I just looked at the gentleman and I asked him, currently, do you know the tonnage that we are able to achieve in this good soil here? So, oh, madam, this is proven and whatever it is. I said, okay, yo. Case number one, in my proposal form, I need your five-year history. I need five-year cycle. Okay, so it's either five years if it's, a, it's a, a perennial like rubber or tick. If it's the short term one like maize or soya, I need five cycles. Let's see what you are capable of. 
So, no, 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 I'm good. That's okay. If I'm starting with you on a fresh note like this, the best I can do is to give you Mofa district yield. It's proven. From farmers in that district. You, you are only dreaming. Let me help you out. In that case, okay, let's simplify it. Translate one metric ton into kilograms for me. I was just looking at my face. I said, okay, how many 50 kg make a tonnage? Oh, about five. I said, hey, 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 hold it there. Is that why you don't understand it? So when you draw a proposal, mostly the proposals are based on projections of what somebody said about this variety of fish, these fingerlings can do this. this those are all, excuse my language, dreams. You have to go through the process and have your own experience, then you own it. Now, as he was saying, you can't come and take the, his customer's money to go and do it on your five tonnage that was in your dream. That you've never tried and tested yet. He will still need to pay his invested. So you play at the backyard with one pound and see that, oh, actually, when they say three kg, it weighs this much. And the market, three kg is bought at this match. After you go to that experiment one year, you get beaten one in one angle, you reap benefit in that angle, you learn. So by the time you bring in external investment, you would have got rid of some of the chaff, the weeds, and things that will hamper your business. You'll be able to have that reliable inflow to pay back the money you took. But if from the beginning, as even, you take your education, <laughs> the experience, even they, the huge, farms, still the difficulties and the difficult experiences that they have. So from the startup, that's exactly anybody, even if you was your own father who was going to invest in you, the same thing will ask you, have you done it before? And what is your experience? What is your record? And that is on the basis where you can now invest additional money from outside. Thank you. My name is Evans. Just to uh, clarify something to our good friend from the bank, tilapia farms are not set out to produce with 20% survival, uh, just to put things in context. That event occurred as a result of a particular, uh, I would say, pandemic that we experienced, just like the whole world was very perfect until we shook hands with COVID. So that came and, and then messed up our industry for a while did a, a bad cleanup, and it's only now that uh, things are, are picking up or have picked up. Before then, we were seeing survivors above 75, 80%, just like every regular uh, livestock business. So we had to go through that phase to be able to improve or even learn that, okay, these things are possible. Like she said, um, this is a very global thing that has happened at several parts of the world. The FAO keep organizing training uh, seminars to um, let farmers know that, okay, this is possible, this is what happened in this country, and these are the shared lessons. Like when our colleagues in Kenya now are experiencing what we had experienced last year, and some of us had gone there on the ticket of the FAO to share the experience with them, to tell them, the signs, the early warning signs, and how to manage it, and what we've been through. So they are at that moment, but they will also go through it just like we have also been through it. So it's not like tilapia farms go out to plan and produce 10, 15 percent, you know. All right. Please, if there are any more questions, just let me see your hand, then I'll bring the mic. Okay, Mr. Peter. Um, our, our good brother here from the bank made mention of the fact that they, they need to understand what we are doing. Most often my colleagues in the industry only speak our own language. In the session before this one, John, John said that we went to school here to learn the language of the paymaster so we could understand English, so English could give us a job, so we could understand and be able to communicate with the paymaster. The same way, my advice to my colleagues would be we need to speak a language that 
our colleagues also will understand. Otherwise, we could be speaking Latin and they are speaking Swahili, and there will not be any, you know, with, with support from the ASA, which the Soya Bean Association of America, we, we are doing a lot of training, not only for, for technical fish production, but for the business as, aspect as well. And, and it's not only how to manage your books, but also um, open up your production management system, if you can, to our colleagues, like the banks. For example, when we were working with ADB, we had uh, an app we used to manage our firm called Aquanetics. And we have dedicated people from the bank who will have access to the system, will know how much fingerlings we move from point A to point B every day, if the, how many kilos of feed is planned to be consumed in a day and what was actually consumed, how much stock has been received, how long it's going to last, what the general stock tax status is and what the mortalities are. We need to get to that that level where we can create some level of com com comfort for these our colleagues and that will help them to be able to understand our industry more. When we have the disease issues and stuff, we, we will open up to them. For example, when she was coming to our farm during the state, when there are mortalities on the pond, I will ask my people, don't collect the mortalities. Let the mortalities be there until they come to see so that they understand that it is possible that the fish, the fish uh, could die. And then if only we are at that same level, then we can find a solution together. I kept saying since yesterday that it's not uh, something that we can do uh, as, as fish farmers only. It's not something that can be done by the banks only, nor the insurance people. It's a multi-stakeholder approach. About five, ten years ago, there was no insurance for aquaculture at all. It was not anything that was started. And I would say we, were, we will be a pioneers who started it. Uh, and we hope that everybody else can come on board so that the insurance solution is there, the finance solution will also come, the, what we expect from the government will also come, and then maybe in the very near future we, could, we can get to that point where other countries have gotten to where we can put all these stakeholders on one platform for a better and common interest for our food security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, moderator. Um, Echo Bank, may I please know if you operate a zero account? If not, if I, if I want to open an account with you, what, what, what is the initial uh, capital or money that I have to put in as far as opening an account with you? And um, I'm, I'm sure uh, now most of the banks are uh, requesting what do you call it? This Ghana card. Do you have to come around with my Ghana card before I can open an account with you? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let me start from the last. So to open an account, very simple. If your business is sole proprietorship, sole proprietorship, you bring the company registration from A, two passport pictures. Ask for Ghana card now is the minimum. Whatever transaction you want to do at the bank, you need to have a Ghana card. So you add your Ghana card, you fill a form, and we can open the account for you. Um, you, can, you can check on our website for the requirements um, because of time. Now, we don't open zero accounts. You need to have a minimum for business account, a minimum of 100 Ghana cities, because you need to have a checkbook. Okay. So minimum 100 cities, we can open the account for you. Basically, yeah. Thank you. And though I'm also a financial institution, I, the, the minimum <laughs> is the rate that I would charge on your business. So I'm a financial institution like him, but me, I take money and I give money. There's a difference. Yeah? He takes money daily or weekly, or as, as frequent as you can bring it to him. And then when you need it, you can take your money. If you want more than your money, you may have to go to other exercise to ensure him that if you're taking more than what you have in my account, you pay back. Insurance, on the other hand, we charge premium and we pay claims. How do we charge premium? We charge premium on your cost of production, 
or the worth of what you want us to insure you for. So if the 100 fingerlings you are going to raise from hatchery to harvest will cost you a maximum of less than 100,000 on 50, your maximum expense is 100,000. That is what is we call the sum insured. We insurance people, we charge between 0.5% to 3%, depending on how risky your farm is. Meaning that when I come to the farm, it's a well-managed farm. There's bad securities. Everything is coordinated. You could see the flow of work from hatchery, the next phase, how feed are supplier, how medications are. It's in orderly function to ensure that you get your desired results. I will charge you a lower rate because your risk is good. But if I come and it's like anybody can walk anywhere, where is Kofu supposed to feed in the morning? He hasn't appeared to the workplace today yet. Either the fish have not been fed or they have been underfed or overfed. It's not, your risk exposure is quite high. If it's a trough, like anybody can just walk onto the farm and go away, your risk exposure is very high. So I'll charge you the upper limits of the rate. And that rate is applied on your 100,000 investment. So if it is 1%, I'm charging 1% of 100,000, which is what? 10,000 Ghana cities. Is that okay? In a total loss case scenario, assuming I'm covering you for 100%, I'll pay you back. Assuming a disease broke out and you lost all the 50,000 fishes in the pond, the insurance company is supposed to pay you back your 100,000 you invested. On the other hand, if all the 100 did not die, or 50 did not die, and only 20 die, we'll pay you compensation up to the 20 fishes that you have lost. Then a usual interesting question will happen that, okay, in the year that it was good and nothing happened, what, what happens to the money? It means that when nothing happened to Kofi, Kwame suffered. So all of your premium plus my investment was added to pay Kwame. So when nothing happened, just like the health insurance, the day you don't go to your hospital, your father probably went to the hospital or your cousin elsewhere went to the hospital. So it's the cumulative contribution that we make that is used to compensate. On most occasions, it's not enough. That is why it's always required that an insurance company start with a very huge capital because it's possible the first year all your businesses will claim and you have to pay. So insurance and banks, we are financial institutions, we don't do anything for free. Anything is business, you have to pay for it and it will ensure that you'll be there to be able to do for another person who also need it. I, I always tend to have, get this question whereby, uh, so is it government, is it free, please? That's what first. It's pure investment. There's no free business inside there. It's people's money that we have taken to be able to provide one service or the other for you. We have to be able to account back to our shareholders of the investment we made at the same providing the service or the product that you need for you. Thank you. Yes, let me also add on the other side the, the guarantee fee we charge, we charge 1% of the principal we are guaranteeing, but that one will be borne by the bank. You, you don't pay that, but we don't know. We, we have advised they don't transfer it to you, but they, they, they pay that. So as I mentioned earlier, we are guaranteeing the money they're going to advance to you. So we are guaranteeing their money, but not the money they have given to you. So it's the bank's money we are protecting so that they will be uh, incentivized to give more to you. So you are not affected by our charges. But we don't know. Maybe they transfer, we don't know. <laughs> So we have a very good relationship with Gassel, right? Now, I said our rate depends on a lot of factors, including the security or the collateral supporting the facility. So if you have a third party providing a guarantee and it's coming from a solid company like Gassel, then it reduces the rate that we, we charge. In certain cases, we will agree on the rate we charge. Let me mention that for us, as an institution, we've taken agribusiness seriously because we know that's how um, we can impact our community and it's not um, only making money. Because there are instances that we have done some deals that we barely even 
um, broke even. Okay. But we are willing to do it because of the impact and then the fact that food security is for us all. We all go to the market. So um, let's not uh, have the idea that oh, we are not there to support. I must also mention that Gessel may provide guarantee, but the guarantee is on the principal. And we need to do a good job together between ourselves, the bank, and Gessel to ensure that repayment comes. Because if everybody is claiming the guarantee, the, the, the scheme will not be there. So please, let us not go out there thinking that because Gessel is there, you just write anything and then, oh, go to Gessel. No. Gessel, we have to do a good job to ensure we are able to recover. And then the guarantee is to help us meet regulatory requirements because Bank of Ghana requires us to have security and collateral for the loan that we give. We are making this known to you in a way to let you know that don't sit at your small corner and say, if I go to the bank, they will not support me because I don't have collateral. Come to us. Let us assess your situation, and then we'll decide how best we can help you. The value chain is wide. From planting of maize and soya, aggregation, transporting, manufacturing of um, the raw material into fish pellets, everything. We, we, we play in certain roles that ensure that at the end of the day, you will benefit. So for instance, it's not like we are not doing aquaculture if I'm not financing ponds. But if I'm able to finance the aggregator to mop up maize and soya, so that, in quote, foreigners will not come and take it out and cause shortage, so that you are, those who are producing the feed are sure of soya and maize, they will have some level of guarantee in the price that they give. And we are working in that um, um, way to ensure that the aquaculture industry is sustainable. And as we get to know more and understand more, who knows, a time will come that we'll be financing pawn and others. So um, we are committed to doing it, and those who need any information on agribusiness or the value chain, you talk to us, and then we'll see how best we can help you. We have tailor-made products, so it's not like this person came, it didn't work, so I don't even bother to go there. Come to the financial institution, let us assess your case, and if we are able to help you, even if not, we'll give you non-financial support, where we'll let you know that this time around, we are not able to help you, but if you do ABC, next time when you come, we'll be able to help you, and that will be very beneficial to you. Thank you. Are there any more questions, please? Okay, my name is Peter, a farmer. Uh, my question is for Gessa. You mentioned um, certain biosecurity protocols expected from the bank's uh, clients. Is it possible you tell us what you expect the client or the farmer in terms of biosecurity to have in place? Or can, where can we find that? So I see the, the challenge here is uh, the standard is varied across. So you, you're at your side. You also help if you can have been feeders of this as, um, standards you expect. Then you, we at, I'm sure we'll make a lot of progress. You know, so if you can elaborate on that, or you can tell us from here where we can find these standards in terms of biosecurity. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think the biosecurity issue, some has been touched by uh, Guy. When the farm is open, everybody can pass in. There will be transfer of uh, disease and pathogen. You, the farm sanitation, you come there, it is not as it is, and also your medication regime, how it is. So all these things are things you need to look at. Uh, we, as I mentioned, on the website we have developed, those informations are there, and I believe I've joined some of your trainings as well, where you have emphasized on biosecurity, especially when there was that pa pandemic. Yeah. So those things, are, they are very critical for every farmer 
uh, if we say that you are following the good aquaculture practices, uh, biosecurity is key. Somebody coming to your farm, how do you have bath, uh, what is it? Uh, yes, do, do things so that it doesn't carry disease across, regardless. Because there was some incidents where big men are coming to your farm. You so know, for big men, because you can't remove his shoe, you, no, you need to be critical. Because we go to some farms, and when we get there, because they think we are coming to look at it, they don't, they, they don't ask us to go through that. We said, no, we insist we want to do. So that gives us indication that it's lax. They don't allow everybody to, to go. There was a, a business where, which we didn't approve because when we got there, the, the water is empty. There's nothing in there. There was another one. We got there, our car was not, they didn't, because they didn't have the bath. But one farm had a knapsack sprayer where they sprayed around our tie. But the others, it just free flow. So it raised red flag. So those things are important. I believe we will collaborate with um, COA. Are you an agriculture farmer yourself? Yes. So we will intensify that. And whatever knowledge we have, we will let you know as far as uh, biosecurity and other activities are concerned. And I want to add that with the guarantee we do, we don't have minimum. Uh, recently, we did about 29,000. We guaranteed that. And we did for a woman uh, 40,000, which we guarantee. This 29,000 also came from, we are partnering another bank that is targeting the youth, where they give 10% interest. I don't want to, because EcoBank is here, I wouldn't mention that bank. If you want to know, you can come to us because we do the agribusiness assessment. We mentor and provide coaching for them. When it comes to agriculture, we do the assessment on their behalf. So it's just 29,000 at 10% interest. And if you are lucky to fall within the commodities uh, Ghana Cares is supporting, the 10% is also halved. You pay 5%. So things are there. You make yourself available to information and there are good things around you can benefit. Uh, the security features, I think if you want to think about it, the best way to think about it is to think about how we manage COVID. As long as it is animal life, it's the same as your life. If it's a disease, is it preventable? Then you put in systems to prevent it. If it's not preventable, is there a vaccine? Or is there a, a vitamin or something that I can use to boost the immunity of the fish? So if you think about it in that front, you really get attention. Like it's a living thing like you. It has its own disease, just like me and you have malaria, corella, and all of those things you have. There are those that we have advanced to the stage where there are vaccines. It will happen no matter what you do. So the best thing you can do is what you take a particular vaccine or a particular medication to boost your immunity against it. There are some that you don't need vaccine. You need vitamin. You need a particular high mix of food. One of the things I observed when I went to Evans Farm was uh, that really impressed me was there was a schedule. A schedule for the staff rotation. Then there was a schedule for the farm management. I was impressed because assuming you have a farm and there's no schedule, and an officer or your employee is supposed to feed in the afternoon, had one incident or the other and didn't appear, the rest there wouldn't even really know how much they were supposed to do or what they're supposed to do. But with that schedule, even if the employee was not there, whoever was at the station or at the farm at that time knew what they were supposed to do. So if you have a workflow, on every farm, you have a workflow that is pasted there. Even let's say you came to meet your business partners in Accra here, you could not return to the farm on time. All you have to do is call an officer on the field and say, look at this afternoon, how much feed I'm supposed to provide to cage one or cage two or this. 
that kind of workflow on a farm ensures that the system runs smoothly with or without your presence. Now, I had a farm, I observed something that was scared meat. You know, they had this net that they used to sort out uh, dead fish from live fish. And this gentleman was dutifully using it to separate the infested pond, was separating the good from the dead from the life. Then when he got he was done, he picked the same scoop and took it to the <laughs> healthy pond. Then I asked the gentleman, this is a sick pond, right? He said, yes. This is a healthy pond, right? What did you think you just did? You pick up a, a scoop from an infested, you just used in an infested pond, and you took it and write and put it in a healthy pond. What did you do? You just transferred the disease. So it, it, the employees need to be trained to understand the implications of their actions on your business. So it's not just you, the business owner, understanding it. I realize that most of the race people think that you come to this training, you keep the knowledge to yourself. The people who really need the knowledge to run your business smoothly are the employees you have on the farm who supply the feed, who supply the vaccines, who provide the vitamin. So they also need to be given capacity to know what to do in your absence. Thank you. Just one more question, if anyone wants to ask a question. Okay, if there are no more questions, then I think we would have to bring this session to a close. I would like to thank the resource persons uh, from Ecobank, from Gaip, and from KSL for making time for us. Uh, we really appreciate you coming here. And for all of you, we also thank you for coming. Uh, if you want any other questions, or if you have questions that you would like to ask, you can pass them through the chamber, we'll pass it to them, or you can take their contacts directly. Thank you all. Okay. Yeah.
dirty pussy cutter. Baby girl, you know say that's a body bad. If I want to do, then we got the party. Baby girl, you know you can never be a bad girl. We do, girl, let 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 do. We do your body, girl, let do, 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 girl, let do. We do, girl, let 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 do. We do what we do, girl, let do, girl, let do, girl, let do. <laughs> Photo competition. We are ready. Who is about to take the thousand Ghana cities? Tote bag from Volta Catch. 15 kilograms of tilapia, fresh tilapia from Volta Catch. Who is about to take that slot? Who is about to take that money? Bang, bang. Oh, 
water competition. We are about to start. Please come around. Who is about to take that thousand Ghana cities? Tote bag from Volta Catch. 50 kilograms of fresh tilapia from Volta Catch. Please come here. <laughs> oh, I'm coming, Sharita. Photo come. With a growing world population, aquaculture will be an increasingly important source of proteins for humans in the coming years. Today, throughout the world, more than 300 species are farmed in cold or warm waters. Growing in very different environments, they are also exposed to a wide variety of diseases. Providing animal health solutions that address this diversity and ensure a more harmonious and sustainable growth of the species is our priority. All over the world, our teams bring aquaculture farmers solutions adapted to their specific needs and that allow them to adapt to the requirements of growth, sustainability, and traceability while preserving animal welfare and the environment. Our goal is to contribute to a significant reduction of mortality while reducing the use of antibiotics. This is achieved primarily through the development of prevention solutions, vaccination in particular. Our global approach also implies services to implement it effectively. While conducting on-site analysis of germs present in the farms, for example, we hope to find the best protocol to adopt Prevention also means keeping a watchful eye on water quality and adopting bioremediation solutions that improve the living environment of animals, as well as fighting nutritional imbalances, thanks to nutraceuticals to strengthen their natural defenses. We invest relentlessly to bring innovative solutions for the prevention of major aquaculture diseases and help all farmers everywhere in the world to meet the world's growing demand in a responsible and sustainable way. Do you see potential for economic progress that also improves human and animal nutrition in countries with some of the fastest growing populations in the world do you want to partner to find solutions for the protein gaps found in Africa, Asia, and Central America? If you can join us in capturing business opportunities in nutritious foods and feeds, then stay tuned. Visionary U.S. soybean growers founded the World Initiative for Soy in Human Health, or WISH, as a program of the American Soybean Association. We are committed to strengthening agricultural market systems in developing and emerging economies in order to improve food security, 
and build long-term demand for U.S. soy. Our work supports businesses, governments, and non-governmental organizations from Guatemala to Uganda to Cambodia to introduce nutritious foods and feeds that grow their businesses and economies. At WISH, we focus on regions where U.S. soy markets don't exist yet, blazing new trails in new sectors around the world. For example, WISH has made significant impacts in Central America by partnering with companies that use U.S. soy to manufacture more nutritious foods and beverages. In Asia, WISH partners have expanded their businesses by putting U.S. soy in fish feed for the first time. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, local entrepreneurs have partnered with WISH to grow businesses that sell delicious and nutritious soy-based local foods, as well as feeds for poultry, fish, and more. So what can a partnership with WISH do for you? Working on behalf of U.S. soybean farmers, our goal is to create global partnerships and provide new opportunities for businesses and entrepreneurs that expand the potential for trade. Our approach is designed to increase demand, fuel economic growth, and connect entrepreneurs. The best part is that we do this at no cost to you. So how does it work? Thanks to decades of accumulated knowledge, we tap into expert resources to educate, mentor, and network to help your business grow both in size and through the latest innovations. Thanks to our soy experts, who are deeply connected to the regions where we work, we offer you face-to-face -face education and technical expertise. Working in developing and emerging markets, we identify market sectors with real potential for growth work with key stakeholders, and provide effective trade solutions. While serving as an incubator, we connect driven leaders with supply chain partners. We help you network for strategic partnerships and create opportunities to launch a new product or service. And our go-to market strategists offer a localized approach, the right resources, the right expertise, and the right systems for better nutrition and improved food security in your market. At WISH, our greatest strength is our ability to facilitate strategic partnerships throughout the world to promote the benefits of soy. WISH and the American Soybean Association have the vision and the voice to continue to build awareness, create partnerships, and drive change for a healthier world. You know the location, so please don't say it. I beg you. So please go around, select three people out of the participants. Let them whisper what scores they will give to this photo. So this is just a hatchery. So they have harpers where they keep the fry or the fingerlings in, grow them for some time before it is finally transferred to the grow out cages. Okay, so the next photo is this one. 
And the description for this photo is that a boat rider on a boat on the Volta Lake. So this is the second photo. The third photo is fish vaccination. Fish vaccination. This is the fourth photo. This is the fourth one. The fifth one. Some fishermen with their catch. So this is the fifth one. And this is the sixth photo, sorting of the catch on the Volta Lake. Okay, so this photo came as a PDF. Wow. <laughs> So, okay, so the photo is the second one. No. Hey. Okay, so let's look at this one. Wow, this is an art artistic grow out feeding. So we see the feeder throwing the feed into the cage. So this is the seventh photo. And then the eighth one. Okay, so let's move to the ninth one. Wow, some of the files can't open. Okay. This is the ninth photo, seining of a pond. The tenth photo, and the eleventh one, filling a pond. Then the last batch of photos. So this is the 11th photo. Photo number 12. Stalking, I can see. And then the 12 photo is this one. OK. So we've had a total of 12 photos to look at. Unfortunately, <laughs> one of the entries, we were only seeing PDF files without the photos. And I can see the, the applicant contending here. But unfortunately, it is only the PDF files we are having. So please, 12 photos. She will go around. And then you tell us which of these is the best photo that should be rewarded. The award is that for the general entry, the winner receives 1,000 Ghana CDs from the Chamber of Aquaculture and receives a blue tote bag from Tropo Farms plus souvenirs and five kilograms of fish from Tropo Farms. For the student entry, the winner receives 1,000 Ghana CDs from the Chamber of Aquaculture. 
then a black tooth bag with souvenirs from Tropo Farms, and then five, kilo, five kilograms of fish from Tropo Farms. The first runner-up for the, for the student's entry also received a black tooth bag with souvenirs from Tropo Farms and 2.5 kilograms of fish from Tropo Farms. So please, we need to select the winner for the general entry. This is the general entry. We have the student's entry. So if your photo has not been sh uh, sh uh, showed yet, please have patience. It will be. <laughs> you will see it up here. Yes, so who do, which photo do we adjudge or do we judge or adjudge as the best photo for Aquaculture Ghana 2023? Number eight. I've heard number eight. I've heard number eight. No, this is not number eight. Is this the eighth photo I showed? No. The one they were throwing the feed. The one they were throwing the feed. Or this one. This is seven. This is number eight. So do we all agree that photo number eight is the winner for the general entry? <laughs> this one. So between photo number seven and photo number eight, which one is the winner for the general entry? As you show all of them again. Hey. Unfortunately, my folder is even closed. Okay. So I will start again. This is the first photo. Number two. So I will show all of them again. If it is number one, you tell me yes. If it is number, if it is not, you say no, then I move on. So number one, number two, number three, okay, let's move on. Number four, number four, number five, number six, Hmm. Uh, boba. <laughs> Ima, unfortunately, your photos are not showing. Okay, number seven. Yeah. Number seven. Yeah. Number eight. Yeah. Number eight. Okay, let me move on. <laughs> Number nine. Number ten. Because I can see that some of the participants are trying to lobby and campaign around. <laughs> Number nine. Okay. And then the last set of pictures, number 10, 11, 11, number 12, number 12, if in fact, 
you've made it difficult for me to tell who, who they are. But we need to move on. We need to move on. We need to move on. So please, I would select from among the participants or from among us here, three people to give me. If um, three people, if a photo number appears more than once from among the three, that photo is the winner. But then, Okay, come. Um, Gabriel, come. And then, please come. Yes, the lady. Because we have to be very yeah, fair here. So, please, you'll be giving a score sheet. Please tell him what's, which picture you will select and what score you will give. So this is picture number 12. 11. No. 10. No. You see, the picture should tell a story. The moment you see the picture, I should tell you something or an activity that is taking place. Let's go to the one that... Picture number 10. No. 8. No. 9. Eight. Between this one and the one so the please movie. give him your score. Hear your score. A scale of what? One to five. Okay. Seven. I think if we do, <laughs> if you go by it this way, we will take a very long time here. Okay. So, dog, sit down. As they go through, you write your score for all the photos that will be, sh yeah, that we will show. You also write your score for all the photos. You also write your score for all the, uh, the photos. When we are done, we will total them, and then we see which one gets the highest score. Then we give over five. So it's uh, on a scale of one to five. Yeah, then that will be very easy. So you are doing this for the general entry. For the student entry, I need another set of three people. Another set of three. Um, Jacob, please come. Uh, I won't pick a student. Yes. You'll be given a sheet, a score sheet to use. Um... Ten, please can you score for me? Yes, so she will give you a score sheet. And then I need one more person. Okay. Um, please, my lady here, please can you help me? Please can you help me with the scoring? I beg you for the student session. I need a lady for the scoring of the photos. Yes. She's a specialist. Wow. Okay. Good. So we will show all the photos. As we show them, you give them a score between one and five when you see the photo. So the photos are one all the way to the last number of the photo. You give us the scores between one and five. How much are you scoring that particular photo? At the end of the day, we will tally all of them to know which photo had the highest score from the three assessors. Please, I need some A4 sheets here. A4 sheets. Uh -huh. Yes, so give each of them a sheet. And then they will number one to, I think, 
pen for the general. So those who are doing the general N3, I'm going to go through all the photos again. Then you put down your scores. So on the sheet that has been given you, kindly have a right on the first column, or I want you to rule two lines. Okay, divide the sheet into two. Then photo and then score. The first column you write on top of it photo, and then the second column you write score. Then you write photo number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six. So as we show the photos, you write the scores for them. Don't let anybody see it. So at the end of the of, of going after we've gone through all the photos you bring your scores the lady will tally all of them then at the end of the day we know who had which photo had the highest score then the person takes the award thank you very much so i'm going through the general entries again one two three Four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, Twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Okay, so kindly submit your scores for the lady to tally for us. So we will, we will move quickly to the students session or the, the students entry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So those who are scoring for the students, the students entry will start rolling soon. So for the students entry, we have photo number one. Student entry photo number one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, 10, 
This one, I can't do anything to it to enlarge it. You have to assert it. Yeah, but, uh, and then photo number 12. Okay. Thirteen. Photo number thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Wow. Hey. Twenty one. Twenty two. Twenty three. Twenty four. Twenty five. Twenty six. Hey, no, this is still twenty five. Okay, so only two entries here. So we are almost through twenty six. Twenty seven. Twenty eight. Twenty nine. Thirty. Thirty one. And the last sets thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. So that is the last picture for the student's entry thirty four. So I think the results for the general entry is in. And we have one winner. Wow. Hmm. If we had not done it this way, I think it, it would have gone to <laughs> a different person. Okay, so please can I have all the scores here with me? Please, can I have the scores? Yes. Okay. This, yes, these are the only students. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So... For the general entry, we have photo number one, 
had a total score of seven. Photo number two had a total score of five. Photo number three had a total score of four. Photo number five had a total score of 12. Photo number six had a total score of eight. Photo number seven had a total score of 11. Photo eight had nine. Photo nine had nine. Photo 10 had six. Photo 11 had nine. 12, seven. Photo 13 had 11. And photo number 14 had 10. So at the end of the general entry scoring, photo number five is adjudged the winner for the general entry. Photo number five. This is photo number five. So if Because it starts here, and we have three photos here. And we have three photos here. So photo number five is this photo. So if we have Elkana Dankwa, is it Iverson here? Please, is he or she here? Elkana. Elkana. Is Elkana here? So for the general entry, we have photo number five coming out as the best photo. Wow. So for the winner for the general entry, the person receives... <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this photo really depicts uh, capture fisheries of, yes, more than aquaculture in a way. Although it came out as, or it received the highest score, it talks more of capture fisheries than aquaculture. But the rule was that participants or entries should depict photos that were captured within the aquaculture value chain and not the fisheries value chain. So if we want to really go strictly to the rules, then I would say that although this photo had the highest score of 12, this is an aquaculture event, and so the prize must go to the photo that has the, or that showed the aquaculture in it. And if that is the case, then there are two photos that are tying with 11 marks each. And so we would need to separate this. These are photo seven and photo number 13. Photo seven and photo number 13. Photo number seven is this one. This is photo number seven and photo number 13. 13 is this one. So we need to decide between photo number 7 and number 13 who is the winner. 7 and 13, who is the winner? No, photo number 13 had 11 in total, and photo number 7 had 11 in total. No, I'm not using the general voice response or the voice votes. Right now, we are using the scores. So I will need, um, hmm, so that there is no bias. Seven, then I would declare photo number 7 as the winner for the general 
entry. <laughs> so photo number seven wins the photo competition for the general entry. No, you see, I chose her because she, she please, are, are you an industry player? No. Uh -huh. So I chose her because she's not an industry player, okay? She came around and she has seen the photos and she thinks that photo number seven is the boy. <laughs> As she used the voice boots. <laughs> yes, time is is running so i want us to do his part so okay photo number seven yes or no you see if we use the voice voice it will be a problem so please i think let me go i'll go by what my lady said here so photo number seven gets the reward so photo number seven um the name is enoch please is enoch here enoch is the only name i have please where is enoch Enoch, please, when you come, you show me your Ghana card. So Enoch receives 1,000 Ghana CDs from the Chamber of Aquaculture, a blue tote bag from Tropo Farms, plus souvenirs, 5 kilograms of fish from Tropo Farms. So where is Enoch? Enoch, are you here? He's not here at the moment. Okay, so we will contact um, Enoch to come for her prize. But Rebecca from Tropo Farms is here to do the presentation of the tote bag. So if Enoch has a friend here, yeah, he has a friend. I'm a friend. are you sure? <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. So let's move to the students. Please, are we done with the tallying? Okay. So.
or fish? Okay, thank you very much. And for Eric, I understand Eric could not come, but he has a rep here. And so, Stephen Jemphy will take it for Eric. A black tooth bag with souvenirs and 2.5 kilograms of fish. For the general entry, Enoch. Enoch is not here, so we would contact Enoch to receive. Please, who is representing Enoch? Okay. All right, so thank you all very much for sitting in for us to go through this. It's been very tiring, two days of aquaculture conference. You've sat in right from the morning all the way till this evening. You've been very wonderful participants. Thank you so much. God bless you so much. At this moment, we would want to move into the session of interaction. There are academics here. There are See you. Work. Increase your contact. Who knows? One day, that contact may become the one who may give you the deal you've been looking for. The good news is that we have Deputy Minister for the for, for fisheries and aquaculture development in our midst, in the person of Honorable Moses Anim. Honorable, you are most welcome. Please, let's give it out to him. He was here yesterday, and today he has appeared again this evening to be part of this evening's um, session. Please talk to him. He is the big man. <laughs> Talk to him. The students, talk to him. <laughs> so please, it is now time for us to interact with each other and then have fun. Thank you very much and have a very wonderful evening.